Chapter 141, Double Agent Elaine reluctantly left the void chamber with Dante. He was insane, and she felt sick listening to his nonsense. But it wasn't often that she was allowed access to the void chamber, which was one of the only places she could get access to a substantial amount of void chi to cultivate with. While they talked, she had been cycling the abundant void chi in the chamber throughout her body and filling her soul core. If only I could cultivate like this without the help of an array. Dante may believe our affinity is superior to everyone else, but that's because he can ignore the massive downside I have to live with daily. The scarcity of naturally occurring void chi made reaching even the first stage of the soul fire realm at 25 years old a struggle. Elaine sighed as her steps echoed through the corridor with pulsing silver lines interwoven in the walls. They all led back to the void chamber fed by an enormous and expensive array throughout the manor. It took weeks for the chamber to accumulate void chi, so its use was restricted to those in the family that the Grand Elder had deemed worthy. People like Jasper, the Elder, and maybe others from her family that are attending the Academy. Not her. Elaine had been cut off from the family's resources due to her supposed lack of talent which she now realized was a translation for having an impure spirit root. Ever since taking the truffles from the Patriarch, her mind and body felt in perfect harmony and clean from impurities making cultivation a breeze. If only I could have unlimited access to a void chamber like my brother. Maybe then I could reach the star core realm like he has. Do you have any idea why they are here? Dante asked Clive, who was walking quickly beside them. The Red Claw said that Elaine was expected at an important meeting, Clive replied, although they refused to mention what for. Clive's words helped bring Elaine's thoughts back to the present. Now that she thought about it, why would the Red Claws be here? She hardly ever interacted with them and she had no planned meetings as far as she knew. Even from behind his tall figure, Elaine could hear Dante grinding his teeth in annoyance. Vile scum, coming in here as if they own the place, he muttered under his breath as they continued through the manor. My lord, please remember to keep your composure, Clive mentioned, which surprised Elaine. Your father expects results. Which includes spreading the wonders of the alchemy technique you have been practicing. Dante snorted we could achieve that without attending their little tournament. I don't know what father is thinking. My lord, did he not inform you about the silver spires? Dante paused mid-stride causing all three of them to come to a halt. He looked down and glared at Clive, come again. The alchemy tournament is being sponsored by the silver spire family, Clive explained, rumors are that the silver spire grand elders children have entered some type of competition where they compete for profits. One of them has settled here in Dark Light City and decided to pour their money into the tournament. Doesn't this hamper our plans? If we mess with the Silver Spires, we risk angering the Night Rose family. Elaine could barely contain a smile. Seeing Dante in such distress over the Silver Spires while she had the image of the Seventh Son in her mind made the whole thing rather comical. Fred not. We had informants learn that the heir to grace Dark Light City was the Seventh Son. Since when was there a 7th? Dante asked. He's only a few years old, so he was likely birthed during your closed-door cultivation, Clive replied as they began walking again, and since he's so young, we doubt that the Silver Spire family expects much from him, nor does he hold much power over the Silver Spire's forces. I see. Dante mulled as he stroked his chin, so I must still attend the tournament to show face and not mess with the Silver Spire brat's investment. But once the tournament has finished, we can get away with taking over the city. Clive nodded that's the current plan, although we will continue intel gathering operations in the meantime. There is always the possibility that we may need to postpone our invasion until after the Silver Spire Scion has left. What a waste of my precious time, Dante cursed, and the trio continued in silence until they reached the entrance hall. Waiting in the middle of the hall was a woman with crimson hair and a stern expression. Elder Margaret, sorry for the wait. Clive switched his tone to that of a friendly host. Lady Elaine was in discussions with Lord Dante. Sorry to interrupt then. Elder Margaret replied while studying their faces with her sharp gaze, however, Elaine had previously agreed to a meeting, and it would disgrace the Void Mind name to break promises with fellow cultivators. Wouldn't you agree, Dante Void Mind? Elaine saw the corner of Dante's eye twitch, his hand clench, and then unclench at his side. It was clear the way a red claw was speaking to him in his own home was angering him, but the gentlemanly demeanor he had honed over the decades won out much to Elaine's relief. That is quite right, Elder Margaret, Dante replied with a fake smile, Elaine failed to inform me of such an arrangement, so please pardon my actions resulting in you having to waste your precious time coming to retrieve her. Elaine stood in silence, 
but her brain was whirling the entire time, trying to decipher what this meeting could be about. Had she truly agreed upon a meeting and forgotten about it? I said I would meet Douglas for lunch, but I doubt that warrants an elder to collect me. So what is Elder Margaret on about? Well then, we will leave without delay then. Elder Margaret gestured for Elaine to follow as she began to walk toward the Ajar Obsidian doors. Wait a minute, Dante said, pausing her steps. Yes. Elder Margaret had a blank face. What is the meeting for? Dante glanced down at Elaine, I have yet to conclude my conversation. So I hope she will be returning soon. Elaine is on the planning committee for the Alchemy Tournament, Elder Margaret declared, and Elaine managed to hide her surprise. Planning committee? What nonsense is this, unless... Elaine began to connect the dots. The Red Claws worked for the Ash Fallen sect, so they may be here on the orders of the Patriarch. Did he want information out of her or something? Other than that, all she could think was they had come to save her. But even that felt far-fetched. Her brother may be a creep and a bit insane, but he would never go too far against her as they shared the same parents, right? Elaine bit her lip as she watched Dante and the Elder face off. Now that she thought about it more, maybe she should seize every opportunity to escape from her brother. If not for the allure of the Void Chamber, she would have tried to leave herself the moment their conversation had concluded. Locking eyes with Elder Margaret, Elaine finally broke her silence, Oh, how foolish of me. I was on the way to the meeting when I was informed that my brother was arriving, so it completely slipped my mind. Dante glanced at her with a look of doubt. Elaine brushed off his gaze and stepped forward, leaving his side. I will see you later, brother. We can talk some other time. I will come with you, his cold voice sent a shiver down her spine. You have yet to show me around, so this is a good opportunity. Elaine barely contained a frustrated groan. Why did I have to eat that darn truffle? If I hadn't, he would have treated me worse than a maid and demanded I leave his sight. That would be rather inconvenient, as I assume you are here to participate in the tournament. Elder Magret's words gave Elaine a glimmer of hope, participants shouldn't be seen dabbling with the organizers. Otherwise, you may be accused by the other participating families of foul play. Where is the meeting being held? Dante asked. The Academy. Elder Margaret replied after a brief pause. Perfect. Dante's smile grew wider, the academies across the Blood Lotus sect are fully open to science. Elder Margaret's frowned, fine, you can come with us, but you must remain outside the meeting. Elaine began to feel anxious. How were they supposed to conduct a meeting for a society that didn't even exist while Dante was waiting outside? Trying to ignore those thoughts, she followed Elder Margaret outside, surprised to discover it was late evening. A substantial amount of time had passed since she met her brother at the airship station. Her gaze then lowered and paused on the tall blonde-haired girl wearing a black mask standing at the end of the pathway, being eyed cautiously by the manor guards. Who is this? Dante asked Elder Margaret. This is a cultivator hired by the Silver Spire family to help the committee members get around. Elder Margaret effortlessly lied straight to her brother's face, Dark Light City is one of the biggest cities in the Blood Lotus sect in terms of size, and the Red Claws are a small family, so we required some assistance to keep everything running. Right, that makes sense. Dante nonchalantly replied, and how does she plan to assist us exactly? Stella clicked her finger, and a portal manifested right behind her. Through its distorted view was the academy that Elaine was very familiar with. A star core spatial cultivator, Dante muttered beside her, and Elaine could feel the mixture of awe and terror in his voice, the Silver Spire family never fails to impress me. The portal can only take one at a time, Stella said, gesturing for Dante to step forward, why don't you and Elder Margaret go first? Elder Margaret stepped through with a pop of air, and her distorted body became visible on the other side. Dante followed suit giving the portal a dubious look before stepping through. Elaine, are you okay? Stella quickly asked. Clearly, she was using chi to mask her voice, as none of the nearby guards reacted. Elaine gave a slight nod. Phew, that's a relief. You had us all worried that your family would do something to you, Stella gestured for Elaine to go through the portal but kept speaking, the meeting is entirely made up and was just a chance for us to catch up. If you want to say anything, just write it out in ancient runes on the table, and we will pretend you are our runic expert. Also, we are considering conducting the meeting in the dining room with Douglas so Dante can see that you are involved with us. Elaine gave another slight nod as she felt warmth in her heart. It was nice to hear they had been looking out for her. 
and their idea of doing it out in the open could be good. Dante will see me as even more valuable for making his invasion work as he can use me to gather insider information. A thin smile appeared on Elaine's lips as she stepped through the portal and felt the sudden change in environment from the quite noble streets to the bustling noise of the academy campus. If I can orchestrate this perfectly, I might be able to seize the leftovers of my family for the Ash Fallen sect. Moments later, the eye-catching group was strolling through the academy grounds. Men and women of indecipherable ages, due to cultivation slowing down the aging process, walked by while chatting with one another. As Dark Light City was one of the less desirable locations where mainly delinquents and talentless heirs were sent, there was a more casual air about the place, which Elaine appreciated but Dante seemed to despise. His gaze roamed the groups with a look of disgust deepening on his face. One group consisting of three women returned his glare, but the presence of Elder Margaret, a cultivator hailing from the current ruling family, helped to defuse the situation before someone got killed. Death on academy grounds was rare, as the perpetrator was often kicked out and then denied the cultivation resources provided at the academy, which was, in turn, a death sentence. Not to mention the academy grounds were also treated as politically neutral grounds where students from all families could unite and further the strength of the Blood Lotus sect. Elaine glanced up at the white stone buildings bathed in the late evening sun surrounding her. Atop their roofs were cultivators hired by the academy to ensure the security of the students while also there if someone tried to steal cultivation resources. All their eyes were glued on their group, and Elaine couldn't blame them for the looks Dante gave all the students that passed by. Is he just glaring at them because he feels superior? or is he doing that to protect me? Elaine did feel numerous people staring at her specifically, but they all shifted their gazes when Dante caught sight of them. As they approached the dining hall, which wasn't so far from the massive oval building that served as the library, Elaine caught sight of a familiar black-haired man running toward them. Dante, is that you? Jasper shouted down the hallway. I went to the airship station, but you were already gone. I hear you created quite the scene, though. Jasper so we meet again, Dante replied without a hint of warmth at seeing his childhood friend. While the two talked, Elaine took the opportunity to sneak ahead into the dining hall with Elder Margaret and Stella. Glancing around, she saw Douglas sitting in the corner alone at a table and picking idly at his food with a fork. Joining the queue, she grabbed some food for herself from the self-service area as she felt a little hungry even after eating a sandwich this morning. She didn't have to eat, but there was a lack of food options on Red Vine Peak so she planned to make the most of the food available here in the academy. The Ash Fallen sect really needs to hire some chefs. Making her way over to the table and desperately trying to ignore the stares and whispers, she finally placed her tray on the table, causing Douglas to jolt from his trance. Elaine. He glanced at her and smiled, glad to see you could make it. How's your brother? He's fine. Elaine's eyes darted to the doorway as she saw him wander in, half ignoring Jasper who was hounding him with questions. I can't talk about anything here. Dante's spiritual sense will easily pick it up. Oh yeah. Stella said I could pretend to be a formation expert and draw out runes. Elaine pulled back the chair and sat down. Stella did the same and sat beside her. Her tray surprisingly had food on it, and Elaine wondered how she planned to eat the small mound of purple meat sausages and dark yellow potatoes. Her answer came in the form of Stella picking up a sausage and then summoning a small rift that led inside her mouth behind the mask and passing the sausage through. I should have seen that coming. Elaine sighed as she noticed Elder Margaret gesturing for Dante and Jasper to sit a few tables away before she took the final seat at the table. Right, on behalf of the organizer who fell asleep by the tree, Elder Margaret said, and Elaine immediately picked up on the fact she was referring to the patriarch, could you please draw out a runic formation for preserving the ingredients for the contestants? Elder Magret's spatial ring flashed with power, and a parchment, ink pot, and quill appeared beside Elaine on the table. Without hesitation, she picked up the quill, dipped it in ink, and wrote out in the ancient runic language, which she only had a week of practice with. End of the tournament, Void Mind Invasion. Brother is the Leader. Chapter 142, Alchemy Empire. Ashlock observed the meeting occurring in the dining room from above. As he had planned, Elaine began to write on the parchment in ancient runes, which he and Stella could read without problem. It was almost like a secret language, allowing them to communicate without looking suspicious. Dante Voidmind sat a few tables away, and despite Jasper's constant attempts at starting a conversation with the scion, Dante's solid black eyes were set on Elaine's every move. Ashlock could also see ripples of chi emanating from him as if he were a stone dropped into a calm lake. 
Ashlock waited patiently for Elaine to write out three pretend attempts at an array. Clearly, she had zero knowledge about arrays, but Ashlock's language of the world skill effortlessly translated the ancient runic language in his head. At the end of the tournament, there will be a void mind invasion led by my brother. Ashlock read, filling in the gaps where he deemed necessary. The message wasn't that shocking, as the reason for the Scion's participation was dubious at best. In a world where power was gained through closed-door meditation, why would a Scion dare stray from the safety of their cave and waste time at some small-time alchemy tournament hosted in a backwater city by a small cultivation family? For this very reason, they even advertised the tournament as having meager rewards and being open to rogue cultivators. Ashlock expected a few families to show up with maybe an aspiring alchemist or someone they were training just to show some face to the Red Claw family but to send a Scion. An heir to the entire family? That was just nonsense. It was another reason Ashlock had been so eager to rescue Elaine from that suspicious mansion. Not just for her own safety, as he had no idea what problems her improved looks and spirit roots could cause, but also because he wanted information. What was the real reason Dante Voidmind was here? He hadn't expected her to get such juicy details so quickly. An invasion, hey. Ashlock mused as he eavesdropped on the meeting for a while longer. An hour passed, and the only other thing Elaine felt the need to write out in ancient runes translated to her being fine with watching over her brother as she also wanted access to something called the Void Chamber. Ashlock wasn't sure what this Void Chamber was exactly, but he could make an educated guess. It was well known that cultivators needed to meditate in areas with chi of their affinity floating around if they wished to advance. So this void chamber was likely a place of concentrated void chi. Come to think of it, Elaine has been basically unable to cultivate the entire time she's been at Red Vine Peak as there's no void chi around, and I didn't let her enter the mystic realm this time. Ashlock felt bad about this revelation. And it made him feel even worse, knowing that she was willing to stay with her brother just to have the opportunity to surround herself with some void chi for once. Maybe I can build her a cultivation room. Ashlock sighed, I still need to get Douglas to build that staircase and hollow out the mountain with rooms for everyone. It had been so busy recently that none of them had found the time. After the alchemy tournament and defeating this void mind invasion, I will take a week off and get all hands on deck to turn this mountain into the greatest cultivation abode this realm has ever seen. I just need to find a way to somehow survive many void mind cultivators coming here hellbent on taking over my beloved shithole of a city. Which was going to be no easy feat. Killing the void mind elder had been a mixture of luck and maple coming to the rescue. Neither of those were very reliable solutions or ones that could be utilized at scale against a full-on invasion. Maple for all the power shoved in such a tiny body got exhausted after just a few attacks. I do have consuming abyss this time round which will let me fight void with void. But if the void mind grand elder makes an entrance, then we might run into problems. Ashlock hummed to himself as he thought of scenarios, none of them looked too good. Why do they even want to invade? Would there be a way to call it off? Reach a peace deal, perhaps. If all they wanted was a chunk of dark light city or access to the mines, Ashlock didn't mind letting them have some control for a while if it bought him enough time to get strong enough to steamroll them. Ah, whatever. Why can't they let us have our little tournament in peace? Ashlock let out another long sigh in his mind. Alas, his wandering thoughts were interrupted by the sound of multiple chairs being pushed back on the dining room's tiled floor. Stella, Douglas, and Elder Margaret stood up from the table. Since the tournament is so soon, we must meet regularly. Elder Margaret said as per the script he had told her earlier in the day. The dining room is too noisy, so let's meet in your study next time. Ashlock would raise his concerns and ask if peace was an option away from Dante's prying eyes at this next meeting. That's a great idea, Elder Margaret, Elaine gave her a sweet smile, I will look forward to it. Elder Margaret nodded looked over to Dante's table to see his irritated expression, and then back to Elaine, just because your brother is here doesn't mean you can skip out on attending the lectures you promised the academy to teach due to your uncle's absence. It will be a good experience for you. Elaine bobbed her head in agreement, you're right with uncle gone for the last few weeks, I am sure the students have suffered greatly and fallen behind in their studies. Will you be fine teaching them? Douglas asked. Sure. Elaine was obviously refraining from showing Douglas any affection in front of Dante, I used to sit in on his lectures occasionally, and he left his lecture notes in my study so I could stand in as a substitute for a while without problems. Perfect. Well, we must be on our way. Elder Margaret bid farewell and led Douglas and Stella out of the dining room. 
Ashlock's gaze lingered in the room as he saw Dante stand up and then sit on Elaine's table. Elaine only seemed slightly bothered and uncomfortable in her brother's presence as they exchanged words while eating. Since when did you learn about runes? Dante questioned, and Elaine effortlessly answered, Dante do you think I was idle these last few years? You would be surprised how much time I have to study random topics such as runes when I don't get to spend any of it cultivating. Dante opened his mouth to say something but then shut it. Elaine had seemingly answered numerous of his other questions with that one statement. A few minutes later, they concluded their meal, and the three void minds stood and exited the dining hall while drawing many stares and whispers. Ashlock watched them walk back to their house, and once he saw they were all safely inside without incident, he sighed in relief. He had half expected Dante to kill someone for looking at him funny the entire way home. With the sun beginning to set, signifying the coming of dusk, Ashlock returned his sights to Red Vine Peak. People were waiting for him. Stella had brought the group back to the peak via a portal, and they were idly chatting while waiting for his presence. The moment he deactivated his skill and used his spiritual sight to look at the group, Stella seemed to somehow notice his attention. All right, the immortal is present. We can begin the real meeting. Stella clapped her hands and drew everyone's attention. With only a little over a week to go until the tournament, and while we have you here, Elder Margaret, can you give us a summary of the tournament preparations? Certainly, Elder Margaret said as she summoned a parchment to her hand, other than the Void Mind family that has already arrived, the Star Weaver, Terra Forge, Skyrend, and Azure Crest families are still planning attendance and will arrive shortly. Switching out the parchment for another, she continued, along with them. Over a hundred rogue cultivators have sent in applications, so we will have a preliminary round where we will filter them out with a quick test. A single testing round? Douglas asked, seems rather harsh. Well, that leads to my next point. Elder Margaret said, cultivation resources used in alchemy are expensive. However, in this rare case, funding isn't the issue but rather the sourcing. We aren't sure if one of our political rivals caught wind of the tournament or if one of the other Silver Spire Scions wants to screw over their little brother, but there's simply no market out there for the amount of resources we need for the tournament. That didn't sound good. How did the Red Claws plan to run an alchemy tournament without any ingredients to perform alchemy with? That is why we have a single testing round where we mainly test people's knowledge and give them a single low-grade herb to refine in front of a few judges to see their practical skills. Elder Margaret sighed as she tapped the parchment in her hands but even with this odd formatting, we still might not have enough resources for a single round due to the hundreds of rogue alchemists attending. Ashlock had many dragon coins and various artifacts and things he could sell if money was the problem. But according to Elder Margaret, money wasn't the issue. Instead, it was a scarcity of resources likely caused by a rival that wanted to see the tournament fail that was the problem. Hold on. I have an idea. Ashlock mused as he wrote on his trunk in lilac flames. Do you have a complete set of ingredients on hand? Stella translated the words. Elder Margaret nodded, and her ring flashed with golden light. A wooden box filled with porcelain bottles appeared between them. Everything an alchemist could need to make a low-grade body strengthening pill is within this box. Why low-grade? Stella inquired as she crouched down and inspected the bottles. Cheap ingredients, Elder Margaret replied, either they were grown in imperfect conditions leading to impurities, or they are easier to find alternatives of the ingredients required to make a high-grade pill. Ashlock was glad they had one complete set of ingredients, as that was all he needed. He planned to create an alchemy empire with his system-granted production skills. So a shortage of ingredients was no issue for him. He just needed to add the ingredients to his system's database to grow them with his blooming root flower production skill or even create mushrooms and fruit that mimic or replace the ingredients. Blanketing the area with his chi, he began to use telekinesis to lift up the porcelain bottles and extract the ingredients from them. This was so he could analyze them for his system. Explain each one, Elder Margaret. Ashlock wrote, and she raised a brow, likely confused about his ignorance, but she obeyed anyway. The body strengthening pill is an easy to make pill that has a few key ingredients. First is the chi flowing grass. She pointed to some plain looking grass with yellow tips. This grass is known for its properties to facilitate the flow of chi through the body's spirit roots, so it's an essential ingredient for most pills. Ashlock had brought up his blooming root flower production menu and saw the chi flowing grass added to his list of analyzed flowers. It did surprise him to learn that grass counted as flowers, but he wouldn't complain. Then we have the starlight lotus, Elder Margaret pointed at a beautiful light blue flower that looked like it had twinkling stars growing on its petals, 
despite how beautiful they look, they aren't too rare. They can be easily grown in lakes exposed to the night sky. This is important as they only bloom under starlight and absorb cosmic energy. Once plucked, they begin to degrade within days. What is the effect of the starlight lotus? Stella asked in awe. It was clear that Stella was interested in the flowers as she greedily absorbed all of the information. Was it due to that book about alchemy he had given her previously from the Void Mind Elder's stash? It's known to enhance the potency of pills by unblocking muscle tissue. Elder Margaret said, this makes the Starlight Lotus vital for the body strengthening pill as it will primarily target the muscle tissue. I see. Stella crossed her arms as she contemplated. How do you know so much about alchemy, Elder Margaret? A look of nostalgia overcame the stern-faced woman, back when the beast tides were less frequent and weaker and war between the demonic sex raged, we were at our peak. Our versatility in providing firepower on the front lines while also being alchemists and smiths made us invaluable to the Blood Lotus sect. Very few other affinities could do all that at once, so we thrived in the war era. But once the beast tides became more frequent and stronger with every wave, we had to start moving. Not every location the Blood Lotus sect moved to had good access to abundant fire chi, and the demonic sects saw less need to wage war over territory as that land would have to be conceded to the beast tides anyway. Ashlock felt his mind freeze. It had been mentioned in the past about how this was the strongest beast tide yet. But now that Elder Margaret laid it out, he became concerned. Senior Lee had told him the world was dying. And during those flashbacks of previous world trees, he distinctly remembered the feeling of the realms around his roots turning into hellscapes overflowing with demonic chi. By a dying world, is this what Senior Lee meant? Oh, look at me rambling away about the past. Elder Margaret sighed as she looked up at Ashlock's canopy that blocked the setting sun, to answer your question, we have a long history in the art of alchemy. But training up new alchemists is expensive, so as we faded into obscurity in this post-war era, we had to let go of alchemy and smithing to focus on keeping our firepower high just to survive out here. Ashlock had pushed his concerns about the world to the back of his mind and listened to the old woman's tale. He felt sorry for them. In peaceful times like now, those families specializing in something like the Silver Spires with their spatial rings will thrive. It's only in times of war when resources and manpower are limited that the all-rounders are preferred. Most of our knowledge has been lost or sold throughout the many times we have moved. Elder Margaret said as she tapped her head with her finger, but I still remember a lot of it which I try to pass down to those who will listen to me. Stella grinned, well, tell me all you know. Elder Margaret lightly chuckled, all right, let's see, the main component of the pill is the dragon marrow. She pointed to a bottle with white jelly streaming out of it, despite its grand sounding name, it can be found in most mammal type monsters in the soul fire realm or above. However, the problem lies in the fact it can only be harvested from monsters that are days away from ascending to the next stage in their cultivation. Otherwise, the bone marrow won't have enough chi to be considered dragon marrow. Stella nodded her head, that makes a lot of sense. We draw all the chi lying around in our bodies into our cores to push them over the edge to reach the next stage. Indeed, it's a hassle, and with the increasing strength of the monsters out in the wilderness due to the incoming beast tide. With the cultivators having to travel in larger groups and be better equipped, it's driving up the cost. Ashlock looked at the bone marrow and mentally frowned. That was definitely an ingredient he could not grow, as it had to come straight from a monster. But I can drag many monsters through portals without sending out a group of cultivators, so it shouldn't be too hard to source enough of the stuff. Ashlock was starting to realize just how much of a cheat his existence was. He may not be able to move, but that was a small price to pay for the skills of the system. And that's it. Elder Margaret sighed again, these are the three most basic ingredients needed for the body strengthening pill, which was the pill we planned to get the contestants to concoct for the final round. The chi flowing grass is the ingredient we have in abundant supply. It's the starlight lotus and dragon marrow that's the problem. Ashlock wrote, Elder Margaret, please return tomorrow with two aspiring alchemists from your family. I have a solution to this problem, on his trunk after confirming he had added the chi flowing grass and starlight lotus to his production menu. It was time to expand the farm in the cavern, as producing thousands of these resources was a simple affair for Ashlock. And after listening to Elder Margaret's tale, he decided there was no need to wait for the tournament's conclusion to start production. Even after unlocking the cauldron fruit, he had refrained from using the Red Claws as he hadn't trusted them. But times had changed, and the Red Claws were now an irreplaceable part of the Ash Fallen sect. He no longer had any qualms about going all out to improve and level them up. 
it was about time he returned the red claws to their former glory, one flower, fruit, and mushroom at a time. Chapter 143, Celestial Monolith Douglas looked over his shoulder as he saw the distorted sunset on Red Vine peek through the shimmering portal. Stella gave him a little wave before the portal snapped closed behind him with a pop of air that ruffled his short hair. With a sigh, Douglas surveyed the large cavern that encompassed his view. His wandering eyes were naturally drawn to the sound of moving water. Built along the stream's banks that ran through the cavern's center were farms with mushrooms and flowers. Stone bridges connected the two sides over the slow-moving stream, and on the far side were earthen bowls that contained a large open-top black fruit that resembled a cauldron. The whole place was dimly lit by the mushrooms sprouting from cracks in the ceiling and walls, emitting a soft blue glow. However, there was a recently added light source. Looking to the left, Douglas saw the massive opening that led to the hole that ran throughout the entire mountain, all the way to the peak. It was almost nighttime, so only a slight orange glow made it this far down. Time to get to work, Douglas grumbled as he trudged into the cavern's center. He had made good progress on setting up something to impress the silver spires last time, but now that he looked at it again, it was half arsed at best. Well, I was given the entire night to prepare the place for the alchemist tomorrow. I should be able to turn this into a place I am proud of by then. After all, he was now a few stages higher in the soul fire realm. He flexed his soul core, and light brown flames manifested on his fingertips. Just weeks ago, his soul flame was murky, full of impurities. But now, it was clear and flowed effortlessly through his body. Dropping to one knee, he placed his aflame fingers on the ground and closed his eyes. Humming to himself, he felt as his earthen chi easily penetrated the rock, and soon he had a mental map of the entire cavern in his mind. Every nook and cranny became crystal clear to him, as if the cavern had become an extension of his own body. With a grin, he forced his sixth stage soul fire to overwhelm the rock around him and mold it to his will. The entire place began to shake as the hard rock softened like clay and shifted around to fulfill the changes he willed upon the world. Thousands of meters of rock above him began to weigh down on the now softened stone ceiling of the cavern. Luckily, with the combined effort of his own chi and the thousands of roots from the patriarch holding the whole place together, Douglas managed to prevent the cavern from collapsing on his head. Bridges sprouted from the ground like worms of rock over the river and farms. Despite the cavern's grand size, he planned to have a multi-layered farm as the cavern had limited floor space. So the bridges over the farms were the first step to this plan. The mushrooms could grow on the lower layer, and then plants could bloom on the upper level. Douglas wondered how the patriarch made flora grow underground when he was clearly a spatial affinity cultivator. But he wasn't going to complain. As the rumbling of the cavern finally stopped, he reeled back his chi and stood up. Glancing around, he felt satisfied. He had created a second layer of stone like a massive bridge over the existing farm held up by pillars. Many gaps allowed for stone ramps that led up to the higher level. He had even created an aqueduct to carry water between the plants on the higher and lower levels. Douglas let out a tired breath as he noticed the absence of the orange light cascading down the hole that led to the surface, signifying it was night. His soul core felt half-used, and it was clear a few hours had gone by while he had been shaping the cavern to his plan. Going for a walk around the place, he followed a pathway that led him through a mushroom farm. Stone pillars marked the corners of each soil patch, holding up the structure overhead. Reaching a ramp, he wandered up to the upper layer. As far as the eye could see, there were hundreds of bare patches of soil with pathways between them. The patriarch should populate these with plants in the morning, Douglas said aloud, stroking his chin. His voice echoed around the cavern, and sudden loneliness overtook him. His hand dropped to his side it felt cold without the warmth of Elaine's hand. This cavern also felt far more empty without her bright company. Feeling his shoulders sag, Douglas remembered the face of Elaine's brother. Something about his ghoulish appearance and air of superiority irked him. It was hard to believe they were related at all. His ring flashed with power, and the black truffle Stella had gifted him materialized in his hand. He couldn't tell if this was a roundabout way of her calling him ugly. Had, that's definitely something she would do. Douglas stowed it away again, chuckling to himself. He didn't feel a need to use it just yet. Now, what should I do for the rest of the night? He hadn't expected to finish his plan for the cavern so soon. The difference between his past and present power was unbelievable. Not only had his stage gone up, but his purified soul fire allowed his chi to easily penetrate the rock and move it to his will with a fraction of the effort. A brief flicker of pride and perhaps arrogance clouded his mind. 
Should I try and challenge one of the girls to a duel? Douglas slapped himself. That was stupid. They would beat him with their eyes closed and one arm behind their backs. He knew all too well how Earth Chi corrupted his mind, as did all Chi types. It was especially noticeable after a sudden leap in power. He decided the best way to stave off the loneliness and quell his muscle brain thoughts was to empty out his soul core on something. Anything. He glanced around for a distraction, and his eyes eventually landed on the giant hole leading to the mountain peak. The hole is far too big for a staircase, but what if I create a vertical garden in the center? His fingers itched to get started, so he waltzed over with a grin. Ashlock tossed off the grogginess of sleep like a warm blanket on a Sunday morning and spread his spiritual sight in all directions to catch up on what he missed while asleep. After sending Elder Margaret back to the Whitestone Palace last night, he'd told Douglas to prepare the cavern for many more plants he planned to grow once the sun rose. Not that he needed sunlight to grow plants, but he didn't want to tell Douglas that he was sleeping while the man was working hard. Looking around, he saw Stella and Diana cultivating quietly under their chosen trees on opposite sides of the courtyard. A hazy mist of water chi swirled around Diana, and the air around Stella seemed slightly distorted due to the spatial chi. Meanwhile, Douglas was nowhere to be seen. Is he still working? Ashlock wondered. I only asked for him to add a few more farms. It shouldn't have taken him that long. A sudden rumbling from the giant hole in the courtyard's center drew Ashlock's attention. What the? Ashlock's vision blurred as he followed one of his roots that poked into the hole. Surprisingly, he saw a pillar of grey stone rising in the center. Its diameter was less than the hole through the mountain, leaving a wide gap. Ashlock could cast his sights down into the depth of the hole as he had roots running down its side and estimated that the freshly raised pillar was a few thousand meters tall, which only brought it slightly past the cavern area. Red Vine Peak was many thousands of meters tall after all, and Ashlock would have been amazed if Douglas had the chi on hand to create a 10,000 meter tall pillar that was 50 meters in diameter. Through his spiritual sight, Ashlock caught sight of Douglas, who looked so small from up here as he climbed up a spiraling staircase he had begun building into the outer wall of the hole. Ashlock was confused, why was he building the staircase along the wall of the hole that was very wide instead of on the pillar? Douglas stood on the staircase, his arm resting against the hole's wall and breathing deeply as if he had just run a marathon. Clearly, creating such a structure had taken a lot out of him. Ashlock then noticed empty stone troughs built into the pillar, and everything became clear. Elder Margaret claimed the starlight lotus requires starlight to bloom. I haven't grown that many flowers yet, so I assumed I could grow flowers wherever I needed, but maybe that's not the case. Ashlock knew he could provide nutrients and water to flowers through his roots from elsewhere, so he was confident in keeping most plants alive underground. But if a flower required something like a starlight? How could he provide that through roots, unless Chi somehow made it work anyway? Something to test then. Ashlock mused. It was clear Douglas had built the pillar as a place for him to grow the starlight lotus in more ideal conditions, so Ashlock sent his roots to begin crawling up the side of the pillar and begin emptying water into the stone troughs. Lotuses needed to grow in ponds, so this was a good substitute. A while went by, and Ashlock had finally filled most of them with water that he had pumped from a lake at the mountain's base. However, as he opened his flower production menu to populate them with the starlight lotus, he felt something through his connection with Bob the Ent. Closing the menu, he cast eye of the tree god, and sure enough, three cultivators with crimson hair were at the entrance to the cavern tunnel guarded by Bob. Elder Margaret, are you sure we are at the right place? A teenager standing beside the stern woman asked in a small voice. The boy clearly had doubts but was too scared to question the strict elder with any confidence. Of course we are. Elder Margaret snapped, causing the boy to shrink and stand beside a girl who looked almost identical to him in every way. Are they twins? They really look far too similar to be merely brother and sister. That aside, it was time to welcome them in. It would be rude to keep them waiting. Returning his sights up to Red Vine Peak, Ashlock debated waking Stella out of her meditation to deal with the visitors, but her peaceful face deterred him from such action. Diana also seemed busy, and her ancient language studies were only partly done, leaving him with Larry. Larry, go lead Douglas to the tunnel. We have visitors. A nearby demonic tree shook as the monstrous spider crawled out, his spindly legs hitting the ground one at a time as his many red eyes glanced around. To make things faster, Ashlock summoned a portal that would lead Larry straight to Douglas. Elder Margaret stared at the weird wooden wall that blocked off the entrance to the cavern she had been informed about. After a few minutes, 
doubt began to fester at the back of her mind. Despite her confident response to one of the twins she had brought with her, she had only been informed of this place via vague instructions and was unsure if she was supposed to stand here, knock on the door or just walk straight through. The only reason she played with the ludicrous idea of walking straight through was the wall's slimy texture, making her think she could push her hand through. Just wait a few more minutes, Elder Margaret reassured herself as she tapped her foot. We did arrive a little earlier than expected. Or maybe this is a test of our patience, as that is one of the many virtues of alchemy. Her thoughts were silenced as the wall began to shift towards them. Elder Margaret hated to admit she took a few steps back alongside the twins. The grey wall pulsed with a lilac hue as if a flickering candle was nestled somewhere deep within. There was a squelching noise as the wall morphed and freed itself from the tunnel. The grey mass surged forward, formed limbs, and then stood up. Moments later, the sun was blocked out by a towering five-meter-tall ant made from grey slime resembling wood. Between its legs was a dim tunnel illuminated with a blue glow. Elder Margaret was about to take a cautious step toward the now exposed tunnel, but her chi empowered eyes noticed something big moving in the shadows. And then she saw a second figure also emerging, this one smaller and humanoid. Elder Margaret felt Olivia's hand grip her robe when an ashen furred leg the size of a small tree emerged from the tunnel, followed by another leg and then a head with many scarlet eyes that looked curiously around. Yes, yes, I'm coming, a gruff voice echoed out of the tunnel and then a hulking man wearing a black robe with a large hood and mask emerged into the morning sunlight beside the monstrous spider. Relax, it's just the Underlord and the spirit beast of the Ash Fallen sect. Elder Margaret whispered to Olivia and Oliver, the twins she had brought with them. They were both young, at fourteen years old, and had shown a lot of promise and interest in alchemy. Elder Margaret knew of Douglas's real name and face as they had met in the dining hall a day earlier, but he clearly wanted to keep his identity hidden so she used the title he had been introduced with previously. Why did you lead me here? Douglas asked the spider in an annoyed tone and then glanced around. His masked gaze eventually landed on her, Elder Margaret? Is that you? Elder Margaret could tell this man was exhausted, even with the mask and hood, from his tone of voice and slumped shoulders. She gave him a nod, yes, it's me, and I brought along the two aspiring alchemists the immortal asked for. Oh. Douglas seemed to wake up gesturing for them to follow him, come in, come in. He turned, and his form vanished back down the tunnel. Elder Margaret began to walk and noticed Olivia and Oliver exchanging a nervous glance before falling in line a step behind her. A thin smile appeared on her lips as the tunnel's darkness enveloped them, and they descended into the cavern. Reaching the base, Elder Margaret only saw Douglas standing there. The spirit beast had clearly gone off somewhere else. Welcome to the cavern. Douglas's voice drew the attention of Olivia and Oliver, who curiously glanced around at the sea of mushrooms growing in neat plots of dirt. Elder Margaret glanced up at the five-meter-high ceiling and wondered where the rest of the vast cavern had gone. After all, they had taken shelter down here to escape the Deo storm a few months ago. Before I show you around, what are your names? Douglas asked the twins. Oliver. Olivia. They answered at the same time. Air, right. Your parents have a good sense of humor, Douglas chuckled, drew back his hood, and removed his mask, my name is Douglas. I manage most of the Ash Fallen Sex construction projects and will be your tour guide today. Both of them nodded. We will be working a lot together in the future, so let me know if you have any problems, anyway, onwards with the tour, please follow me and don't stray off the paths. Douglas then led them down the darkened path. Elder Margaret summoned a fireball to her hand to help light the way so the youngsters wouldn't accidentally stray off the trail and crush the mushrooms underfoot. Elder Margaret was then surprised to feel the path curving upwards into a ramp, and soon enough, she was on an upper level and looking out across a vast flatland of bare soil patches that reached all the way to the cavern walls. Douglas gestured around, this is where the chi flowing grass. A sudden wave of power blanketed the area, sending a shiver down Elder Margaret's spine. She blinked and then blinked again unable to register what she saw. The numerous soil patches exploded as thousands of yellow-tipped grass stalks sprouted all at once. The vast barren land had been transformed into a lush grassland within seconds. Elder Margaret stood witness to this unfathomable miracle, her jaw hanging in disbelief, the mechanics of closure forgotten in the face of an incomprehensible domain over nature. We'll grow. Douglas finished his sentence with a smirk. How? Oliver murmured. So this is the power of an immortal. Olivia mirrored her brother's disbelief. Come on, a bit of grass isn't that exciting. 
Douglas began to wander toward a large hole in the cavern off to the side with sunlight pouring down it. Elder Margaret had to disagree, but she followed along anyway grateful that the twins had been too busy being shocked to catch sight of her shameful face of awe. Calm yourself. You have seen things as ridiculous as this before. You went into a pocket realm, for heaven's sake. Shaking away the nonsense plaguing her mind, Elder Margaret mindlessly followed Douglas until he stopped. Whoa, Olivia said as she glanced over the edge into the abyss below. They were currently standing on the steps of a staircase and looking at a stone pillar covered in black vines that seemingly led all the way into the darkest depths of the earth. And this is where the starlight lotus will grow. Douglas declared with a smile. Elder Margaret uttered a disbelieving murmur, impossible. Her eyes, however, remained unwaveringly riveted on the pillar. She was skeptical, resistant to accept the potential for the same miraculous spectacle to unfurl again. Despite her doubt, the impossible unfolded once more before her as that same godly pressure descended. The stone pillar pulsed with life bursting into a breathtaking spectacle as innumerable starlight lotus blossomed from the water-filled crevices. Their magnificent petals, a celestial blue, unfolded like a million stars had descended from the heavens to bloom, decorating the pillar as if it were a cosmos rising up from hell and challenging the heavens. A once unremarkable stone pillar had transformed into a stunning canvas of floral brilliance, a monolith shimmering with the cosmic beauty of the night sky and ethereal celestial garden. Elder Margaret collapsed to her knees as she realized the event's gravity. To the immortal, an inconvenience as minor as sourcing starlight lotus could be solved with nothing more than a wave of his hand. She had never felt so small yet full of hope in all her long life. Chapter 144, A Profound Pill Ashlock felt a little prideful watching Elder Margaret's and the twins' reactions to him growing cultivation resources in the blink of an eye. The system may refrain from giving him many powerful attack skills, but it didn't shortchange him regarding production skills. He was a tree, after all. A being that was here to nurture the world and those around him as well as kill those that threaten his existence. Luckily, even with his system being frugal with attack skills, he could use his spatial chi in any way he pleased, and as his cultivation realm increased, so did his ability to chop things in half with half-formed rifts. Those thoughts aside, and with his feeling of pride fleeting, Ashlock could finally take in the entire situation as he had only just woken up, and already so much had occurred. The hundred-meter wide hole that went through the entire mountain and into the depths below now had a fifty-meter wide pillar of stone blooming with starlight lotus rising in its center. Neither the pillar nor the stairs built into the outside wall of the hole reached the peak yet. But Ashlock was sure Douglas could reach those heights in due time. He did completely renovate the farm to the point I can hardly even recognize the cavern anymore, so he must be exhausted. Ashlock's sights shifted through his vast root network, and he looked at the farm from various angles. The lower floor was a sea of mushrooms that thrived in the darkness. However, these mushrooms only grew on the west side of the river that ran through the cavern, as on the east side, there were the cauldron fruits inside earthen bowls. Then over both sides was a second floor held up by pillars with the chi flowing grass growing in many soil plots. Wait. I now have some aspiring alchemists and someone who knows about alchemy here. And I even have access to most of the ingredients I need to make a pill. Ashlock began to get eager. He finally had a way to use the cauldron fruit he had unlocked when his chi fruit production skill was upgraded to A grade all those moons ago. I might have been able to mess around with it or have Stella try alchemy after killing the Grand Elder but I decided to just leave it be for a while as we were all busy with other things. Ashlock sighed. It had been a very hectic few weeks, and keeping track of everything demanding his attention was getting hard. Let's see. I must prepare for the imminent void mind invasion and the alchemy tournament. I should probably expand my roots in all directions, advance my cultivation, kill monsters for credits, practice spatial techniques, build up Red Vine Peak. Ashlock sighed again. Those all sounded like great uses of his time, but with alchemists finally here in the cavern, the wonders of alchemy were calling to him. He had complete confidence in his ability to perform alchemy with his overpowered production skills to grow the best ingredients and the cauldron fruit that allowed him to produce the highest grade pills from the provided ingredients due to his soul flame's purity. The only things that had been holding him back were a lack of knowledge about pill recipes and actually getting his non-existent hands on the cultivation resources so he could grow them himself. But with Elder Magret's presence, who seemed to be an encyclopedia of knowledge regarding the art of alchemy, he felt confident creating some fantastic pills. If only I had trusted the Red Claw sooner. Ashlock mused as he switched views back to Elder Margaret and the twins, that had only just recovered from their shock. Maybe then I wouldn't have needed to conduct the alchemy tournament. 
Although the primary purpose of the alchemy tournament had been to find a talented alchemist to live on Red Vine Peak, the tournament did have some other goals. Such as establishing the Red Claws as the powerhouse over Dark Light City, and he also wanted to form some contact with the merchants as he would need someone to sell the pills he made. After all, Dark Light City was too poor to afford the top grade pills he planned to create. I also wouldn't have formed a business relationship with the Silver Spires if not for the tournament, that alone makes all of this worth it. Ashlock naturally didn't know the full extent of the Silver Spire family, but from what he could gather, they were one of the top dogs here in the Blood Lotus sect, and if anyone could afford his pill supply, it would be them. And for just a 15% cut, they are allowing me to conduct business under the Silver Spire name. Even the tournament is protected by their name. Ashlock hummed as his mind drifted down a rabbit hole of thoughts. He was brought back to reality a while later when he heard Elder Margaret speak. Can I inspect one? She asked Douglas with a slight tremble in her voice. One of the Starlight Lotus? Sure, that should be fine. Douglas turned and then paused as he realized something that Ashlock also noticed at the same time. The hole was a hundred meters wide, yet the pillar was only fifty meters in diameter. Although the stone steps that jutted out of the hole wall were wide enough for many people, there was still a considerable gap between the pillar decorated in Starlight Lotus and them. Ashlock was about to use telekinesis to save Douglas from embarrassment but paused when he saw the man close his eyes. Earth Chi rippled out, traveling all the way into the depths of the mountain and then rocketing up the pillar. The nearest stone trough on the pillar suddenly broke away like a desk drawer. It wasn't terribly fast, but it eventually arrived beside them. The stone stretched out many meters and defied gravity, but with Douglas's Earth Chi rippling across its surface and giving it immense strength, there were no issues. Elder Margaret stepped forward after a nod from Douglas and began to harvest all of the starlight lotuses growing within the trough with utmost care. It was almost mesmerizing watching the stern woman cycling her chi and carefully burning the lotus with her soul fire just below the bud so the stalk was left behind. After the third one, she paused and stood back. Her spatial ring flashed with power, and a red fruit appeared in her hand. Without hesitation, she bit into the fruit, and Ashlock came to a realization. Isn't that my fruit with the florist's touch skill? Sure enough, a subtle glow formed around her hands, and she got back to work on clipping the starlight lotus buds with her soul fire that now looked like blades. It was all so effortless compared to before. The starlight lotuses practically leaned into her hands as if wanting to be freed from their stalks. To Ashlock, they had looked like typical plants other than their starry petals. However, after seeing the difference between before and after Elder Margaret ate the fruit, he realized just how difficult harvesting chi-filled plants was. It was as if the chi within their bodies gave them a sliver of survival instincts. When Elder Margaret had chopped the first two, the plant's chi had gone to fight off the soul flames attempting to burn through its stalks. A while later, the glow faded from Elder Margaret's hands she had a satisfied grin as she inspected the flower buds in her hand. I don't know how the immortal did it, but these starlight lotus are of the highest quality. It's like they were grown on a chi-dense lake under constant moonlight for centuries. Elder Magret's words confirmed something at the back of Ashlock's mind. He had just bloomed these starlight lotus within seconds during the early morning sun yet she had claimed earlier that these flowers could only bloom under starlight and supposedly absorbed cosmic energy. Ashlock didn't have cosmic energy as far as he knew, nor did he grow these flowers under starlight. Therefore the only explanation was that he could grow them anywhere even underground. They did take a stupidly large chunk of chi to grow, though. Ashlock mused. Spending chi was getting increasingly annoying as he wished to advance his cultivation stage, but that would never happen with him spending chi like this. Cultivating can wait until the winter, this is too important to skip out on for now. The fact I can grow spiritual plants this easily is beyond a cheat. Can't I lay my eyes on any plant and grow as many of them as I want? Ashlock doubted it. These were the most basic type of plants possible. One was even glorified grass, yet they had taken half of his chi reserves to spawn. If growing simple chi flowing grass was this costly, what about some plants that the gods like to put in their tea? Would he even have the chi reserves to grow a single petal? If there wasn't a sudden shortage of spiritual plants due to rival families wanting to mess with the tournament, I would take out a loan and buy as many plants as possible. Actually, couldn't the silver spires help me here? It was worth a shot, but that could wait. For now, he wanted to try alchemy or at least watch someone else perform it. While he had been thinking, the group had moved on to the chi flowing grass, and once again, Elder Margaret was harvesting the grass by wrapping her hand in soul fire and pulling out the grass in fistfuls. 
Beside her were the twins, Oliver and Olivia. They were copying the elder's movements and harvesting the grass. However, unlike the elder, who effortlessly pulled out many grass stalks at once, they struggled a lot more and resorted to focusing on one stalk at a time. It was rather amusing watching the two youngsters wrestling with an overgrown grass stalk as it fought back and strengthened itself with its chi. They appear to be in the first stage of the soul fire realm, meaning they successfully formed their soul cores only recently. Ashlock looked a little closer and noticed their crimson flames were very pure, I can see why they were interested in alchemy with spirit roots that pure. However, they will struggle with a soul flame that weak. Luckily, Ashlock had a solution for almost any weakness in a cultivator. Whether it was heart demons, impure spirit roots, or overall weakness, he knew a cure. He mentally prescribed meditation near the fire trees and entry to the next mystic realm for the twins. What do we do now, Elder? Olivia asked while her brother wrestled with a grass stalk behind her and fell onto his back with a huff. Elder Margaret looked to Douglas, I assume there are cauldrons somewhere. Sure there are, Douglas nodded and gestured for them to follow him, you can take any ramp down to the lower level and then, if you need to, cross the river and head toward the earthen bowls. Elder Margaret raised a brow while following Douglas but didn't comment further. The group of four didn't end up needing to cross the river, as the nearest ramp led them down to the east bank of the river. Here we are. Douglas paused beside one of the bowls, there are small stairs beside it that you two might wish to use to get a better view as the cauldron is rather large. Oliver and Olivia exchanged a glance before they curiously climbed onto the step and glanced over the side. What is that? Oliver blurted, is this really a cauldron? It does kind of look like one, though, just more natural. Olivia tilted her head, Elder Margaret, is there a way to grow a cauldron? Not that I know of, the stern woman shook her head as she approached the bowl and peered over its side, they are usually made of chi-infused metal, so I can't see how you could grow one, what is this? All pairs of eyes looked to Douglas, but he just shrugged, I have no idea. Elder Margaret returned to scrutinize Ashlock's cauldron fruit. He hadn't realized it was that weird but now that he thought about it, he understood their reaction. Should I wake Stella and send her down there to explain? Ashlock grumbled. He really needed to make it mandatory for every Red Claw to learn the ancient language. There was literally no excuse why they couldn't with the help of the language comprehension fruit. In fact, I will do that right now. Ashlock's vision blurred, and he soon overlooked the study in the White Stone Palace, where the Red Claw Grand Elder sat back in his chair with his eyes closed. Ashlock flooded the room with spatial chi, which made the Grand Elder's eyes snap open. Ashlock ignored him and used telekinesis to pick up a fountain pen that seemed very expensive and began to scribble on a blank piece of parchment left on the desk. The Grand Elder had jumped up, sending his chair crashing behind him and crimson flames surrounding his body. He eyed the floating pen with suspicion and tracked its every movement. By decree from the Ash Fallen sect. All Red Claw family members must learn the ancient runic language within the next month. Make use of the fruit provided to you and come and collect more if needed. Upon finishing his message, the pen fell to the side with a thud, and Ashlock withdrew his presence back to the cavern as he didn't want to miss what was happening there. Why not give it a try? Douglas said, it's not like we have a limited amount of plants to experiment with. I guess I could try, Elder Margaret said, do you have any dragon marrow? This was an area of alchemy that Ashlock didn't have total dominion over. Basically, any ingredient that could be grown wasn't an issue. But something like the dragon marrow, which had to be sourced from a monster that was on the cusp of ascending to the next stage or realm, would require some effort on his part to gather. I don't believe so, Douglas replied. All right, I will only create one batch of pills, as we have a very limited supply of dragon marrow. Elder Margaret ushered the twins to pay attention as she gathered all the ingredients on the edge of the earthen bowl. Oliver and Olivia, pay attention, okay. The pair nodded, so she continued, the first step of alchemy is to know the recipe for the desired pill. In this case, we have gathered the three ingredients needed for a body strengthening pill. She then picked up the jar containing the dragon marrow and poured the jelly into her hand, second step is to purify the gathered ingredients. I will start with the dragon marrow. Crimson soul fire blanketed her hands and the jelly. Everyone, including Ashlock, watched in anticipation as Elder Margaret closed her eyes and then explained the art of purification takes a long time and practice to master. Essentially, I must push my soul fire into ingredients to remove the impurities. This is difficult because if I am not careful, my fire chi will react with the residual chi left in the ingredient that makes it useful for alchemy in the first place and corrupt it. 
The moment my chi taints the ingredient, it becomes useless. Ashlock could see tiny beads of sweat accumulating on her forehead as she guided her chi through the jelly with expert control. Looking closely, Ashlock could see a black substance, almost like soot, carried away from the jelly by the flames. A tense minute passed, and eventually, Elder Margaret let out a sigh of relief and opened her eyes. Her soul fire receded back into her body, leaving an almost translucent blob of bone marrow behind. I could have done a better job as the speed of purification also affects the quality of the ingredient. But overall, this was a good result. Elder Margaret carefully reached down and placed the jelly in the cauldron fruit. Next up would be the chi flowing grass, the order isn't that important for this particular recipe, but I have personally always followed this order, so remember it well, Elder Margaret picked up the grass in question, and her flames reappeared. A tense ten minutes went by as Elder Margaret kept her eyes shut as her crimson flames danced up and down the grass stalk. Eventually, Ashlock saw the green stem begin to turn black and then disintegrate shortly after into a pile of dust. Elder, what happened, Oliver whispered, worried she would snap at him. Amazing. I simply can't believe it. Elder Margaret muttered while looking at the pile of ash. Was there something wrong with the chi flowing grass? Douglas asked. He had a look of concern as he studied everyone's faces. She shook her head, nothing wrong. If anything, the ingredient is so perfect that I struggled to improve it. Only the slightest hint of corruption was present within the grass stalk. So, Elder, why did you turn it to dust? Olivia asked while inspecting the pile of soot. Elder Margaret ruffled the young girl's hair, I let my competitiveness overwhelm me. It's the fate of all alchemists to see the slightest imperfection in something as a direct challenge, and I sadly lost the duel. Remember when I mentioned that the time spent purifying an ingredient mattered? Olivia bobbed her head under the elder's palm, yes, I do. Well, this is what happens if you take too long, Elder Margaret said, no matter how careful I am, my soul fire carries its own impurities and slowly corrupts the ingredient I am trying to purify. It's an odd balancing act, and it's why those with the purest spirit roots fare best in alchemy. Removing her hand from the girl's head, she summoned another one of Ashlock's homegrown chi flowing grass from her spatial ring and tossed it into the cauldron fruit. She then also threw in the starlight lotus without even attempting to purify it. With the top quality ingredients, I have no need to waste time purifying them and can get onto the main event, unification. Elder Margaret summoned crimson fire to her hands and filled the cauldron with her soul fire. Ashlock noticed that he couldn't feel anything. Likely because the cauldron was a fruit rather than directly connected to his body like a branch or root. Just like cooking a meal, you can't shove all ingredients into the same wok and blast them at the same temperature and expect anything but a burnt clump of mismatched ingredients to come out. Elder Margaret lectured while her eyes were closed, alchemy is much the same. We must know how each ingredient reacts with one another and how to combine them in the correct order. If I mess up at any stage, I will either waste the ingredients or form a low-grade pill that is no more useful than just chewing on a random bundle of the ingredients. While Elder Margaret created the pill, Ashlock felt the slightest pull on his chi reserves toward the cauldron fruit. As he was inspecting the cause, Elder Margaret seemed to have noticed something was off by her expression, but she kept going. Eventually, she finished, and her flames died out. Reaching into the cauldron, she retrieved a pill resembling a translucent marble with twinkling stars and strands of green throughout it. The pill was beautiful. Twirling it around, Elder Margaret muttered, There's no way I could create a pill of the profound tear out of these simple ingredients with my soul fire. Ashlock finally figured out what had happened. His pure soul fire had helped with the process, allowing Elder Margaret to create a pill above her capabilities. But now he was really curious, just how good was a profound tear pill? Chapter 145, Stella's New Talent Stella let out a deep breath as her consciousness returned to reality. Her eyes fluttered open, and she squinted briefly as she was blinded by the warm midday sun. Feeling within herself, she couldn't help but sigh. Even with the help of Ashlock's truffles, fruits and residual chi blanketing the mountain peak, it would still take at least a few months to move up a single stage in the star core realm. Yet despite the disappointing realization regarding the monumental amount of time it took to advance through the star core realm, Stella wasn't so worried. With the existence of the mystic realm, it almost feels pointless to waste time meditating out here, even with the help of the chi gathering formation and the resources Ash provided me. Stella shook her head and stood up. Her arse ached as the ground was rough stone, and she had been sitting far too long. I should really buy a cushion or something for when I meditate. 
Stella's eyes drifted across the mountain peak and settled on the bench under Ashlock's canopy. Or I could meditate on the bench, not like there's a massive difference in Chi over there compared to here. Stella glanced up at the canopy of the demonic tree she had been meditating under and saw it rustle in the wind as streaks of sunlight poured through the gaps. It was beautiful, with its striking resemblance to Ash. Wait, if Ash sees me as his daughter, then are these my siblings? Stella chuckled to herself and patted the tree on the trunk. Her hand then paused on its bark as she felt something tingle at the back of her brain. Did I just feel a tiny hint of happiness? Removing her hand, the distant feeling faded. Placing it back on brought it back. The tree was happy. Stella withdrew her hand and stared at it, since when could I talk to trees? Sadly her hand didn't seem to have the answer, nor did she. MHM, weird. Shrugging, she walked across the sunlit mountaintop with a spring in her step. She glanced briefly at the far end of the courtyard, where she could see Diana's silhouette, barely visible through the swirling mist around the group of water affinity demonic trees facing the forest between them and Dark Light City. She also noticed Kaida, who was curled around Diana. The snake had grown rather large, which reminded Stella of Mabel. Instinctually she reached up and was only half surprised to feel the soft fur of the white squirrel that claimed her head as his throne. Mabel sleepily rubbed his head against her fingers which made her smile. Eventually, Stella made it to the bench under Ash's canopy. Before doing anything else, she used telekinesis to pull a few low-hanging fruits down to her as she needed replacements for the fruit she had eaten before meditating. Let's see. I ate two deep meditations and an enlightenment one. Stella pulled down the required fruit and stowed them away in her spatial ring. She was then about to ask Ash about today's plans when she noticed his attention was elsewhere. Stella couldn't quite explain it but she could sense when Ash was asleep or focused on something else. What could be drawing his interest this time? Stella pondered while tapping her chin and glancing around. Her gaze eventually landed on the large hole in the center of the mountain peak, and she suddenly remembered that the Red Claws were supposed to be arriving today. Closing her eyes, she entered the spatial plane, and with a click of her fingers, she materialized a portal before her and walked straight through. As the portal snapped closed behind her, she suddenly felt everyone's gaze on her including two teenagers with crimson hair and eyes she had never seen before. It had been quite a while since she had to introduce herself to new people, and it was made even worse as they were teenagers. Stella found adults easier to converse and connect with compared to children. Perhaps it was because she didn't have a normal childhood, but she never felt she could connect with those younger than her. Relax, you can do this, Stella. Just politely introduce yourself to the newcomers. There's no need to worry. You won't make a fool of yourself, it's not like they can see your face. A slight breeze originating from the hole in the side of the cavern brushed her hair over her eyes, making her blink as it itched her eye. Blink. Stella could feel her hair. Which could only mean one thing, she had forgotten to wear her mask. Stella felt her stomach sink. She had finally started getting comfortable ordering people around for Ash, but that required the mask that could obscure her expressions. Unlike the elders of the Red Claw family, she hadn't been brought up with etiquette lessons, nor did she have centuries of life experience to pull from to navigate conversations. She had a facade as the face of the Ash Fallen sect and the descendant of an immortal. How was she supposed to keep that act up without the darn mask? Elder Margaret suddenly stopped staring at her and became flustered. She put her hands on the back of the twins' heads and forced them into a bow with her, greeting Stella. I hope our early arrival didn't disturb you or the immortal's meditation. Stella wanted to respond but nothing came out of her mouth. She replayed every word in her head, but nothing sounded right. Suddenly a small paw smacked her on the forehead bringing her out of her daze. You did no such thing, Elder Margaret, Stella said as she felt Maple roll over on her head into a better sleeping position. And who might these two be? All three red claws straightened up, and Elder Margaret helpfully introduced her to the twins, these two are Oliver and Olivia. They have some of our family's purest crimson soul flames and took an early interest in alchemy. We have trained them the best we could over the years, but our resources are limited. We have also taken a conscious step away from alchemy, so I could never provide them the education they deserved. Elder Margaret gestured to Stella, Oliver, and Olivia, this is Stella. She represents the immortal, and the ash fallen sect that lords over us. Stella gave them a brief nod and then walked over while trying to ignore the stars in their eyes. She wished she remembered her mask, but it would be odd to wear it now. It's fine. These two should be spending a lot of time in the cavern, and I don't want to wear a mask every time I come down here to speak to Douglas. 
I should get used to their stares. So, Elder Margaret, were you able to conduct alchemy with the cauldron the immortal grew? Stella asked while leaning over the earthen bowl and inspecting the massive black fruit. She furiously nodded, it is actually the best cauldron I have ever had the pleasure of using. Look here at the pill I was able to create. Stella turned to face the stern woman and was handed a pill that looked like a glass ball. It was cold to the touch and incredibly smooth. So this is a freshly made pill. It feels high quality, but besides reading that book I got from the Void Mind Elder's stash, what do I know about alchemy? Humming to herself, Stella side-eyed the Elder and debated if she should ask about the pill. Would the Elder judge her lack of knowledge? Deciding her acting skills were only so good and her knowledge too shallow to continue the lies, Stella took the risk. I must admit, Elder Margaret, although I have dabbled in some old literature that speaks highly of alchemy's great mysteries. I am not well versed in pill creation. Stella carefully handed the pill to the Elder, could you tell me about the pill? To Stella's relief, none of the Red Claws showed any adverse reaction to her admittance of ignorance, and Elder Margaret explained the entire process from start to finish in one long lecture that didn't bore Stella in the slightest. So Ash can produce such amazing cultivation resources in mere moments. As expected of him. And Elder Margaret created such a supposedly amazing pill with the help of the cauldron fruit. So this is a profound tear pill? What does that mean? Stella asked. Well, you see. Elder Margaret caught her breath and continued, there are eight tiers of pills that exist in our realm. Mortal, spirit, profound, earth, sky, divine, celestial, and finally the heavenly tier. So you created a third tier pill. Stella frowned, that doesn't seem very impressive considering what you told me about the amazing ingredients and how the cauldron assisted your soul fire. Elder Margaret shook her head, you misunderstand. The body strengthening pill is a mortal tear pill. Yet due to the high quality ingredients and pure soul fire, I could turn such a simple pill with only three basic ingredients into one with a similar effect to a profound tear pill. Now that she worded it like that, Stella could see how miraculous the whole thing was. She had turned a tier one pill into a tier three. To create higher tier pills, the rarity and number of ingredients required increases exponentially. Elder Margaret lectured, also, the time it takes to create the pill increases quite quickly. It gets to the point where an alchemist doesn't have the cultivation realm, skill or ingredients to create higher tier pills, and they become ever stuck at a certain tier of pill creation. I see. Stella contemplated, what is the highest tier pill you can make? As an eighth stage soul fire realm cultivator with centuries of experience, the best pill I have ever created was an earth tier. Elder Margaret had a hint of nostalgia in her voice, but I will never create something so high tier again. Really? Stella tilted her head, even with the immortal's cauldron, ingredients, and access to the mystic realm. Elder Margaret seemed to pause, and then her eyes widened, you're right. With his assistance, I should be able to make an earth tier pill before I die. Miss Stella, have you ever performed alchemy before? The male twin, whom Stella believed was called Oliver, asked her with awe in his eyes. Stella wanted to shy away from the enthusiastic gaze but gathered some courage, no, I have never tried before. We can learn together. Olivia piped up. Um. Stella wanted to turn down the offer and learn away from prying eyes, but their enthusiasm rubbed off on her. All right, fine, show me how it's done. After an hour lecture that she swore was half nonsense, Stella stood before the fruit cauldron with the three ingredients needed for the body strengthening pill laid out before her. The twins were on either side of her, standing in front of their own earthen bowls. Somehow they had turned this into a competition, and unable to say no, Stella had agreed to their challenge on who could create the best pill. Elder Margaret stood behind them and acted as the judge. You may now begin. Stella let out a breath as she focused. Okay, first, I need to purify the dragon marrow, how hard can it be? Picking up the weird jelly substance, she surrounded it in her spatial flames and closed her eyes. In the silence of her mind, she finally found some peace. Now what do I do? Remove the impurities? Stella frowned. Her soul fire wasn't actually hot, so it wasn't like she could burn the impurities away. But spatial affinity wasn't listed in the book as an affinity unable to perform alchemy, so there had to be a way. What about the spatial plane? Her entire reality shifted, and everything became outlined in grids. The lump of bone marrow in her hand seemed like nothing special, but as she focused closer, she noticed the tiny traces of impurities floating about as they were outlined in faint grids that were easy to miss. 
Stella interjected her spatial chi into the bone marrow through tiny gaps in its jelly-like surface. She then carefully followed shifting pathways to avoid messing with the crystallized chi within the bone marrow. Then as she snaked her chi toward the marked impurities, she noticed the walls of the shifting pathways slowly erode away from her chi. I need to hurry up. Stella cursed as she felt sweat accumulating on her forehead. Her heart pounded in her chest, and her star core lightly pulsed with power. Never before had she needed to be this precise and delicate with her chi control. It was a totally new experience for her. Luckily, despite her lack of experience, her pure chi glided through the pathways effortlessly, and she managed to isolate the impurities moments later. Okay, good job Stella, now what? Think. You can't just shatter them with your chi, as that will corrupt the rest of the dragon marrow. Hmm. Her mind raced as she slowly noticed the corruption of her chi on the pathways. Rather than panic, the time pressure helped her focus. Eventually, she settled on a potentially stupid idea. What if I just teleport the impurities with tiny rifts? Since the impurities shifted around like fireflies, all she had to do was open a rift the width of a hair right in front of where she predicted they would move, and with a tiny pop, it was gone. A minute went by, and Stella meticulously removed every trace of impurity she could spot. However, as she was nearly done with just a few to go, she could already see hints of her own chi beginning to corrupt the dragon marrow as the pathways were eroded away. It's too risky to continue pushing to get every last impurity out. I should withdraw here. She wasn't happy about it, but it was important to know when to retreat and take the small victories. Opening her eyes, she saw the dragon marrow in her hand was more translucent than before and almost mirrored that same glass-like appearance as the pill Elder Margaret made. Glancing to the side, she saw Olivia sniffling as she held a blackened blob of dragon marrow in her hand. Olivia, you took too long to remove the impurities, and your own chi has ruined the dragon marrow, Elder Margaret said from behind with the voice of a stern teacher, therefore, you are disqualified. Can't I try again? Olivia begged, please. I was so close. Elder Margaret shook her head, you got arrogant, and this is the price you pay. We have a limited amount of dragon marrow so I can't waste any more on giving you a second chance. She then walked over and looked between Stella and Oliver. Stella, yours is near perfect, and Oliver, did you even remove any impurities? Why yes, Elder Margaret, look here. Oliver pointed at a tiny pile of ash on the earthen bowl's rim. Elder Margaret snorted, that is a poor attempt, but at least you didn't ruin the precious dragon marrow like your sister. Stella felt a pang of sympathy for the twins, but she could do little for them. I never realized alchemy was this brutal. No wonder most people just focus on cultivation and ignore this path in life. Her eyes wandered across the other two ingredients. If I had to also remove the impurities from both of these, I don't think I would have any patience left to actually make the pill. And yet Elder Margaret said all this is for a tier 1 pill? Wouldn't preparing all the ingredients for an earth tier pill take days? Stella didn't know how to describe it but knowing how steep the path to becoming a master alchemist was made it all the more appealing. If I became an alchemist capable of crafting pills of the heavenly tier, Ash would be even more proud of me, and I could help him so much more. I know he loves and cares for me now as his own daughter, so I'm not worried he would throw me away, but that doesn't mean I should get complacent. Nobody likes a lazy daughter. With the fire of passion burning in her chest, or was that her star core? Either way, she gathered the three ingredients that were all prepared and threw them into the cauldron she bathed in her soul fire. Honestly, this was the stage she had absolutely no idea what to do. Elder Margaret had described it as cooking a meal, but she had never cooked before. Ash always provided her fruit, and sometimes she feasted on birds that were prepared for her by Diana. Closing her eyes, the spatial plane did help with manipulating the ingredients more precisely, but the actual combining of them was a mystery to her. Do I wrap the chi flowing grass around the dragon marrow like a dumpling? Stella did that, and all she noticed were hints of corruption seeping back into the ingredients, which made her panic a little. However, right as she was going to try and unravel them and try again, she felt something lovingly embrace her soul fire. Lilac flames, far purer than her own that could only belong to ash blanketed the clump of ingredients and helped keep the corruption at bay. Thank you, tree, Stella muttered under her breath and smiled. The sensation of a caring parent helping her while learning something new warmed her heart as it wasn't a feeling she was used to. The sudden help allowed Stella to try different combinations of the starlight lotus, chi flowing grass, and dragon marrow without worry. Soon she was getting the hang of it, and ten minutes later, a pill rose from the cauldron. 
Stella retrieved it and frowned. It was clearly a lot worse than Elder Margaret's, with a dark cloud overshadowing the sparkles of the starlight lotus and the lush green of the chi flowing grass within the glass marble. She was disappointed but also proud. This was her first ever attempt at trying alchemy, after all. Turning around, she handed the pill to Elder Margaret and the three red claws, and even Douglas started at it in awe. Have you really never performed alchemy? Elder Margaret asked skeptically. Even with the hints of corruption, this is a high-grade mortal tear pill, or perhaps even a spirit tear pill. So definitely a high-grade tier one and might even be a tier two, got it. I think I'm fine with that as a first attempt. That's amazing, Stella. Olivia gave her a bright smile despite the redness in her eyes from tears. Oliver also nodded in approval, mine was a dud. I corrupted the ingredients in the cauldron. He then scratched the back of his neck, even with the help of some mysterious lilac flames that tried to help me, I still messed it up. Elder Margaret let out a long sigh, you two have really disappointed me today. Don't be too harsh with them, Elder Margaret, Stella interrupted the woman, they are still young and have a lot of time to grow and improve. The two twins looked at her as if she was their guardian angel. For some reason, she felt no need to shy away from their gazes, perhaps it was because they had gone through a trial together. Elder Margaret was about to reply when she suddenly paused. Her spatial ring flashed with power, and a talisman appeared in her hand. It glowed with power. Stella noticed a sliver of the Elder's chi enter the talisman, and then it seemed like she was listening to something. Everyone waited patiently, and eventually, Elder Margaret furrowed her brows, the Grand Elder has called an emergency meeting. Apparently, the Ash Fallen sect has given us a decree. Stella, you wouldn't know anything about it, would you? Stella thought long and hard, but nothing came to mind, so she shook her head. Must have come straight from the immortal. I could go and ask him for you. No, it's quite all right. Elder Margaret waved her off, I will head back now to hear what the Grand Elder has to say. Can I leave the twins here? Stella glanced between the teens and sighed, I guess so. Great, see you all later. Elder Margaret turned and was surprised when a rift manifested before her showing the courtyard of the White Stone Palace. Without hesitation, she stepped through and vanished. Stella let out another sigh as she saw the two eager teenagers gaze at her. What am I supposed to do with them? Should I take them to the mountain peak and let them cultivate under the fire trees? And what the hell was that decree Elder Margaret was going on about? Chapter 146, Hunting with Titans Grand Elder Redclaw frowned as he gazed out his study's window at the distant Red Vine Peak. A perpetual mist swirled around the mountain, obscuring everything but the tips of the demonic trees from his curious gaze. I wonder what goes on over there. His wandering thoughts were interrupted by frantic footsteps that echoed beyond the thick wooden doors of his study. He turned to face them just in time to watch a worried-looking middle-aged man push them open. Elder Brent, welcome. Grand Elder, what has the Ash Fallen sect decreed of us? Calm down and wait for the others. The Grand Elder smiled reassuringly. It's not that serious, so calm yourself. Oh, thank the heavens, Elder Brent let out a breath and respectfully stood beside his desk. But his crossed arms and drumming fingers showed his impatience. Moments later, Elder M.O. strode through the ajar doors with his spirit flame hammer still in hand. The Grand Elder looked at it with slight envy for a moment, but alas, he could only blame himself for not being deemed worthy of the Immortal's inheritance. So long as we keep on the good side of the Ash Fallen sect and the Immortal continues to grant us access to that mystic realm, there will be a next time for me. I'm sure of it. Grand Elder, you called. Elder M.O. asked and also gave a friendly nod to Elder Brent. Once Elder Margaret arrives, I will explain everything, but until then, how goes the Forge Elder M.O.? Enjoying life as a smith. Elder M.O. grinned, of course I am. If anything... I lament the fact I didn't pick up the hammer sooner. Any progress with making weapons containing your will? Elder Brent asked from the side. I, I have. Elder M.O. approached the desk, cleared aside some papers, and with a flash of power from his spatial ring, a sword manifested on the desk. Still a work in progress, but I forged this thing myself from scratch, Elder M.O. awkwardly scratched the top of his balding head, I'm having to learn smithing on the job, so it's rather amateurish in quality. The Grand Elder had been holding back his opinion out of respect for his lifelong friend but had to agree with Elder M.O. It was the work of a beginner smith at best. The blade wasn't straight, the edges were dull, and it looked like a basic steel sword that even a mortal might sneer at. Elder Brent, 
Try picking it up. Elder Emo had a mischievous grin that made Elder Brent raise a brow, is it cursed or something Elder Emo? Why are you grinning at me like that? Just pick up the darn sword. Do you really believe I would try to harm you, my good friend? Elder Emo chuckled, if you don't dare, perhaps the Grand Elder will. The Grand Elder studied Elder Mo's suspicious demeanor he had to admit he was curious now. What could make his old friend act like this? Eyeing the ordinary-looking steel sword with a dubious gaze, the Grand Elder finally gave in to his curiosity and reached over to grip the sword's hilt. The moment his fingers curled around the bare metal hilt, a dormant feeling he was all too familiar washed over him. War. The unending brutality of war consumed him. His heart pounded in his chest as memories of horrific century-old battles flashed through his mind. The sky was dyed crimson from blood the wails of the anguished screamed in his ears. A chaotic storm of chi swirled around him as the clangs of swords reverberated across the hellscape as two sides fought under the laws of heaven. He reeled his hand back from the cold steel the sword clanged on the desk like a gong freeing him from the mental torment of a distant past. Elder Emo stood there, his grin holding an eerie meaning. Do you remember now, old friend? Elder Emo said, the darkness of war laid dormant in your bones. Elder Brent looked curiously between the two and then back at the sword. He made no move to follow in the Grand Elder's footsteps in grasping the sword hilt. I see. The Grand Elder murmured as he calmed his pounding heart, so this is what it means to imbue your will into a sword with spirit fire. Elder Mo nodded thoughtfully, with every impact of my hammer on molten metal, another memory was imbued. I might have gone a little overboard, but the idea was to have a sword that, when held by someone, would give them the overpowering feeling of being on the battlefield. I thought it would make a good training weapon. I can see the direction you were going for, but perhaps lock that one away. The Grand Elder's gaze lingered on the sword hilt. He felt his fingers itch as if wanting to grasp it again to relieve those glorious death-filled days after all, he was a retired man of war who still craved his enemy's blood. Elder Mo's ring flashed, and the sword vanished. The brief moment of thoughtful silence was broken with Elder Margaret entering the study. The Grand Elder gave her a nod to welcome her and then clapped his hands. All right, with everyone here, we can begin, he pointed toward the parchment on his desk with the ancient runic language scribbled in half-dried ink, who here can read this? All three elders crowded around the desk and scrutinized it. I know this is the ancient language. Sadly I haven't gotten around to learning it yet. Elder Margaret said, what does it say, Grand Elder? It was such a perfect reaction that he couldn't help but chuckle, it's a decree straight from the immortal. He wrote it himself with that fountain pen. All of their gazes landed on the fountain pen as if it were some divine artifact. The Grand Elder cleared his throat and then translated to the best of his ability, the immortal wants us all to learn the ancient runic language within the next month. Then after a pause to let everyone digest the words, he continued, with the help of those language comprehension fruits, I bet you can all learn it within days. Was that it? Elder Brent furrowed his brows, I can see how learning the language could be useful, but did you really call the meeting just for that? The Grand Elder chuckled, of course not. We are all so busy that we haven't had a spare moment to catch up, and I thought this was a fitting occasion. He smiled at Elder Margaret, you took two promising alchemists from our family over to the Ash Fallen sect today. How did that go? A sigh escaped her lips. Did something go wrong? The Grand Elder studied her disappointed expression and felt a hint of worry fester in his stomach. Mixed results, to say the least, ugh, I'm just so, embarrassed. Why? What happened? I don't know if they got nervous or I had high expectations, but both failed to create a pill. Elder Margaret frowned. Well, that's only to be expected, the Grand Elder said calmly as he drew back his chair and sat down, they have only been practicing for what, a year now? Most alchemists take a decade before they can produce pills on demand like that. That's true, but look at this. Elder Margaret summoned a beautiful pill and handed it to the Grand Elder. All the other elders also curiously leaned in to inspect it. Is this a profound tear pill? Elder Brent frowned, wait. A profound tear body strengthening pill? Did you make this? Why would anyone waste such high grade resources on such a basic pill? You know we are short on resources for the alchemy tournament already, so to go around wasting. Elder Brent, be quiet. Elder Margaret snapped. The man grumbled and stepped back, it wasn't a waste. The resources to make this pill weren't even ours. I know you will find it hard to believe but I saw the immortal grow thousands of chi flowing grass and starlight lotus within seconds. It was the most magical experience of my life, 
even better than the mystic realm. The Grand Elder's eyes widened, and he looked back at the profound tear pill in his palm, so you're telling me the ingredients for this pill were grown in seconds by the immortal? If you aren't lying, then that Silver Spire brat has signed the deal of a lifetime. Indeed, they have, Elder Margaret replied seriously. So why were you upset with the twins again? The Grand Elder asked, steering the conversation back to the original topic. Elder Margaret's ring flashed with power, and a less impressive but still very well-crafted pill appeared, this was made by Stella. She placed the pill onto the desk, she has never done alchemy before. Impossible. Elder Brent blurted out as he scooped up the pill and inspected it, that's simply impossible. Even if the ingredients are devoid of impurities, it would still take godlike intuition to merge them into a spirit tear pill on their first try. The Grand Elder seized the pill and ignored Elder Brent's protests as a wide grin formed on his aged face. Knowing someone like the Immortal was one thing, but having a connection to a master alchemist was another. It would appear his fortune kept rising the longer he was associated with the Ash Fallen sect. He couldn't help but reminisce about the day he encountered Stella and the spirit beast and surrendered his family to them via an oath. A decision that in previous months had brought him great misery. Nothing in his long life brought him more despair than seeing his family trapped in a palace of white stone on a mountaintop as glorified slaves to an unknown force and unable to cultivate due to the lack of fire chi. Yet, recently, his family's perseverance has begun to be rewarded. Ever since that worm attack led me to Red Vine Peak with Stella, my family has been blessed with reward after reward by the immortal. At this rate, under the enriching shadow of the Ash Fallen sect, my family will rise to heights unheard of in the history of my bloodline. The Grand Elder slammed his hand on the desk as he stood up causing everyone to shut their yappers and stare at him. Enough nonsense. Listen here, if you were respectful to Stella before, now imagine she is a master alchemist in the making. If I hear anyone has caused her problems, I will deal with them personally. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Grand Elder. All three of his cherished elders responded in unison. Good. Now tell me, how goes the tournament preparations? Elder Brent coughed, ahem, well, the noble families will be arriving within the next few days, so we have put the airship station on a temporary lockdown to avoid another incident like the one with the arrival of the Void Mine Scion. I see, and who do we believe is arriving next? The Skyrend family should arrive tomorrow morning. Elder Margaret said. Everyone groaned, and the Grand Elder gripped the bridge of his nose, those overzealous heaven-worshipping bastards are always a handful to deal with. All right, make sure nobody, and I mean nobody, is present in the airship station to mess with them on arrival. Everyone nodded, and the Grand Elder sighed, All right, that is all I wish to discuss. You can all return to your duties now. However, Elder Margaret, please stay behind. I have something else to discuss with you regarding the tournament. Ashlock found it rather amusing listening in on the Red Claw's conversation it was interesting to see the reactions of ordinary people to his and Stella's shenanigans as he lacked a frame of reference but got bored as the Grand Elder and Elder Margaret spent a while discussing logistics for the tournament. He had left the running of the tournament to them for a good reason logistics and pandering to noble families weren't his forte. Anyway, he was in a good mood as the whole day had been rather full of surprises. Despite their young age, he hadn't expected the Red Claw twins to be so, mad at alchemy. However, that disappointment had been washed away by Stella's capabilities. He had given Stella and Oliver nearly the same level of help during the competition to keep things fair, but Stella had approached everything with a calmness and skill that seemed alien to him. In his mind, Stella was a hot-headed think-later type of person who acted on her instincts far too often. But put her in front of a pill cauldron, and she completely changed into someone with a calm and calculative demeanor. Perhaps this mindset is what allows her to excel in cultivation compared to others as well. Ashlock mused. He had no way to crack open her skull and see how she meditated compared to others, but after observing her approach to alchemy, he was convinced she could concentrate and hyper-focus on tasks. Regarding focusing, Ashlock was finding it harder to keep up with things. There was just so much going on recently that he felt scattered-brained. Instead of being a fleshy human with two legs and a limited perspective that would have the intelligent idea to delegate things to others as there was no chance in hell, they could monitor so much at once, he had decided to abuse his new biology to its limit and do most of the things himself. This is why I want everyone to learn the ancient language, that way, I can order people around more efficiently, Ashlock grumbled. I need to learn to focus my efforts on the things I am best at and let the others do the rest. I don't have to do everything myself anymore. I got a lot of people around me to help. 
Ashlock felt the way the sun hit his leaves and determined it was mid-afternoon meaning he still had half a day left before he fell asleep and then had to oversee the welcoming of the Skyrend family. So what should he focus his time on? His thoughts were interrupted when there was a sudden pop of spatial chi, and a girl he was all too familiar with stepped through and collapsed straight onto the bench with a sigh. I'm exhausted, Tree. Stella sulked, and it's all your fault. My fault. Ashlock was taken aback, how could it be my fault? Stella naturally couldn't hear him but continued talking to the air as she always did, why did you give the Grand Elder a decree and cause Elder Margaret to leave the twins in my care? I have no idea what to do with them. Ah, that was kind of my fault. Ashlock chuckled to himself. He hadn't foreseen the Grand Elder calling an entire meeting over it, but he could see why Stella was mad. Hey, tree, Stella patted his black bark, what was the decree anyway? I told them to learn the ancient language so I can speak with them and not bother you so much, Ashlock wrote in lilac flames on his trunk, and she quickly translated it. That's not a good reason to leave me with two darn teenagers. Stella grumbled, why must I take care of them anyway? Can't you do it? Why not practice alchemy with them? Ashlock asked through writing, and she rolled her eyes, Tree, we only have two ingredients to make pills from. How can we make body strengthening pills without the dragon marrow? That was a good point. I still need to find a solution to that ingredient shortage. Hmm, it comes from monsters, right? Ashlock's vision blurred as he crossed many miles through his roots and appeared far out in the wilderness near the demonic tree wall where he first spotted the worm. It had been a while since the worm disrupted the place, so it made sense that there was a large gathering of monsters in the vicinity. None were super strong, which was ideal because Ashlock just needed their bone marrow. Ashlock's vision blurred back to the mountain peak where Stella was still ranting about being a glorified babysitter, so he gave her an outlet. There is a group of monsters out in the wild. Why not go and kill them? Ashlock wrote, and then after a moment of contemplation, he added, you could also collect new plants while you are out there. Even if he didn't know the pill recipes, it would be great to amass a database of as many plants as possible. I don't know anything about plants, though, Stella said while standing back up. She then stretched her back with an audible crack and rolled her shoulders, but I could go for some good old punching monsters in the face after concentrating so hard on that pill. Douglas can look after those terrors for me. Alas, Ashlock needed Douglas to work on extending the staircase and pillar. He also required him to add rooms throughout the mountain, so sadly, the man couldn't be left looking after the twins. Douglas needs to work and rest. Why not take the twins with you? Ashlock wrote and the face of pure betrayal Stella pulled after reading it was priceless. You want me to look after two weaklings out in the wild? All while I hunt monsters and pick up plants for you. She crossed her arms and huffed, I don't want that type of responsibility. Titus can look after them, Ashlock wrote as he mentally commanded the twenty meter tall ant to stand up. The towering creature of black wood loomed over the annoyed Stella with two eyes of lilac soul fire glaring down at her. Fine. If the big guy is responsible, then I don't care anymore, Stella grumbled as she clicked her fingers, and a portal manifested before her. I will tell the twins what's happening. So please open a portal down there once you got Titus near the monsters, and be quick about it. And with that, she was gone. Some peace and quiet returned to the courtyard, but Ashlock always enjoyed having a little fight with her. Anyway, now wasn't the time to sit around and think. He had to get this lumbering giant out into the wilderness to avoid Stella getting really cross with him. His star core pulsed with power, and a portal over ten meters high wobbled into existence. Diana cracked open an eye at the scene but soon returned to meditating. Titus bent down and took a lumbering step through the portal. A moment later, he passed through with a massive pop as air rushed to fill the void left behind. The portal then collapsed, sending another blast of air that briefly disrupted the mist wall and rustled the scarlet leaves of every tree in the courtyard, including Ashlock's. Right, now to open a portal onto his shoulder. Ashlock easily set the anchor point as Titus was a blinding beacon of spatial chi. With that done, he could open a rift in the cavern, connecting two locations many miles apart. Ashlock then watched as Stella led the two bewildered twins through the portal onto Titus's shoulders. S. Stella. Olivia stuttered as she looked off the side and saw the ground far below, what are we doing here? Well, Elder Margaret said I needed to keep watch over you, Stella grinned, and we had no more dragon marrow so why shouldn't I bring you hunting for some monsters? At this point, 
the two twins huddled with one another and gripped the twisted black roots that made up Titus's body for dear life as the behemoth strode forward. How does that make any sense? Oliver shouted over the roaring wind as Titus moved toward the sea of monsters surrounding the wall of demonic trees. Stella shrugged as her blonde hair blew in the wind. Titus, protect these two at all costs, but listen to their orders. She then addressed the confused twins, I will be busy down there fighting monsters but feel free to order this big guy around if you want to join in the fun. Anyway, see you two later. Stella spread her arms and fell backward into a free fall down the side of the Ent. Causing the two twins to scream and lean over the side. However, before she had even fallen halfway toward the lush grass of the wilderness, a portal manifested below her and teleported her off somewhere else with a resounding pop. The two twins exchanged a glance, and Olivia muttered, She's insane, right? Chapter 147 Self Reflection Stella felt wild and free as she swung her sword and brutally slashed a mutated beast in half the sheer force of her attack sent the two halves of the corpse hurtling through the air in opposite directions. One half took out a small gathering of monsters nearby while the other shot off toward one of the towering demonic trees forming a wall and splattered a chicken-looking monster against the tree bark, turning both into nothing but meat paste and making the tree shake. She was wholly unconcerned by the shower of blood she ran through as a single pulse from her star core reversed the blood's trajectory. This was the first time since exiting the mystic realm that she could go all out with her new cultivation stage, and she loved it. Having a star core made life incomparable to before. It was hard for soul fire cultivators to truly let loose without worry as every drop of chi they spent would have to be meditated for later. Whereas the warm star core pulsing in her chest was a beacon of self-sustaining power that flooded her body with boundless energy. She could slaughter without worry, as once the killing was finished, she could flop down and sleep on the rolling lush meadows and regain all of the spent chi without effort. The monster's screams were music to her ears as she manically laughed. Having to maintain such a perfect mask of excellence was the least of her concerns out here. Even with the twins perched on Titus's shoulders far away, she could be herself out here. A few more sword swings finished the monsters around her they were terribly weak, so they offered little to her besides stress relief. Stella paused as her area became devoid of anything living and glanced around while breathing in the fresh air tainted with death. It was beautiful. The scent of death oddly brought a sense of comfort to her. If everything was dead, then I could be left alone with tree. Stella sighed and tapped the tip of her bloody sword on the stained grass. A few flashes of old memories surfaced at the forefront of her mind. She could still recall the heaviness of the decapitated head hidden away in that coarse bag she had clutched in her tiny hands while being stared down by those servants sent to kill her. Tisk. Stella clicked her tongue as she tried to shake away the memories of the screaming mortal servants fleeing her and how she had survived the Ravenborn murder plot. She had lived through it all with Tree by her side. Why would she need anybody else? Stella, you're being weird again, she muttered to herself as she kicked a nearby monster's head in a daze causing it to explode from just a tap. MHM, I need to rein in my strength when dealing with these weaklings. A sigh escaped her lips as she flicked off the brain mush from her shoe and was about to teleport to a distant grouping of monsters near the demonic tree wall when she felt a familiar wave of spatial chi blanket the area. Rifts manifested overhead, tearing through the peaceful blue sky. Stella cranked her neck to see black vines ending in a spike coated in thorns wiggle through the rifts and descend on the meal below. Oh yeah, Ash wanted dragon marrow. Stella realized as she saw the vines try to skewer and wrap around the pieces of corpses left over from her rampage. Maybe I shouldn't have attacked with such force, sorry, tree. A vine diverted from the corpses and carefully nudged her with the tip of the spike in an almost endearing way. I know, I know. Stella patted it, I messed up. I will get you some good food. The vine slowly moved away and then slammed down into the stomach of a wolf-looking beast with enough force to crack the earth. The spike dug deep between the monster's rib cage, allowing the vine to effortlessly reel back into the rift overhead with the corpse dangling from the end. Stella stepped back to avoid the dripping blood from the corpses being dragged away and because she wanted to try something new, which she needed some space away from Ash's influence to do. Raising her sword so the blade was perfectly between her eyes, Stella observed the distant group of monsters crowded around the demonic trees. For this crazy idea of hers to be executed flawlessly, she needed to be lightning quick. She had learned from Ash's previous mistake portals were a two-way affair. If she could stab the monsters in the face, they could rip hers apart with their claws. Closing her eyes, the world became grids through the spatial plane, and Stella began setting multiple anchor points as she planned to open numerous portals in quick succession. This is going to be fun. While Ashlock was half distracted with dragging the corpses through his rifts, 
he watched Stella's odd actions in confusion. Why is she standing still like that? He wondered to himself. The group of monsters wasn't that far away. She should be able to teleport and make short work of them, so why hesitate? His questions were answered when the sword she was holding suddenly lit up with purple flames concentrated at the tip her eyes snapped open, and a second later, a portal manifested right in front of her, providing a distorted view of a monster's back. The ape-like monster seemed to notice the sudden portal behind it and turned to look over its shoulder in confusion Stella didn't give it a chance to foresee its death as the flaming sword struck through the portal and decapitated the ape in one clean arc. A shrill scream came from all the other ape monsters as they watched the headless corpses fall forward with a thud, and the head rolled down the slope. They all began to ignore the mushrooms they had been gingerly munching on and searched around for the unknown foe. Some even sniffed the air, and one leapt up to a low-hanging branch and tried to use the vantage point to spot the killer. However, before the apes could even get a chance to fathom what had occurred, death already came knocking. Ashlock watched in amazement as portals rapidly popped into existence around Stella one after another, always showing an unguarded side of an ape. With her eyes closed, she mercilessly slashed at the portals, the spatial chi coating her sword, allowing it to pass through without affecting the rift. A swoosh marked the end of the spectacle as Stella flicked the blood from her blade and opened her eyes. How was that tree? Are the corpses in good enough condition to be snacks for you? She then twirled around with a smile, also, I got no blood on my clothes. Aren't I a genius? Ashlock sent some spatial chi through his roots and wrote on the ground in lilac flames, show off. Stella laughed, honestly, I got the idea from you. You always attack through rifts, so I thought I could too. Although I opened and closed them quickly to avoid an incident like the worm poison. She then began to hum to herself as she glanced around, so Ashlock took the opportunity to open rifts above the new ape monster corpses and drag them back to the mountain peak. He planned to go through them individually and harvest any corpses with dragon marrow. He would then eat the rest for some sacrificial credits, even if he didn't expect great returns from these soul fire monsters. After dragging the ten ape corpses through rifts, including their heads, Ashlock returned to find Stella staring at Titus in the distance. The twins seemed to be having a blast, but he felt they could do with some supervision, so seeing as Stella had finished up with this area, he asked with flames on the ground, why don't you go to the twins? Stella frowned as her hair fluttered in the breeze. There was a long pause as something seemed to be on the tip of her tongue. Eventually, she sighed, Tree, am I weird? Is it strange that I don't want to talk to them or anyone? Sometimes I feel like I am the odd one out. Like, as if I don't see the world like all of them do. Ashlock could tell that question had been bothering her by her fidgeting with the sword hilt while staring at the ground where he had been writing. As someone that had seen her grow up, he knew what had caused her deep-set issues. Her entire family had died when she was young, leaving her abandoned in a massive pavilion, all alone except for servants wanting to kill her. Once they were dealt with, she didn't speak to another human for almost a decade. Who wouldn't come out from a rough childhood like that is a little weird, even by cultivation world standards. In recent times, especially as he tried to expand the sect and Stella was his main form of communication, he had deemed her inability to communicate a significant issue that needed resolving. But honestly, he was starting to realize that it was just part of what made Stella. Stella. If she improved slowly over time, then great, but he wasn't so concerned anymore. You are perfect the way you are. Ashlock wrote in flames, behave in a way you deem fitting and do whatever makes you happy. MHM. Stella didn't seem convinced at all. Fine, if you say so. But how do I get more people to like me? Whenever it comes to sect decisions, everyone treats me like a crazy person. Ashlock had to admit she could be unhinged at times, but to demand she alter her world views without the life experience to reach those conclusions herself was nonsense. Everyone saw the world through their own tinted lens. You're not crazy. You just have a unique viewpoint. Ashlock wrote, as we all do, so don't worry about it. She seemed lost in thought for a while and then shook it off and strode forward toward Titus in the far distance. Her speed increased as she became wrapped in soul flames, and moments later, she was shooting across the landscape through a tunnel of portals. Titus raised his titanic arm, and under the excited shouts of Olivia, he struck down a group of fleeing monsters, pulverizing them into the ground. Sigh. It seems they are also getting carried away like Stella did. How can I extract any dragon marrow from bones crushed to dust? Ashlock lamented as he watched the twins cheer and Stella suddenly appear beside them. Having fun? She asked, 
how are we supposed to get anything if you kill these monsters like that? The twins yelped at the sudden voice. Sorry. We were just... They let off a flurry of half-completed excuses Stella waved them off. I'm going to relax on the other shoulder. You two kill the monsters while leaving their corpses as intact as possible, and if you see any interesting plants down below, let me know, and I will go get them. Without hearing their answer, Stella leaped over Titus's head, landed on the opposite shoulder, and sat down. It seemed she had a lot on her mind, so Ashlock left her to it. The next few hours consisted of Titus flattening all monsters in the vicinity with his fifth stage star core gravity and then squishing their heads with his giant fingers leaving the corpses mostly intact. Ashlock would then drag the corpses away, much to the twins' excitement. Stella. Olivia shouted over the head, down below, toward the setting sun, there's a grove. Ashlock looked in the direction of where Olivia was pointing and could see the aforementioned grove. It didn't look like anything extraordinary, except it seemed a bit out of place. It gave the vibe of an oasis surrounded by nothing but lush grassland. Stella stood up with a yawn and glanced toward the sun, what about it? It's just a guess, but Dreamweaver orchids might be there. What are those? Stella inquired, and Ashlock also wanted to know. Olivia squinted at the grove, Dreamweaver orchids aren't that special on their own, but when grouped up in a cluster, the illusionary chi they release can create mirages. Interesting, Stella tapped her chin, and you think that grove is an illusion. Maybe, Olivia shrugged, I've only read about them in dusty old books. It could just be a random grouping of trees. All right, well, we can go check it out before heading back, Stella said as she patted the ant on the head, Titus, go grab one of those trees. The ant wordlessly obeyed the command and trudged toward the grove. Ashlock was somewhat surprised Stella didn't dash in alone and instead used Titus to test the waters. Titus got close enough to reach down, and his hand passed through the tree like a projection. Ashlock didn't have time to be surprised as a flurry of tiny orange feathered birds exploded from the illusionary grove in all directions. Ashlock commanded Titus to pulse his fifth stage star core and all the birds plummeted to the ground like hail as the immense gravity robbed their ability to fly. Titus then sent a tidal wave of spatial chi that smashed into the grove and washed away the illusion chi. The fake trees were replaced by a giant bush of light pink orchids. You were right, sis. Oliver shouted in awe while pointing at the bush. Olivia pointed her nose to the sky and chuckled, haha, as expected. Ashlock began to open rifts and deploy vines to secure the birds. Even though they were weak, they should be worth a hundred credits together which was no small amount. Diana had long given up on meditation for the evening. It was rather hard to concentrate when corpses were raining from the sky. The place reeked of death and stale blood. She couldn't help but raise a brow when hundreds of fluffy orange birds impaled on vine spikes were brought through and added to the ridiculous pile that had grown in the courtyard's center. Kaido was coiled loosely around her legs, and his head rested on her shoulder. His tongue kept flicking out while eyeing the mountain of food. It was likely heaven to him, but it was nothing but an eyesore for Diana. A sudden enormous portal blocked the setting sun, and the end stepped through. It strode a few steps before sitting down. A root emerged from the ground and connected to the titan that became dormant in the corner of the peak. There was no sign of Stella which confused Diana. She was about to look for the girl when she appeared beside her. Phew, finally got rid of them. Oh hey Diana, how's it going? Did you miss me? Hi. Diana frowned, why do you sound so friendly? Stella snorted and shook her head, whatever, at least I tried. Right, may I ask what the meaning of all this is? Diana gestured to the mountain of rotting meat. Stella gazed at the pile and whistled, Wow, I didn't know we collected so much. To answer your question, my dear friend, this was all in an attempt to get Dragon Marrow. Dragon Marrow. Diana searched her mind and had a vague idea, Are you talking about an alchemy ingredient? Also, stop talking like that. It's not like you. Fine, fine. Stella grumbled, Yes, I was talking about the alchemy ingredient. Apparently, it's found in the corpses of beasts on the cusp of ascending to the next stage or realm. Hey, that's odd. Why is that? Diana inquired while letting Kaida gnaw on her finger. The little guy was clearly getting restless for some of the food. Something about the chi in the body being the most dense while on the cusp of ascension. Makes sense. Diana said as she walked over to the corpse pile surrounded by shifting vines coated in spikes and picked up one of the skewered bird corpses, which seemed bite-sized for Kaida. Diana then felt an all-too-familiar chill run down her spine. Glancing up, 
she caught a glimpse of that mysterious eye that glared through a jagged slit in Ashlock's black bark. The vines shifted faster, making Diana stumble back despite the eye's presence. She could even feel Kaida hiss quietly as he slithered off her shoulder and retreated backward. Like some accursed octopus checking out its prey, the vines brought the corpses one by one in front of the mysterious eye as if inspecting them. Most corpses got chucked to the side into a new pile and began to be dissolved, while a select few were placed in a separate pile. From a glance, Diana could tell those were the corpses with the most demonic chi still wafting from their bodies. Are those the corpses with the dragon marrow? Diana wondered, and then an odd thought crossed her mind. Wait, as a demon, do I also have dragon marrow? I hope the alchemists won't start hunting me down. Chapter 148, Abyssal Whispers Through his demonic eye, Ashlock could see through the mortal flesh and gaze upon the spiritual nature of the corpses he had acquired. Rather than black fur sprouting from leathered skin, he saw the dormant underlying spirit roots that had once served as the passageways for chi that had fueled the dead monster's power. Holding one of the headless ape corpses by the spike of his vine in front of his demonic eye, Ashlock scrutinized it. The passageways were devoid of the demonic chi which made sense as the monster had died. Without the soul core in their chest consciously directing the flow, the demonic chi had nowhere to go except two places, into the rotting flesh or back to the outside world. This ape had a lot of muscle tissue that had greedily absorbed the uncontrolled chi. However, through his demonic eye, Ashlock could also see demonic chi rising off the corpse like smoke into the surrounding atmosphere. It's why he preferred fresh corpses. They always provided the most sacrificial credits and had worked best for root puppets due to the chi still present in the body. Ashlock tossed this ape corpse to the right into a giant pile doused in corrosive fluids. It showed no signs of having been near ascending to the next stage or realm, which is what he was hunting for he wanted dragon marrow. I can see why alchemists charge so much for pills now, Ashlock grumbled as he picked up another corpse to inspect it, I'm going through all this effort for a single ingredient used in a tier 1 pill, and I'm cheating with my demonic eye. Hell. I even grew the other two ingredients, so this should have been a breeze. Right? Am I missing something here? Why is sourcing ingredients so darn hard? Ashlock's grumbling was cut short as his eye pulsed with interest this ape monster seemed more promising than the last few he had inspected. The demonic chi smoke was denser, and the muscles were also packed with demonic chi. It was all a guess at the end of the day, but Ashlock felt confident that this ape may have dragon marrow, so he carefully lowered it into the smaller pile to his left side and retracted his vine. He still hadn't figured out how to get the dragon marrow out of the corpses, but he decided to deal with that later. Sorting through this monstrous pile came first. As Ashlock picked up yet another corpse, he heard Larry gruffly ask, Master, may I eat some? What? Ashlock's eye turned to glance at Larry, who had crawled down from his resting tree and stood beside the corpses that he had been busy absorbing. I can't. Larry said, his head dropping a little. Of course, you can. You just startled me. Ashlock obviously wanted as many sacrificial credits as possible, but he wasn't going to deny his summons a good meal. Thank you, Master, your generosity is as boundless as the stars in the sky. Larry said as he opened his maw wide to devour a nearby corpse, but then Ashlock had a sudden idea. Wait. Larry comically froze mid-bite as if time had stopped. Don't eat from that pile. Come eat these ones instead, Ashlock pointed a vine at the pile of corpses that should have dragon marrow, however you must leave all the bones behind, only eat the flesh. Larry slowly withdrew his fangs and closed his maw. He then crawled past Ashlock, careful not to step on the hundreds of vines that slithered around his feet and made his way to the smaller, more tasty-looking pile. To both of their surprise, Kaida had also made his way over to the pile and flickered his tongue at Ashlock as if asking for permission to also feast. Yes, yes, you can have some too, Kaida. I need you to grow up big and strong, after all. Just remember not to eat the bones. I need them. Ashlock reassured the snake and earned a gleeful hiss. He hadn't forgotten about the ink snake's unique power to bend reality to the words written in his ink. But he needed the snake to get to the star core realm so that he could slowly produce ink chi to use his powers without setting his cultivation backward. Kaida's current soul core was like a tiny ink pot inside his body. He needed to fill the ink pot up to advance his cultivation but would drain the ink pot if he used his powers. This is why reaching Star Core would be so monumental, as the ink pot would automatically refill itself over time without Kaida even needing to cultivate. Ashlock watched in interest as Larry reopened his maw, and thousands of tiny ash spiders tumbled out and latched onto the corpses. 
Then just like worker ants, they started tearing off bits of flesh with their fangs and carrying it back to Larry. A rather suitable way to eat for a royal spider, Ashlock laughed as he returned to work. An hour passed, and the final corpse had been checked as the courtyard was bathed in the orange glow of the setting sun. Of the hundreds of corpses, only twenty had been deemed by him to potentially have dragon marrow. All of them had been devoured to the bone by Kaida and Larry. After having their fill, his two pets were relaxing off to the side with stuffed bellies. With night approaching, Ashlock wanted to quickly confirm if any of these bones contained the alchemy ingredient they were after. Stella, can you check for dragon marrow? Ashlock wrote on his trunk. The girl chilling on the bench below his canopy and playing with Maple noticed his spatial chi. She sat up and translated his words. With a sigh, Stella got up and walked over. Diana was already crouched over and touching the bones with her finger. What are you doing? Stella asked while crouching down beside her friend. I'm checking which one has the most demonic chi, Diana replied in her usual monotone voice while pointing between two sets of bones, I think this one will have dragon marrow while this one is a dud. Well, let's find out. Stella trailed off and frowned, how do we find out? I don't know. Aren't you the alchemist? Diana snorted, you just spent the last hour telling me how easy you found alchemy, and now you are stumped. Stella crossed her arms and grumbled, I didn't lie. I'm good at alchemy much better than those brats the Red Claw sent. Oh? You didn't tell me they were young, Diana snorted, and yet they knew about the Dreamweaver orchids? Impressive. There's nothing impressive about memorizing plants from some dusty old books. Stella retorted. Didn't you learn the ancient runic language from some dusty old books? Stella glared at Diana, will you shut up? Whose side are you on? We were picking sides. Diana rolled her eyes, why don't you go and get one of them to tell us how to do it? But I just dropped them off with Douglas, Stella protested, surely we can figure it out without their help. Can I try something, Ash? I think I have an idea. Ashlock would rather get the twins' advice with the sun setting and the somewhat limited number of carcasses, but it wouldn't hurt to let Stella quickly try her idea, so he flashed his leaf once. It's rather funny how motivated she gets in an attempt to avoid having to rely on others, Ashlock mused. Hopefully, she will be willing to work with others more as the sect expands and she gets used to those around her. But if she doesn't, that's fine too. Stella pulled a single bone free from two of the corpses. You said this one was a dud, right? She asked Diana and the black-haired woman nodded. All right then, let's do this. There was a snap as Stella cleanly cracked the bone in half down the middle with her star core strength. Inside was normal solid bone marrow. She then cracked the bone Diana had identified as likely containing dragon marrow, and sure enough, a more jelly-like substance oozed out. Ha! Huh. Dragon marrow. Stella cheered as she tried to stop it from falling onto the floor, told you we didn't need the twins. But why would the dragon marrow be more jelly-like than regular bone marrow? Diana tilted her head in confusion, that doesn't seem to make much sense. Stella shrugged, why would I know? Go ask the twins or read the answer in a dusty book. Ashlock listened to them bickering for a while longer before deciding to fall asleep. He would finish absorbing all the corpses overnight, and then he could spend his points in the morning. Ashlock awoke to another pleasant day. In fact, he was starting to get worried that there hadn't been rain in weeks. Actually, has it rained since the Deo storm? Ashlock wondered as he yawned in his mind. There was something about sleep that seemed to revitalize his soul and make him more motivated to tackle the day. That was, of course, after his biology had finished kicking into gear. He had never been a fast riser, even when he had been human, but now it wasn't his laziness that held him back from starting his day but rather a wrestle with his tree body every morning. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3527 Daily Credit, 5 Sacrifice Credit, 821 Sign in. Morning system, Ashlock mumbled at the familiar notification but then realized he had accumulated a surprising number of credits from the corpses. It would have been more if Kaida and Larry didn't eat a portion of them, but it would never be loads as they were all Chi Realm or Low Stage Soul Fire Realm monsters. Ashlock hummed to himself as he debated whether he should sign in. 800 points. Should be enough for an A grade draw. Ashlock could wait around and farm more points for yet another S grade draw but the tournament was starting soon, and he had killed literally everything alive for miles around his demonic tree wall. And if Dante Voidmind's plans were anything to go by, 
he was sure many sacrificial credits were on the horizon in the form of arrogant void mind family members. System, sign in for me. Sign in successful, 826 credits consumed. Unlocked an A-grade skill, Abyssal Whispers. Ashlock tried to hold back his excitement and relax as the information was shoved into his memory as if it had always been there. However, he was unable to stay calm for long. Is this telepathy? No fucking way wait, no, not quite. It is telepathy, but the system lists it as an attack skill, why? Ashlock ran through the information in a half panic one last time and complied as a sort of ability description in his mind. The skill lets me project my consciousness outwards, infiltrating the minds of those nearby with an insidious whisper. This isn't ordinary telepathy, the whispers are an invasive force that disrupts the mental and spiritual equilibrium of those with the misfortune of listening. I can use these whispers to sow confusion, fear, or paranoia through hallucinations by essentially assaulting the target's mind and spirit from within. Ashlock sighed. This was too much excitement and confusion for so early in the morning. He had been practically dying for telepathy as a skill, and although this sounded similar, it was most certainly an attack skill meant to overwhelm a target's mind so he could impale with his vines and devour them. So abyssal whispers shouldn't be used on the weak-minded as I effectively invade their mind with my entire presence, and my words cause hallucinations and instill fear. Ashlock glanced around and saw Stella stirring awake from her meditation on the bench. As her eyes fluttered open to the rising sun, he decided to write her a message in his lilac flames. If there was anyone he wanted to test this skill with first, it would be her. Stella stretched her back as she cycled the chi she had just absorbed throughout her body. It was a pleasant sensation, and she didn't notice a massive difference between cultivating on the bench or under the demonic trees lining the mountain peak. I think I will cultivate here from now on, she said aloud while leaning back and enjoying the sunrise. However, she soon felt a small burst of spatial chi behind her, so she turned to see lilac flames manifesting on Ash's black bark. Stella, I want to talk to you. She translated and then smiled, what's up tree? There was a pause, and Stella started to wonder if she had translated the meaning wrong, but the flame soon changed to clarify, I have learned a form of telepathy. Stella's eyes widened. Speak to me? Directly? Will I finally hear your voice after all these years? Yes, Stella read from the flames, however, it may frighten you or make you mad. So relax and don't worry. Is that okay? Stella grinned, I'm already mad. Hit me with it a chill throughout her body forced her to blink when she opened her eyes, the courtyard was gone, the sky was black, and all around her was a mystical fog that reminded her of the mystic realm. But most importantly, there was a familiar tree before her. It was alone in this abyssal world, its bare branches spreading to the starless sky above and fading out of view. Is this a dream? Stella called out. Her voice sounded normal and didn't seem to match the space she was in. Desperately glancing around, things weren't adding up. She could still feel the constant cool wind of Red Vine Peak, and the way it brushed against her skin didn't match how the mystical fog rotated around them. This is a mental projection of me into your mind. You are still on the bench. Stella felt her star core quiver as Ashlock's strange words echoed in her mind. She couldn't write out his words nor recite them. But she understood them on a fundamental level. Can you understand me? Am I speaking in the ancient runic language? As if it was listening to its master's whims, the mystical fog began to morph and change into a mirage of vibrant silver runes that floated around her, tempting her to read them, but if she focused on one for too long, it vanished as if scared of being seen and understood. Yes, no. Stella shook her head. She was getting disorientated. It's not the ancient runic language, but I understand your intent. I see. It must be soul speech, then. Stella had no idea what soul speech was, but she was far too distracted by the leafless tree, your form, why do you look like that? I am still on the bench, right? So you should be just behind me. It's all an illusion. The tree suddenly grew larger and more menacing as it loomed over her. Even though she knew Ash wouldn't try to harm her, she couldn't help but gulp and feel fear festering on the outskirts of her mind. So this is tree, no father's voice. She said in a small voice, a bit more haunting than I imagined in my mind. These are not my words I speak to you through the whispers of the abyss, Ashlock said, now tell me what you see. Before Stella could respond, the fog morphed again into a sea of ghostly eyes that all glared at her their pupils pulsings as if daring her to speak. I. I see a black bark tree, bare of any leaves or features. 
Stella hesitantly replied as the eyes moved in closer. And thousands of creepy eyes glaring at me. I think every time you talk, it gets worse. Gets worse. Stella shivered as the eyes began to scream and wail, the starless sky cracked and shook, and a terrible feeling washed over her, making her stomach twist. Stop talking. Stella snapped as she clutched her head. A moment passed, and the wails died down just enough for Stella to hear herself think. I need to block out the mental torment somehow, ah. An idea struck her spatial ring flashed with power, and a fruit materialized in her hand. Without delay, she bit into the fruit that should have the mind fortress effect Ashlock said would protect her from mental attacks. A calming wave washed over her, banishing the horrors surrounding her and freeing her mind from the nightmare. Tree, I can think now. She yelled, but her smile faded as the illusionary world cracked and crumbled around her. Streaks of morning sunlight cascaded through the gaps, and the next time she blinked, the world was back to normal. Glancing back, Ash was there just like always. His scarlet leaves rustled in the morning breeze. His words felt like distant whispers in her mind that she struggled to recall as the calming wave continued to flow through her mind. She leaned back on Ash's bark to enjoy the wondrous feeling of tranquility, MHM. I think the fruit was too powerful. It completely cut you out, tree. I'm sorry. A while passed, and as the numbing tranquility passed, she had a sudden realization. What if I turned that fruit into a pill to lessen the effects? That way I can listen to him without the nightmare. However, I don't know any recipes using Ashlock's fruit, but we have dragon marrow, chi flowing grass, starlight lotus and even dreamweaver orchids to work with. I'm sure I can create something with those ingredients. To hell with old dusty books. I'll just make it myself. Stella sprung up from the bench, grabbed a few of the mind fortress fruit growing from Ashlock's branches, and after consulting the spatial plane to set her anchor point many thousand meters below, she snapped her fingers, and a portal manifested. Tree, I will be right back. She hollered before stepping through the rift and feeling the sudden shift in pressure and air quality. Douglas was chatting away with the two twins, but they all turned to look at her when she arrived. She disliked their gaze but was getting used to it with time. The twins weren't so bad after spending most of yesterday with them. Have either of you ever created a new pill recipe? The twins both shook their heads as if it was obvious. That's impossible, Oliver replied respectfully, it would take a master alchemist their whole life to create a new pill recipe that hasn't been discovered before. What if I had ingredients that have never existed before? Stella grinned as she strode over to the cauldron, just sit back and watch if you don't believe me. The twins looked to Douglas who was grinning ear to ear as he watched Stella bring out an assortment of fruits onto the rim of the earthen bowl. Chapter 149, Talkative Tree Elder Margaret tapped her foot in annoyance while waiting in the empty airship station. The midday sun streaked through the windows and doorways, which could only mean one thing. The Skyrend family was late, as usual. They always do this, Elder Brent grumbled beside her, pretentious bastards that make everyone wait on them. Careful. What if their god strikes you down for the insult, Elder Margaret joked, and Elder Brent snorted, good one. A moment of silence passed between them with nothing but Elder Margaret's impatient tapping. Eventually, Elder Brent spoke up, you're heading straight to Red Vine Peak after greeting House Skyrend, right? Yeah, got to check up on the twins and ensure they haven't offended the Ash Fallen sect somehow. Elder Margaret sighed, especially Stella. That girl is hard to predict which makes it all the more troublesome that one word from her could ruin us. She holds that much power. Elder Brent cocked a brow, I haven't interacted with her all that much, so I wouldn't know. Elder Margaret nodded, not only is she the descendant of the immortal, but she can command around a spirit beast capable of killing two families single-handedly. And if that wasn't enough, she is one of the most talented alchemists I've ever seen. Scary stuff, Elder Brent whistled, I guess I did know of all those things individually but when you list it out like that, and her cultivation stage is what? Star core. Elder Margaret nodded over a bell ringing through the large lobby and a single mortal calling out, how Skyrend has arrived. Both elders sighed deeply as pressure descended on the empty airship station. Did the scion come as well? Elder Margaret wondered aloud as she began to walk deeper into the station while cycling her own chi to resist the pressure, what a show off. A while later, the airship of how Skyrend had docked and they began to walk into the large lobby, which would usually be overflowing with mortals buying tickets, saying goodbye to family members, or rushing to get on their flight. Yet for House Skyrend, it had been kept clear. 
around 20 men and women that were easily seven feet tall began to saunter into the lobby. These were the servants to the important members of the family, which was evident due to their grey robes. Two people stuck out like sore thumbs within the group of servants. Not only were they a head taller than the servants, but their robes were a silky white that glowed in the sunlight. The group walked across the desolate lobby and soon arrived before the two Red Claw elders. The servants parted and made way for their masters, the Skyren Scions. Elder Margaret. A man almost twice her height glared down at her. His eyes had no pupils and were a pure glowing white. The white cloth he wore for clothes barely concealed his ripped muscles that looked inhumanly perfect, and his golden hair was combed back and ran down his shoulders and back. This was, undoubtedly, a young man Elder Margaret had met before. Theron Skyrend? It's been years since I last saw you or your father. Elder Margaret offered a smile that Theron mirrored. Indeed, it has been far too long. We were wondering where you fire-loving lot had snuck off to, and it turned out to be so far east. Elder Margaret held back her frown. She'd wondered why Theron had visited when he was a star core cultivator and one of the Skyrand Grand Elder's eldest descendants. However, from his words, it was now clear. He was here to gather information. Well, we felt like having a change of scenery, Elder Margaret joked and then switched topics, I see you are here with your sister? Come to support her in the tournament? I can't imagine you participating. Theron's smile turned into a predatory grin like a shark. Of course, I'm here to support Cassandra. She wanted to put her alchemy skills to the test against what the rest of the Blood Lotus sect had to offer. Isn't that right? Cassandra Skyrend, whose eyes glowed a pale blue, smiled with a nod, that's right, brother. Her voice was soft and calm, matching her face that much like her brother looked chiseled out of marble. There was a reason the Skyrends called themselves Heaven's Children. Other than their inhuman looks, they were also called that due to their affinity, which was lightning. Their Grand Elder could wield Heaven's lightning and was often hired to help elders from other families survive their heavenly tribulations. Obviously, she doesn't even need my support, Theron's laughter boomed through the expansive space. He then rested a hand on his sister's shoulder, she could win with her eyes closed, after all. Brother, stop, Cassandra giggled, that's giving the others far too much credit. And there it is. Elder Margaret sighed in her mind. Their arrogance knows no bounds, to the point, even the heavens would feel humble. Well, we have quite a lot of talented people coming for this tournament Elder Brent coughed awkwardly when the two Skyrens glared at him, but I am sure Cassandra will excel beyond our expectations. Theron snorted, of course she will. Nothing this side of the continent compares to my dear sister's alchemy skills. Cassandra, if you don't mind me asking. The extremely tall woman tilted her head, what is it, Elder Margaret? When did you begin to learn alchemy? Cassandra's glowing eyes pulsed briefly, and she smiled, a month ago. But that's all the time someone like me needs to master such a primitive art form. Elder Margaret felt her blood boil as her field of expertise was insulted but kept her calm facade. It was tough to control the hot-headed nature of cultivating fire chi. Still, she was determined not to end up like the earth affinity cultivator that was obliterated by the void mind scion a few days earlier. She hadn't lived for centuries for nothing. As expected of someone from the prestigious Skyrend family, Elder Margaret Fake smiled as she summoned a parchment to her hand, before you go, let me just repeat the itinerary for the next few days. You can tell our servants such meaningless information, Theron waved her off and pulled his sister away. Half the servants moved to encircle them, and then they were gone in a flash of white lightning followed by a thunderclap. Elder Margaret's smile cracked slightly as she looked up at a stern-looking giant of pure chiseled muscle that gazed down at her with those same glowing eyes. My name is Alexandros. I will manage the young master and mistress stay here in Dark Light City. Too exhausted to comment on the disrespect two youngsters from the Skyrend family had shown an elder, she nodded and read off the parchment. In two days, we will organize an evening feast at the Immortal Gourmet Pavilion in the Noble District. All families participating in the event are invited. Then the following morning is the preliminary round, where contestants will be expected to purify an ingredient and answer a simple question. The following afternoon will host the finals where those that passed the preliminary round will battle it out. Elder Margaret then handed the parchment to the man, who took it graciously with a slight bow. Even though they were members of the Skyrend family with unparalleled arrogance, the servants still knew not to disrespect an elder of another noble family. We will be off then, Alexandros ushered the other grey-robed servants to follow, and soon they were gone in a flash of lightning. I hate it when they do that, 
Elder Brent grumbled as he picked at his ears due to the constant thunderclaps that could kill a mortal child, are you off now? Yeah, see you later. Tisk, leaving me here to greet the other families arriving today. Elder Margaret waved him off as she walked away, Azure Crest and Terra Forge should be a piece of cake. It's how Star Weaver that will be unpleasant. Yeah, whatever. Elder Brent lamented, I just hope one of those Terra Forge hard asses doesn't try to punch my face for fun. Elder Margaret chuckled a little imagining the scene as she left the airship station and began to walk through the crowded streets back toward Red Vine Peak in the distance. Stella felt like collapsing against the earthen bowl housing the cauldron fruit. Her hair was glued with sweat, and her legs felt like dragon marrow as they wobbled. In her hand was a pill. Would it work? She sure hoped so, as she didn't know how much more torment she could handle. I feel like this could be the one. Olivia said for the tenth time. Every attempt was the one in her eyes, but Stella found her optimism encouraging, so she refrained from calling it out. Opening her mouth, she chucked the pill in and almost recoiled from the awful taste. The mind fortress fruit did little to overshadow the intense flavor of the chi flowing grass. The previous versions with more dragon marrow and even the starlight lotus had been better tasting than this, but they hadn't helped. Her aim was to create a pill with some juice from the fruit to help negate the awful effects of Ash's telepathy. Without the mind fortress fruit, she had no hope of lasting more than a few moments in that nightmare illusion, but eating the whole fruit, closed her mind to everything, including his voice. If possible, she wanted to find a balance where the fruit numbed her mind just enough to ignore the wailing eyes but not enough to block out Ash. Ugh, so bitter and grassy. Stella said while half choking on it. Eventually, she managed to swallow the ball of grass and cycle the pill's effects. The chi flowing grass doused in the fruit juices was vital as the grass was known for its properties to facilitate the flow of chi through the body's spirit roots, which Stella needed the most. Dragon marrow enhanced muscle tissue, whereas starlight lotus was known for unblocking muscle tissue. Both are useful for strengthening a body but have no use for a mental defense pill, so she hadn't included them in this iteration. The only difference between this pill attempt and the last was the addition of the dream weaver orchids, which according to Olivia, was helpful with things involving illusions so it sounded like the perfect plan to throw into the recipe as Ashlock had mentioned his new skill invoked illusions. Very quickly after ingestion, Stella felt the familiar tranquility of the fruit creep into her mind, but it wasn't an overwhelming wave this time. Instead, it was like a mist clouding her consciousness. Okay, Patriarch, you can hit me with it again. Stella shouted to the ceiling and then stumbled back against the bowl as she felt Ash's presence push its way into her consciousness. If the sensation of a demonic tree trying to grow inside her mind wasn't weird enough, the strange looks the twins, and Douglas gave her every time didn't help. I still haven't figured out what's wrong with her, Oliver whispered in his sister's ear as if she couldn't hear them loud as day due to her spiritual sense. There's nothing wrong with me. Stella grumbled in her mind. Blame tree for sending creepy things at me while he's talking. Stella blinked as she noticed that same mystical fog swirl on the edge of her vision. However, the ceiling remained cold rock rather than all-encompassing darkness, and there were no wailing eyes. All good so far. You can speak now. She said mentally, as this was a telepathic connection. A moment passed until that same feeling of not quite words being imposed on her soul as pure intent hit her. Can you see me? No Stella caught her tongue as she saw black roots begin to twist and grow along the cavern walls toward her and merge into a malformed tree. Well, yes, I can sort of see you now but I think the drug is reducing your presence. That's fine, so long as my words don't hurt you. Stella felt a pinprick of pain as cuts superimposed themselves on her skin. Let's not use the word hurt and pain again, okay? Stella said as lovingly as she could through gritted teeth. If this had been the first time she had tried to talk with Ash today, she would have tolerated the pain, but with so many failed pills that had actually enhanced the illusions rather than reduced them, she was mentally exhausted. Okay, how's the pill? Stella ignored the sudden man-eating illusionary plants that spawned in the corner of her eye and replied, I think this is the best one so far. The Dreamweaver orchids were a good addition. Thank you for growing them for me. That's great news, a few more trials and you will have created a new pill. Ash's voice became a distant murmur as if he were mumbling to himself but came back in full force, this is amazing. You know I'm so proud of you? I never knew you would be this talented at alchemy. Stella couldn't help the grin that appeared on her face but then she scowled at the twins, can you two stop looking at me like I'm crazy? It's ruining this great moment. Oh, sorry. Oliver scratched the back of his neck awkwardly and looked away, 
which only made Stella feel more awkward. Stella, I have good news for you. Ash laughed, which made the mist flash with different colors. What is it? Stella wondered. Elder Margaret is outside the tunnel and is about to enter. Yes. Stella shouted in her mind, freedom. She didn't even wait for the woman to enter the cavern, your elder is back, so I will take my leave. See you two another time. Wait. Olivia blurted, at least explain your new pill to Elder Margaret. No thank you, Stella clicked her fingers, and a portal to the surface materialized, you want to come with me, Douglas? The man shook his head, no, I'm fine down here. I will try to relay your findings to Elder Margaret when she arrives. Stella shrugged and stepped through. Only once the portal snapped closed behind her could she finally relax. She practically collapsed onto the bench as the mystical fog gathered around her, showing the telepathic connection was still working. Tree. I'm here. With every word, she felt the mystical fog draw ever closer as it ate away at the mist enveloping her consciousness. Soon the awful tasting pill would wear off, but until then, she could talk to Tree. This is so convenient. Sure, your words make my star core ripple from pressure and I keep seeing things manifesting in the corner of my eye, but apart from that, this is great. Stella lay down and closed her eyes. Sadly the visions didn't stop just because she closed her eyes as they were being superimposed straight into her mind. They weren't real after all. It is indeed convenient. I can talk to you even with your eyes closed now. Ash chuckled. It's funny what you are willing to put up with just to talk to me. I spent a year hunched over books in a library trying to decipher how to read a language that was clearly designed by raving lunatics that have no concept of basic grammar rules. Not to mention so many words were missing that I have to guess based on context what you are saying half the time, Stella snorted, compared to that, this is nothing. I just wish I could have spoken to you sooner. I was always here, watching over you as the seasons passed. Actually, let me tell you about this one time when I woke up after being struck by lightning. Do you remember? You must have been only 13 at the time. Gosh, where did the time go? You used to be so small, haha. <laughs> Do you remember when I dropped fruit on your head when you got annoying? Wait, I am getting off topic. Anyway, as I was saying, when I first got struck by lightning, I fell asleep for a long time, and when I woke up, you had grown up into this ice-cold beauty. Stella's eyes snapped open, what? And you strode into the courtyard while twirling your daggers, trying to look all cool. Shut up, la la la, I'm not listening, Stella covered her ears and tried to drown out the embarrassing story. I was so sad. I thought I had slept too long and you had forgotten about me, but then the most humorous thing happened. This ice beauty devolved into a kitten and leaped across the courtyard to hug me while shouting, tree. It was adorable. Ugh. Stella collapsed on the bench as her face heated up you're going to kill me. And then there was that time you thought trying to punch lightning would be a good idea, you went against Senior Lee's words and ran up my trunk while shouting some nonsense. Stella's ring flashed with power, and the last mind fortress fruit appeared in her hand. She scarfed it down as if it were life-saving medicine and then let out a satisfied groan as the mist in her consciousness morphed into a wave and drowned Ash's words. Ah, peace at last. Who knew he would be so talkative? Chapter 150 Dark Light City Academy. That will be all for this lecture on how to overcome the limits of your affinity. Are there any questions? Elaine scanned the lecture hall for any raised hands or confused faces, but all she got back were bored looks or lecherous stares. She stood on a raised wooden platform surrounded by rows of benches curved around the circular lecture hall. This was so all students, no matter where they sat, could get a good view of her and the wall behind her that was painted in a thin sheen of low-grade spirit stones so she could draw and write things with her chi. Written on the silvery wall in glowing black lines were the fundamental truths that her uncle had taught her, and since she was relatively familiar with this topic due to her own research in an adjacent field, she decided to memorize her uncle's left-behind lecture notes and give the talk today. A small sigh escaped her lips. The students had come from far and wide across the Blood Lotus sect to attend this academy. Most were from noble families, but a few mortals that awakened their spirit roots were sprinkled here and there in their little clusters. They were easy to spot due to their lack of majestic robes and fingers weighed down by golden spatial rings. Without a noble family to provide the cultivation resources and facilities needed to advance, these cultivators raised by mortals had to spend every golden crown they could work for on those resources that the nobles got for free. Elaine would pity them if not for their and everyone else's utter lack of interest in her lecture. 
she knew she was partly to blame as she had never been the best at public speaking. However, she wasn't the sole reason for their disregard, as it was also known throughout the sect that Dark Light Academy was where the talentless, delinquents and descendants from side branches came to study. Why would anyone willingly attend Dark Light City's Academy when Slimer was a quick airship ride away? Dark Light was known for its mining and farming industries. In contrast, Slimer was known for its creative sector and top-tier academy attended by all noble families, including the Night Rose family. Comparing the two was like night and day. Seriously, no questions. Elaine glanced at the top row, wholly occupied by those from the Red Claw family. Unmistakable due to their crimson hair, dark red robes, and similar features. Even they seemed a little bored, which hurt Elaine's pride a tad. It's not my fault that uncle is gone, and you're stuck with me. I wonder how the Red Claw's attitude would change if they knew I was with the Ash Fallen sect. That's a funny thought. With nobody engaged or asking questions, Elaine checked her internal clock. Chi followed the will of the realm, so it was easy to estimate the time by checking the density of various Chi types floating around, such as light. MHM, around half an hour before midday. If I end the lecture early, I could stop by the study on the way to the dining hall to meet Douglas. Elaine touched the silvery wall behind her and pulled the chi back into her soul core. It was teacher etiquette to remove one's chi from the spirit stone wall, and there was no way Elaine would waste the precious void chi she had managed to accumulate by leaving it here. Well, since nobody has any questions, I shall end this lecture a little earlier than planned. Have a good day, everyone. Oh, and don't forget about the alchemy tournament happening in two days. Everyone from the academy is allowed free entry. Elaine's words were drowned out by the sudden chorus of students standing up and gathering their things before leaving the room. Only a few cultivators mainly from the Red Claw family gave her a short nod as they walked out. As the region's ruling family, they had been told by their elders to respect the teachers at the academy. With another sigh, Elaine gave the now empty lecture hall a quick glance to make sure nothing was left behind, and then she followed the tail end of the students down the corridor. Her mind wandered as she walked alone through the hallways. Ugh. What do I do about Douglas? He is handsome and kind, but I thought I would end up with a bookworm like me rather than someone from the Terra Forge family. Elaine frowned as she imagined her father's face if she told him she had almost slept with someone from the Terra Forge family. Raised as a scion of the Void Mind family, Elaine had been taught that the Terra Forge family were no better than the beasts that howl beyond the walls. Why should I care what my family thinks anyway? They abandoned me, so I owe them nothing. But I do have to admit Douglas is rather rough around the edges, with a very down-to-earth personality. But it was nowhere near as bad as the stigma her father had drilled into her head. Should I just commit to the relationship and stop leading him on? We already slept in the same bed, so the jump to the next step feels a little easier, but still, I want to take things slowly to make sure he is the one for me. My world has been flipped upside down since that fateful night when Diana pressed a dagger to my neck and it's taking some time for me to readjust to the absurdities of the Ash Fallen sect. Elaine rounded a corner. Her eyes followed the floor as she mulled over her thoughts, however, her brain recognized the changing floor pattern to mean she had entered the teacher's area. So she glanced up and was taken aback when she saw someone leaving her study. Even worse, it was a man with an all-too-familiar silhouette. She only caught a brief glimpse of Dante shutting the door behind him before he used Void Step to vanish. The runes engraved in the walls and doors of the corridor flashed with power as they attempted to suppress the influx of Qi, but there was very little in this world that could stop Void Step the famed movement technique of House Void Mind. He shouldn't have detected me coming because of the runes in the walls. Did I catch him leaving because I ended my lecture early? What the hell was he doing in my study? Technically it was a joint study between uncle and her. And it wouldn't be peculiar for the scion of the Void Mind family to enter a study run by his elder and sister but it still struck her as odd. Elaine approached the study's door with bated breaths. The bland wooden door looked normal, like always. It clicked open when she inserted her chi, and the insides looked as disorderly as ever. The central desk was still covered in parchments. What could he possibly want from here? Elaine tapped her chin as she walked around. Every shadow or corner she passed made her heart race. She knew deep down that Dante wouldn't directly harm her, but that didn't mean she wasn't a little terrified. What if he discovered her secret and tried to force her to tell him about it? The oath would kill her before he could. We did plan to have our next meetings here. Should I tell Douglas to move them someplace else? With the tournament so close and all the noble families arriving today, she saw little need for more meetings, 
so maybe she could just tell Douglas to call them off. The stage was already set, and they all knew chaos was on the horizon. I do want to figure out the real reason Dante is here. His nonsense about overtaking Dark Light City doesn't make sense. Why would the scion of House Void Mind, one of the most powerful and influential families, deem it necessary to overtake Dark Light City? A backwater mining city with little going for it. Elaine wasn't buying it, but she couldn't find a way to get to the truth without confronting Dante about it, and that was an interaction she wasn't eager to participate in. There were many ways to die in this ruthless world, but asking too many questions was one of the best to find a sword through one's back. Elaine sighed as she left the lecture notes on the desk and ran a hand through her silky hair. What was she to do? Why was everything so stressful now? I must be careful what I say here, there's a chance Dante left a recording artifact. Should I still go to see Douglas now and confront him about our relationship? Or should I head back to the mansion and confront my brother? She found herself pacing the messy room. All that lay before her were twisted paths without clear results something she hated. Just relax, Elaine. The Ash Fallen sect knows of Dante's invasion and should be able to handle any other nonsense he's got hidden up his sleeve. She stopped her pacing and glanced out the window. I should get a move on. Douglas is likely waiting for me. Not enjoying the soup. Douglas looked at her with those warm brown eyes. Elaine just stared and got lost in them. Her mind told her this was illogical and that she was only enthralled with him due to the circumstances surrounding their meeting. Yet after a few days apart and spending them alone meditating in the void chamber or reading research notes, she felt the same warmth she had the first time they met. Perhaps I'm really in love. Is there something on my face? Douglas started licking his lips as if trying to remove non-existent food from his stubble. No, I was just enjoying the view, Elaine smiled glanced away, and decided to hide her shamefulness by dipping bread in her soup. Douglas snorted, bold today, are we? Perhaps, Elaine tapped his shin under the table with her foot, but wait till after the big day. Telling Douglas to wait until after the tournament to avoid blowing their cover had been her tactic to delay things so she could get a better feeling for the relationship. She was now more sure than ever that this was a relationship she wanted to pursue after spending time apart. The problem was she had zero experience in dating as she had been moved out of the family before she could be used as a marriage pawn. This lack of experience had been fine when she felt her life was at risk if she didn't latch onto Douglas. But now it was different. She could approach it with a calm mind, and that just made it all the more stressful. Stop teasing me then, Douglas grumbled. Elaine continued smiling, lost in her own little world. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3529 Daily Credit, 2 Sacrifice Credit, 0 Sign-In Ashlock awoke to his system notifying him that yet another day had passed. Honestly, the last two days had been rather dull. Isn't the meal at the Immortal Gourmet Pavilion happening tonight? Ashlock slurred to himself as his mind kicked into gear. Other than watching the various noble families arriving, he had spent his days overseeing Stella in the cavern, trying to improve the Mind Fortress pill. On the topic of noble families, he had expected all of them to turn up with big shot science after the Void Mind and Skyrend family, but that was not the case. Azure Crest, Star Weaver, and Terra Forge all showed up with people from side branches or low ranking science if the grumbles of Elder Brent were anything to go by. However, this information didn't put Ashlock at ease. Instead, it made him even more worried. Dante Void Mind's reason for being here was discovered by his sister, so why was Theron Skyrend here with his sister? No way he plans to invade too? I still don't understand why Dante needs an alchemist tournament to justify his invasion. Ashlock felt a headache coming on so early in the morning. He needed more information, but the mansions controlled by the various families throughout the noble district were heavily guarded, just like the Void Mind mansion had been. While mulling over his options, a portal appeared. Stella and Diana strode through and glanced around. Okay, after a few days, I think I have perfected the ratios as best I can, Stella said while holding up a purple and green pill with spots of yellow. You can speak to Tree with this. I can. Diana's eyes widened a little, you're not trying to poison me, are you? I. Stella blinked, I'm not even sure how to feel insulted by that. Are you suggesting I would backstab you or that I am so incompetent at alchemy that I would accidentally kill my friend? Diana snorted, it was a joke, Stella, just give me the darn pill. Oh, sure. Stella frowned and placed the odd-looking pill in Diana's palm, I don't see how that was funny. SHHH, now tell me what to do. 
Diana held the pill and inspected it, just eat it. Wait a moment. This pill is the strongest one yet, so Tree may need to start the connection first. Once you see the white fog appear, then eat it. Honestly, that was unnecessary. Abyssal Whispers was an A-grade mental attack skill, it could force its way past even the Mind Fortress fruit if he put his full power into it, but he hadn't, as hurting Stella had never been the intention. When he saw her struggling, he'd pulled back his presence and tried to avoid sending any mental attacks her way. Diana stood there glancing around as if trying to find the white fog Stella was talking about, so he activated the skill and targeted her. He only used a fraction of its full force as she was a realm weaker than Stella. Within a second, he had smashed through her mental defenses and weaseled into her consciousness. It was a surreal experience, even for him. The sensation of his voice actually being able to leave through his trunk and travel down the mental link through the skill was magical to him in a bizarre way. I see the white smoke. Diana shouted and then ate the pill. Immediately Ashlock felt a force try to push him out, like a hot blast of air. He could resist it by dialing up the power of the skill, but he did so in a way that focused on telepathy rather than all the hallucinations. Can you hear me? Ashlock asked, and Diana practically jumped out of her skin. Yes, I can. Wow, this is so weird. Diana's monotone voice came straight into his mind and didn't sound slightly distorted like usual. Why are there floating ears with wings near the patriarch? Diana asked Stella. The blonde girl laughed, they are all illusions. Just ignore them. I see, and it was worse than this before the pill. All the color drained from Stella's face as she shuddered, yes, yes, it was. Sorry, patriarch, I am just a bit distracted. Diana said through the mental connection, I didn't expect your voice to sound like this. Does my voice sound weird? It's hard to describe, but it's like a chorus of a thousand tortured souls all shouting at once past my ears and straight at my soul. Diana laughed, meanwhile, I thought you would sound like an old grandpa, no offense. None taken, Ashlock replied. It was unfortunate to learn his voice was so hard to listen to, but with a skill named Abyssal Whispers, it made sense that he wouldn't have the voice of an angel. I can feel a pressure on my soul that's making it hard to stand here, Diana admitted, as if your words are direct attacks wearing away the barrier on my consciousness from the pill Stella gave me. She then looked back at Stella, how did you survive this without the pill? Stella shrugged, no idea. I'm unsure if my brain is still in one piece. How many pills did you make? Stella counted on her fingers, maybe thirty? It's been a long two days. Actually, on that note. I used up quite a lot of dragon marrow practicing the body strengthening pill alongside the twins. Elder Margaret says there's still enough for the tournament, but I was going to ask how we plan to acquire it in the future. This was actually a topic Ashlock had some ideas for but hadn't had a chance to bring it up. Diana, you see that pile of bones over there? She turned around and saw the pile, yes, Patriarch, I see them? Aren't these the bones left over from the hunt a few days ago? Yes they are the ones Stella didn't snap in half because they didn't have enough chi to be dragon marrow. I had a thought. Would either you or Kaida be able to artificially create dragon marrow with demonic chi? Diana was nursing her head after his words, but she slowly nodded, it's possible, but I wouldn't advise it. Why not? Well, if you order me to, I can force my demonic chi into a single bone, and it may transform the insides into dragon marrow. But then I would have wasted weeks of cultivation and thrown off my body's harmony between demonic chi and water chi. Diana paused to massage her temples and close her eyes, Kaida is much the same. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. Interesting. So it was, in fact, possible, or at least Diana thought it was. But it was such an inefficient method that it was basically off the table. Sorry, Patriarch, do you mind retracting from my mind? Diana half begged. My soul is trembling. Ashlock said nothing to avoid inflicting further pain and turned off the skill. Diana stumbled forward and collapsed on the bench while breathing heavily. Stella. I have, no idea, how you managed to survive, making this pill. I have no idea. Just rest easy and recover. Stella sat beside her, I need you well rested by this evening. Why? Diana slurred as she massaged her forehead with her eyes closed. I didn't get a chance to tell you yet, but the Red Claw Grand Elder requested we attend the feast tonight at the Immortal Gourmet Pavilion. Diana's eyes shot open, what? I thought only I was going. Why would you come as well? 
The Grand Elder told me through Elder Margaret earlier today that with Dante Voidmind and Theron Skyren there, he needs another star core cultivator beside him to avoid being looked down upon. So he asked if I could attend the event. And you agreed to that? Ow ow. Diana clutched her head and fell backward again. Well, not initially, but after some thought, I decided it would be a perfect opportunity to practice socializing with other cultivators. Also, I can wear my mask and just stand in the corner if it's too much. That has to be the worst idea I have ever heard. Diana groaned, and Ashlock had to agree. There was no way Stella could navigate such a political gathering and not cause problems. I'm not that bad at socializing. Stella pouted, come on, trust me. I have been speaking with the twins all day without a problem. And remember all the times I talked to the Red Claws. There was a long pause before Diana replied, fine, but we got a lot of work to do to get you ready. Chapter 151, Immortal Gourmet Pavilion Stella sat on the bench with her back straight. Her gaze was dead set ahead on the demonic tree offspring in the courtyard center in a vain attempt to ignore the perpetual mystical fog hanging at the edges of her consciousness due to her open telepathic connection with tree. Her new pill may provide a decent amount of mental protection, but half-formed horrors still lurked beyond the fog begging for a single look so they may inflict nightmares. Diana was behind her leaning against Ash while she wrestled with her hair to try and get it into a ponytail. Apparently, her wild hairstyle wasn't noble enough for tonight's feast, and Diana seemed determined to style it for her. I still don't think this is a very good idea, Diana muttered in her ear, and despite the mind fortress pill soothing her mental state, Stella still had a knot in her stomach. She agreed with Diana that attending such an event was questionable as she had grown up alone since childhood and had never participated in noble parties nor been taught the correct etiquette. Still, the Grand Elder had requested her presence not only for his own protection but also to bolster the presence of the Red Claw family. It would be an embarrassment if the Red Claws were to turn up with a single star core cultivator when a family like the Silver Spires used them as bodyguards. And she felt this was a rare opportunity to jump into the deep end and face her fears. Whether I like it or not, the Ash Fallen sect will continue to expand. If I can't even stand in the corner at an event, how can I be helpful to Tree? I have spoken numerous times with the Red Claw family in the past, and more recently, I held conversations with the twins without too much issue, so I should be able to pose as a wallflower and hide in the corner. That was her grand plan. Turn up, locate the quietest corner, and silently convey her presence so the other families wouldn't think to look down on the Red Claws and the tournament. Stella, are you sure you will be all right? Ashlock asked. His voice somehow calmed her soul despite its power and chaotic form. Will you be watching over me? Stella replied, I have plenty of pills to maintain our telepathic connect all night. Won't the horrors of my technique throw you off? Stella shook her head, earning an annoyed huff from Diana as she moved her hair. No, your presence brings me a strange peace rather than fear. Well, I am always watching over you. I just sometimes get distracted, or fall asleep, Ashlock chuckled, but if you want my focus, I will always give it. Not like I would miss my daughter's first social event for anything. Then I have nothing to worry about with your support, Stella sighed with relief, but the knot in her stomach remained. However, she didn't want her indecisiveness to be known as she wanted to reassure Diana that she would handle herself properly tonight at the Immortal Gourmet Pavilion. Yes, you do have things to worry about, Diana lightly yanked her head back and placed a hair clip to keep it all in place, even with your hair done, you still need to change out of those comfortable trousers you are wearing into a dress. I don't really like dresses, though. Stella pouted, they feel so formal, and I can't run around in them as easily. Tough luck, you're wearing one. Diana paused, wait, do you have a suitable dress? No. Diana groaned, drummed the bench's backrest in annoyance for a moment, and then seemed to have an idea, Patriarch, can you portal me over to the White Stone Palace? There was a noticeable movement of spatial chi through the ground and up through the chi gathering formation, and a moment later, an almost perfect portal formed. Diana dashed through, and the portal closed behind her. With nothing else to do, Stella sat there and watched the evening sun while thinking up scenarios for tonight in her head. What should she do if one of the scions approaches her and tries to strike up a conversation? Should she develop a new identity, or would she forget it during a crucial moment and blow her cover? Be honest with me, Stella. Are you doing this for yourself or in an effort to please those around you? Both. Stella replied without hesitation, I understand I had an odd start in life, and I don't want to be that weird girl that feels uncomfortable around people forever. 
A breeze rustled Ashlock's leaves overhead, and Stella could hear distant birds chirping as the mountain peak was bathed in the orange glow of the setting sun. Stella could feel the winds of change in the air and knew tonight would be a memorable one, that's for sure. It makes me sad you feel that way. Are you suggesting my parenting wasn't good enough, Ashlock grumbled, kids these days have no appreciation of how hard it is to raise an unruly child when I had no mouth or arms. Stella touched the red maple leaf earrings she had worn since childhood and laughed, Tree, don't be sad. You did the best you could. It's not like it was your responsibility in the first place. If not for the patriarch pressuring my father, he would have still been around to raise me. Her eyes narrowed, it seemed like an impossible dream, but with every passing day, I feel closer to the day I may be able to create a pill from the patriarch's cold corpse. He will die. The surrounding mystical fog flashed crimson, and the power behind Ashlock's voice made Stella's star core tremble, he cannot escape me. My roots will spread across the land and then throughout the nine realms. Not even heaven would save him from me. I trust you, Tree, Stella leaned back and rested her head against his bark, you wouldn't lie to me. There was a sudden surge in spatial chi, and a rift manifested. Diana stepped through with a grin and said flatly, Miss me. No. Well, now I am even more glad with my dress choice, knowing you can't hate me any more than you already do. Diana walked over her ring flashed with power, and a very sleek black dress appeared in her arms. There's no way I would wear something like that, Stella said, glaring at the dress. Diana shrugged, then you can't come. But the Red Claw Grand Elder said he needed me to save face. Stella protested, but Diana wasn't budging. There are two star cores from other families there, Diana said, and we have the Red Claw Grand Elder and Sebastian attending from our side, so that's two on two. Why does he need me then? I didn't know the Silver Spires were going when I agreed to attend. Because cowering in the Silver Spires' shadow is a bad look, and Theron Skyrend would also need two star cores to hold him down if something were to go wrong. Stella gulped, fine, I will wear the dress, wait, why are you going to the party then? Diana handed over the dress, it's noble etiquette to host a gathering before an event as it gives a rare chance for the families to mingle. I'm going there alongside the Silver Spires to talk to the merchants about a potential trade deal. Oh, I see, Stella's ring flashed, and a small bottle of pills manifested, you should take these then. They will help in the negotiations. Thank you. Diana took the pills and then frowned when she saw Stella's apprehensive look at the dress, these pills change nothing. You still have to wear that. How did you even get this? Stella asked while standing up and holding the dress before her to get a better look. I asked Amber for it, Diana replied, you two have a similar body type. Stella pouted, we do not. Yes, you do. Now put on the darn dress, the sun is setting, and we still have things to do. Fine. Stella sighed her ring flashed with golden light, and her current clothes vanished the dress in her hands briefly entered the ring and then materialized on her body. Why is it so tight? Stupid parties and their impractical dresses. Maybe I should just stay home and tell the Grand Elder good luck. You look great, Diana said with her usual utter lack of enthusiasm, which made Stella somewhat doubtful that she was telling the truth. Stella shivered as the cool breeze tickled her bare back. Can I wear a jacket or something? This feels far too exposing. No, that would ruin the look, Diana said resolutely, absolutely not. She then summoned a black mask that was different from the others. It was made of a soft cloth material that would only cover her mouth and not her eyes. I know you want to hide your face, but a wooden mask is too obnoxious to go unnoticed, so you will have to do with this instead. Is it really fine that I wear a disguise? Won't people look at me weirdly? Diana shrugged, they will anyway. To them, you are an unknown. You don't have the features of a red claw or a silver spire, yet you will be introduced as working for both. Your looks are eye-catching and your high cultivation realm at such a young age is very impressive. So they are going to stare at me. Stella looked at the mask in her hands, the knot in her stomach only worsening. Yeah, which is why I suggest you don't go. Stella took in her words and stared at the floor, her mind racing with thoughts. I understand her concerns, but nobody ever achieved anything by being comfortable. I have always learned the most by putting myself in new and frightening situations, and I feel I have gotten too comfortable under Tree's canopy lately. Stella put on the mask the soft material obscuring her lips reignited her confidence, but the dress was still far too much. Most of her back was exposed, and so were her arms and shoulders. It was simply too much skin for her. 
Diana stood there, tapping her chin while looking at her. Your disguise is good, but I feel we could go a step further somehow. Why? Will people recognize me? Gods, no, very few know of your existence. But what if you make a fool of yourself? It would be best to obscure your true self as much as possible as insurance. Stella's mood soured. She really didn't appreciate Diana treating her like some mischievous child that would spoil the party. What is it, Kaida? Diana looked down to her side to see the snake hissing happily about something. She reached down to pat the snake on the head, but Kaida dodged and then pointed at Diana's hand with his tail glistening with ink. Diana crouched and held out her hand, why do you want my hand? Kaida placed his tail's tip against Diana's palm and drew a small X which made her pull back her hand with a slight hiss of pain. Diana tried to wipe the ink off, but it stayed under her skin, a tattoo. Her eyes widened, can you take the ink back? With a swish of his tail against her palm, Kaida reclaimed most of the ink she, but he did leave around a third behind, which seemed infused in Diana's skin. She inspected the faint X still on her palm a quick burst of demonic chi and the ink she evaporated away, leaving no mark behind. Fascinating, Diana stood up and grinned, Kaida, would you be able to give Stella some tattoos? especially one on her back. Kaida let off a low hiss as he slithered closer to Stella and joined her on the bench. The two locked eyes for a while, neither saying anything. What does he want me to do? Stella wondered. Haha, why didn't I think of this? Kaida becoming a tattoo artist makes so much sense. Ashlock's voice boomed in Stella's mind, anyway, Stella, Kaida is asking what type of tattoo you want. A demonic tree. Stella said without pause as she looked straight ahead at Ashlock's offspring. No. That's too risky. Ashlock shot down her dreams and felt herself deflate on the bench, why not? The whole point of all this is to give you an identity you can throw away if needed. Branding yourself with a tattoo you might want to keep in the future is a waste. Pick something similar if you want, how about my black thorned vines? Stella didn't feel like arguing with people anymore. The social event hadn't even begun yet and she already wanted to retreat into the cavern and do alchemy alone. Fine, I will settle for that, Stella straightened and turned her back to Kaida, just cover my back and arms in the mouth. Stella felt a pinprick of pain wherever Kaida moved his tail. It likely would have been much worse, but the mind fortress pill helped protect her mind from the pain. Is it usually this painful? Stella questioned while trying to look over her shoulder at the half-drawn design. Considering Kaida has to forcefully inject his ink chi into your skin, I'm surprised your body isn't reacting more violently. An hour later, dusk had arrived, signaling the start of the gathering. Aren't we going to be late? Stella worried as she stood on the mountain peak while inspecting her new tattoos. She liked how the black vines covered in menacing thorns curled up her arms and bloomed on her back. It gave her a weird sense of confidence, and she looked forward to when she could get a demonic tree one. No, the host always arrives last to these kinds of events, Diana chuckled as she looked to the sky but we should probably get going. Patriarch, can you portal us over to the Red Claws? A moment later, a portal manifested, and Stella went to walk through but stumbled, stupid heels, who invented these abominations. Language Stella, they were discovered in the rifts, and just like the dress, they were designed to make our lives as difficult as possible. Stella scrutinized Diana, who was wearing a similar black dress and high heels to her and had copied the black vine tattoos. A black cloth mask also obscured her features, leaving her eyes partially hidden behind her short hair. Less staring and more walking, Diana strode through the portal, and with some difficulty, Stella soon followed. With a pop, they arrived in the courtyard of the White Stone Palace. Already waiting was the Red Claw Grand Elder alongside Elder Margaret and Brent. Standing off to the side were Sebastian and Riker. Big sister. Riker perked up and dashed over, you look so pretty. Stella was baffled and tried to stumble back from the kid, is he really coming with us? The Grand Elder chuckled, who are we to tell a scion of House Silverspire what to do and where to go? If anything, bringing him with us will give us more face. Riker balled his fists, the adults are scared of my might. Ahem, anyway. The Grand Elder drew everyone's attention, tonight is a big night for us all. To our surprise, two Star Corps scions have decided to attend our little tournament, and some merchants from Slimer are also present. Our goal is simple, show that we, the Red Claw family shadowed by the Ash Fallen sect, rule over Dark Light City with an iron fist and that it cannot be seized from us. We already know that nefarious plots are afoot, with more lurking in the darkness. 
so keep your wits about you and don't show a hint of weakness. Everyone nodded, and Stella felt anticipation rise within her. It felt like she was going to war rather than a feast between supposedly friendly families of the same sect. The Grand Elder stepped toward the gate, his silky crimson robes fluttering in the breeze. When we arrive, the silver spires alongside Diana, and I will confront the merchants present at the venue. The rest of you may get a head start on socializing with the other families. Stella whispered in her mind, Tree, can you portal us over? I can't walk very well in heels. You want a grand entrance? Ashlock laughed, then I can give you one. The air in the courtyard trembled as spatial chi gathered and formed a truly enormous portal so clear it was like starting through a lilac-tinted window to the other side. So that's the immortal gourmet pavilion, Stella muttered as she scrutinized the majestic establishment through the portal. While she was busy staring, the others had already begun to walk through, and before she knew it, she was one of the last ones. You can do this, Stella. Just walk through, find a corner, and stay quiet. You are nothing but a pretty wallflower, here to observe and threaten with your presence. Stepping through, she was greeted by a wide, serpentine path lined with ancient, flowering green-leafed trees. Inferior plants was all Stella could think as she clumsily followed the others down a trail illuminated by lanterns adorned with intricate carvings of mythical beasts that cast a warm, inviting glow over the polished jade pavement. Up ahead was the entrance, a colossal gate of vermilion and gold, upon which the name of the pavilion is elegantly etched in glowing calligraphy. Immortal Gourmet Pavilion Stella gulped as she carefully walked up the jade steps through the colossal gate and into the entrance area. A man wearing a suit off the side puffed up his chest and shouted, now entering, the tournament's host House Red Claw alongside the tournament's main sponsor, House Silver Spire. Stella felt numb as a wave of applause shook the building. She stood alongside the others on a raised balcony overlooking everyone. Two grand staircases led to the restaurant below, and a terrible realization hit her as her eyes darted around the dimly lit space. There were no corners to hide in. There were tables everywhere, even in the corners, and at least one person was sitting at each one. Before she knew it, the others descended and went off to the side to meet with a group of masked individuals that were likely the merchants. Shall we go and greet the guests? Elder Margaret offered her a reassuring smile and took her hand. Everything felt like a blur as Stella was led through the tables, receiving various glances. Eventually, they came upon a mostly empty table, apart from two giant people that loomed over the table and looked like they had been chiseled from marble. Those two are from the Skyrend family. Ashlock's voice rumbled in her mind. Be careful of them, especially Theron Skyrend. He is a stage higher than the Grand Elder in the Star Core realm. Stella felt her mind blank as Theron looked her up and down with his glowing eyes, and a smile appeared on his lips, I don't think we have ever met before, young miss. Which family are you from? Chapter 152, The Sin of Pride Which family was she from? Stella stood there, unsure how to respond. Her true identity would be easy to discover if she admitted to being a crestfallen. Ashfallen was out of the question as it wasn't a known family or sect yet, and she didn't have the facial features of someone from the Red Claw or Silver Spire family. So what should she even say? Sensing her hesitation, Elder Margaret stepped slightly forward, she is currently with us. The Red Claw family. Theron Skyrand narrowed his glowing eyes and grinned, Come take a seat, miss. His massive hand was gesturing to the empty seat before her and in the dim lighting of the restaurant, she feared it would either eat her or our chains would spring out and strap her down. A part of her wanted to turn around and walk away, but even she knew that would be incredibly discourteous after being offered a seat at someone's table. Why did I think this was a good idea? Was all Stella could think as she pulled the seat back and carefully sat in its confines. A large ornate wooden table may separate her from Theron, but his giant body made the table feel smaller than it was. Elder Margaret pulled out the chair beside her offering some reassurance. Elder Brent had gone off to another table nearby with members from a family unknown to her, but from their cosmic-looking hair, she could guess they were the Star Weaver family. Theron took charge of the conversation and decided to do a round of introductions, my name is Theron, and this is my dear sister Cassandra Skyrend. I already know of Elder Margaret. I believe we last met a decade ago at the Silver Spire Economic Summit. That is correct, Elder Margaret nodded, you were a teenager back then. Theron's laughter boomed across the table, that's right. I wonder if there will be another event hosted by the Silver Spires. His voice dropped slightly as he glanced across the room at Sebastian's back as he talked with the merchants, you know, because of the whole Silver Core inheritance thing. It's possible. 
I just hope they don't announce another drastic increase in the cost of their spatial rings, Elder Margaret sighed, they were already expensive enough. Stella listened in silence, eager not to draw any attention to herself. However, she had to keep her eyes on one of the people's faces to avoid seeing the horrors lurking in the mystical fog at the edge of her consciousness. Finding Theron hard to look at, she ended up glancing at Cassandra. She returned the glance, but it didn't come off as friendly. Almost as if she was looking down at her, which she was due to her height, but it still made her feel looked down upon. Unlike Theron, Cassandra's eyes glowed a light blue. Eventually, the exchange of pleasantries between Theron and Elder Margaret dried up, and Theron turned to Stella and asked the dreaded question, and your name was? Rosalind, Stella answered calmly. This was a name she had thought up after getting the tattoos. No family name. Theron was really hung up on finding out which family she was from, which irked Stella. Why was he so darn persistent? Stella remained silent, so Elder Margaret chimed in, she is just here to observe rather than engage in discussion. A lesser should learn to keep quiet. Theron snapped at Elder Margaret, I was asking Mistress Roslyn here, not you. Elder Margaret's eye twitched. She opened her mouth and then closed it. Her eyes darted briefly to the Grand Elder, who was engaged in an intense discussion with the merchants. Tree, I don't like this guy, Stella whispered in her mind, should I fight back for Elder Margaret? Hold on, let the conversation develop a little more. Theron crossed his arms and leaned back with a grin, I thought it was rather bold for a lower tier family to dare host an event like this, so after hearing it was sponsored by the Silver Spires, I came to see what's up. He gestured with his chin to Riker standing quietly next to Sebastian, but it seems that a mere child was behind the sponsoring due to the inheritance event. Cassandra snorted, and to think I bothered spending a month to learn alchemy for this. What could a lower tier family teamed up with a child offer us for our time and attendance? Do you think our time away from cultivating to show you face is cheap? We provided very reasonable rewards considering the low barrier to entry for this tournament. Elder Margaret snapped back, it's you who decided to attend. We were just being courteous and sent you an invite. Theron laughed, would you dare not send one? Yes, we would, Elder Margaret said without pause, we actually hoped you wouldn't even attend. Theron frowned, since when did the Red Claws lose sight of their place in this sect? Just because you have the Silver Spire kid backing you doesn't mean you can show such disrespect to me. I fear neither the Skyrand family, nor you. Elder Margaret snapped back. So confident, Elder Margaret. Is it because your Grand Elder is almost on P.A.R. with me? Or perhaps the Silver Spire's bodyguard is giving you confidence? Theron sneered, I am sitting here right now in front of you, and I could spit in your face, and there's nothing you, the Red Claws, or even the Silver Spires can do about it. I dare you to show such disrespect. Elder Magret's eyes widened as Theron spit a lightning-infused ball of saliva straight at her face. Stella's eye twitched as she created a portal that redirected the spitball at Theron's face. It all happened in an instant, and Stella didn't even have time to think about what she had done. Theron reached up with a trembling hand and slowly wiped off the spit from his cheek. His eyes pulsed white as he seemingly held back his rage. Cassandra seemed to be holding back a chuckle as she shifted away slightly from her enraged brother. Nice shot, Ashlock commented, which made Stella smile behind the mask. Theron let out a long breath and then leaned forward. Both elbows were on the table, and his hands crossed beneath his chin. Tell me why a spatial star core realm lady with no family name is willing to defend the honor of a lesser and, in turn, make an enemy of the Skyrand family? How much are they paying you? It was clear from his overly calm speech that he was holding back a flood of rage. I don't even know who you are, Stella replied calmly. Cassandra burst out laughing, which made Theron frown. What's so funny dear sister? Or do you find humor in shaming our family name? I have never, seen someone dig their own grave like that. Cassandra said between wiping away her tears of laughter, it would make sense if she had just arrived from a distant demonic sect to not have heard of us, but outsiders should be killed on the spot. And if she is from this sect, she is courting death. I've lived here my whole life, Stella retorted, yet I have never heard of your family. What's so great about it? You can shoot some lightning? A bunch of random clouds in the sky can achieve the same thing. Cassandra fell silent, staring at her with bewilderment. Theron also seemed baffled, and Elder Margaret could only offer her a weary smile. I think you shattered their fragile egos, Stella, weren't you coming here to make friends? I'm here to empower the Red Claws in our sect. 
they have done nothing but insult Elder Margaret at her own event while throwing around the weight of their stupid family that nobody cares about, Stella replied, I feel cowering before them right now would only lead to more issues down the road. Hmm, maybe, but he looks pretty angry now. What's your plan? Stella's mind froze at Ashlock's words, plan? I thought you were going to protect me. I said I would watch over you, not help you. This is supposed to be a learning experience for you. I can't hold your hand all the time. Can't you fill his mind with your telepathic technique and tell him to leave? Stella began to panic a little. She had only dared to act so pridefully as she thought Tree was backing her up. Dot. No, I can't do that. My technique can only be cast near my trunk. Why can I still hear you then? Stella asked. It acts like a curse. Once cast on someone, I can maintain the link so long as they are within the range of my roots. Will you really not help me? Stella pouted behind her mask. Of course I will if you really need it, but I would rather not. I need to save my special technique for the finals when the Void Mind family invades. Stella wasn't sure what Tree's secret technique entailed, but if she would inconvenience him and condemn the sect to the Void Mind invasion due to her actions, she needed to fix this situation somehow. Good. Very good. Theron drummed the table with his fist as he laughed, this has to be the most interesting meeting I have ever attended. Stella tilted her head, why? I like you, come work for me, Theron grinned, I could always use a spatial affinity cultivator to help transport my servants up the mountain and carry my things. No thanks, I will remain here. Stella politely declined while holding back her rage from the insult, but that seemed to be the wrong answer judging from Theron's pulsing eyes. I advise you take my offer, Theron leaned in, I don't know why a pretty little thing like you is out here in this backwater city working alongside lessers when you could come and work for me. I said no thank you. Do you not have ears? And don't call me a pretty thing. You're vile. You intolerable women. Theron shouted as he stood up and slammed the desk. His star core pulsed, and white lightning crackled across his skin. Working for one such as me would be an honor. Everyone in the room turned their heads and Stella could even see the Red Claw Grand Elder begin to run over in the corner of her eye, but it was too late. Stella felt an immense pressure descend on her, and before she could even blink, a tremendous bolt of lightning shot out from Theron's hand at her illuminating the entire room in a bright white. Her star core flared up and coated her body in purple flames. The lightning slammed into her, almost throwing her off the chair and onto the floor. Her body became flooded with lightning chi that she managed to just about get under control due to her Deo comprehension. It was clear that the attack hadn't been intended to be lethal, but it had still come from a cultivator many stages above her, so it was obvious he intended to humble her. As Stella blinked away the bright light, she inserted some chi into her spatial ring and summoned a lightning chi barrier fruit into her mouth. Quickly chewing it behind her mask, she escaped the chair and stepped away from the table. She could only walk under Theron's pressure because the Red Claw Grand Elder was combating it with his own gravity. So much arrogance, all for that. Stella crossed her arms and raised her brow, I expected a bit more firepower. Stella could feel every pair of eyes in the entire restaurant on her. It made her skin crawl, and also extremely anxious. Clearly, she had messed up somewhere to end up in this position. You were supposed to remain low-key, Stella. Like a wallflower. Why did you have to run your mouth like that? Stella, do you need my help? No, I caused this mess, Tree. Let me handle it, Stella replied mentally. What seems to be the problem? The Red Claw Grand Elder said as he strode over. Theron Skyren's face was twisted in anger, his eyes glowed, and his chiseled, almost stone-like muscles bulged, your hired rogue cultivator dared to disrespect me, Grand Elder. I don't know how you found her, but I demand she is presented on my doorstep after the tournament, or you will face the wrath of the Skyren family. The Grand Elder looked between the two before clearing his throat with an awkward cough, Theron. I am far more scared of her than your father. Total silence shrouded the room as everyone absorbed those words. Interesting, such bold words Grand Elder, Theron sneered, do you dare tell me this woman's family name or origin so I may also know to fear her? Why are you so obsessed with me? Stella tilted her head. Theron snorted, I would never be obsessed with a talentless country bumpkin like you. You called me pretty and tried to make me your servant just a moment ago. Stella took a fearless step forward, yet now I am a talentless country bumpkin. What makes you better than me? Just look at me. Yes, I'm looking. 
I see nothing but unearned arrogance. Stella scoffed, all you do is throw your family name around and call others lesser to feel important. I have no need to bend the knee to a man-child such as you. Theron threw his head back and laughed manically for a while. Eventually, he looked back at Stella with pure wrath, you dare compare yourself to me? I'm a descendant of a god. To disrespect me is to defy the heavens. He raised his hand, and the ceiling exploded as lightning tore through it and collected into a bolt he held like a javelin. Through the shower of splinters, as the building almost collapsed upon them, Theron hurled the lightning bolt alongside roaring thunder. Under everyone's shocked gazes, Stella surged the power of the fruit to her palm and effortlessly slapped the lightning bolt away. I defy the heavens at every turn, Stella shouted as she kicked the table that separated them into splinters, I care not for your weak god. Heretic. Theron's massive fist plummeted toward Stella, but she activated her earrings. Her eyes became abysses as she sidestepped the fist with lightning-enhanced speed. Meanwhile, Cassandra hurled lightning bolts from the side, but Stella easily shrugged them off with the power of the fruit and her comprehension of the lightning dale. She had punched heaven's lightning. How could Cassandra compare? Theron was disorientated and shrieked as if terrified of what he saw in her eyes. The eight-feet-tall giant stumbled to the side and ended up crashing into a table with a very calm man and an all-too-familiar woman sitting at it. Stella glanced at the man whose eyes were as black as his hair. His figure was lean and almost ghoulish. Dante void mind, Theron said through clenched teeth, this bitch crawled out from hell and dares to protect the lessers and offend me. Will you not show some face and help? Dante sighed and stood up from his chair, Grand Elder Redclaw. Squabbles between families can be overlooked, but I hope for your sake that you agree this hired woman of yours has taken it a step too far. His voice sent chills down Stella's spine. Lightning she had no issues against with the help of her Deo comprehension and Ashlock's fruit but a void affinity cultivator was a whole different beast. Dante could likely delete her from existence if he so wished, so she reluctantly stepped away from Cassandra and spared her from a similar beating. The Grand Elder ignored Dante and asked Stella, how do you wish to handle this? Stella glanced between the two Skyren siblings. Every ounce of her being wished to tell them to leave and not even bother with the tournament, but she didn't know if Ash wanted to go to war with the Skyrens over her personal grudge. Tree, what should I do? Whatever you want, Stella. I trust you. Since when did we fear a bit of lightning? Stella smiled behind her mask, I will formally apologize to them if they can prove they are better than me at anything. I don't want your worthless apology, Theron snapped, I want you chained on my doorstep. Stella shrugged, fine. Who picks the challenge? Dante asked. They can. I will beat them at anything, Stella said nonchalantly and loved the scowls she received from them. It was clear getting a taste of arrogance was unnerving for them, and she had confidence that she could prevail over any challenge with trees cheat fruit and truffles. Were you planning on attending the alchemy tournament? Cassandra asked, and Stella shook her head, no, I was not. An unsettling grin appeared on the woman's face, and the two siblings nodded to one another. Then you will enter the alchemy tournament and compete against Cassandra. Theron grinned, seemingly convinced of his victory. That is our challenge to you. I accept, Stella said as she turned to leave the building because the stress was beginning to overwhelm her, and she didn't wish to stay any longer, I will see you all tomorrow. A portal manifested with a snap of her fingers, and she was gone. Leaving behind a shocked group of spectators and two very angry Skyran siblings. Chapter 153, Rise of the Tyrant Ashlock watched as Stella entered the alleyway behind the half-destroyed restaurant through her conjured portal. She looked understandably distraught so he quickly opened a rift for her that led straight to Red Vine Peak. Thanks, Tree. She said in a low voice through their telepathic link as she walked through. The moment the portal snapped closed behind her, she reached down with a grunt, hastily tore off her high heels, and hurled them through the air. Before they could hit the stone, her spatial ring flashed with power, and they vanished. Then with a frustrated huff, she marched across the stone while barefoot. Her ring flashed again, and the dress briefly vanished, only to be replaced with her usual comfortable wear. She then sat on the bench, lay down, and closed her eyes angrily. A few moments passed, and her eyes snapped open, ugh. I just had to mess it up, tree. I just couldn't keep my darn mouth shut. Sitting up, she tore the hair clip off and gripped her head in her hands while shouting in her mind, stupid Skyrens and their arrogance. Why are most cultivators such assholes? Ugh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. 
I ruined everything. What did you ruin? Ashlock asked through the telepathic link. I was gone for what? Ten minutes? We spent all day dressing me up and getting me ready to speak with the other nobles, and here I am crying to you only ten minutes later. Stella smacked her forehead multiple times, I... just... can't... do... anything. Right. Stella, calm down. Relax, it's okay. She took a long breath and sat back on the bench, her conflicted gaze settling on his leaves that rustled in the early night breeze. Is it really okay? I didn't ruin everything. Silly girl, you did great out there. Ashlock. Chuckled as he saw hope reappear in her eyes. Do you not remember the entire purpose of this tournament and the feast? Stella furrowed her brows, and a sudden realization seemed to bloom, the point was to establish the Red Claws as the rulers of this land and to find an alchemist. Oh and something about making a deal with the merchants. Exactly, and what did you achieve tonight? You saw how Theron treated Elder Margaret. He thought so low of her and Red Claw's family that he would spit in her face. But now, after your fight, I think everyone in that room sees the Red Claws in a different light. I see. Stella nodded to herself, so what you are saying is I did a good job. Well, no. Not exactly. You went with the intention of learning how to converse with the other cultivators. Stella's face fell. And yet, within minutes, you were fighting them, and then you arrogantly offered them a chance to choose a challenge and even agreed to become his slave if you lost. I did. You don't even remember. Stella frowned, I just really wanted to get away from there, so I just agreed to whatever they said so I could leave quickly. Did I even have the option to negotiate the terms? I mean, I fought someone from a supposed higher tier family within the Blood Lotus sect. The fact he didn't tell Dante to kill me there and then surprised me. You might not have felt like it, but I believe you had the upper hand in negotiations. You had utterly crushed their pride, so you could have been more demanding. Well, it's fine, Stella waved him off, I didn't want anything from those bastards anyway, and they picked something I should win at easily. But imagine if they hadn't. You got lucky that you picked up alchemy a few days ago and seemed to have an immense talent for it, but even then, you have only made a few pills. You keep getting away with it, but one day your arrogance will catch up to you and become the downfall for us all. Stella was mute as she mulled over his words. From the seriousness in her expression, it was evident that she knew she had fucked up. What if she had sat at Dante Voidmind's table and infuriated him? There was no way Stella could shrug off a Void Affinity Cultivator a few stages above her as she did with the Skyrens due to her Deo comprehension. You're right, Tree. I hear you. I really do. I just find being all diplomatic like Diana and the others so hard. Ugh, I should go practice alchemy for tomorrow. Stella stood up. Her shoulders sagged as she clicked her fingers, summoning a portal, and a moment later, she was gone down into the cavern below. With the darkness of night enveloping him, Ashlock felt weary. He didn't like to fight with Stella or scold her like that, but with his newfound telepathy, it was about time he set things straight with her. As she was trying to focus on her alchemy, he withdrew his abyssal whispers skill. He couldn't talk with her while asleep, and he didn't want to keep haunting her all night. Before I sleep, let me check back on the restaurant. Ashlock's vision blurred, and he soon returned to the restaurant. He had naturally infiltrated their wine cellar below the building with a root a few days ago and was poking its tip up through a gap in the floorboards so he could see what was happening within. If Stella had faced a problem he didn't feel she could deal with, he was prepared to go all out to protect her through this route. Thankfully he could keep his presence from the families hidden for a while longer due to Stella navigating the hectic situation surprisingly well. She may be bad at casual conversation, but she was great when it came to throwing hands and hurling insults. I think it's about time Stella realized that being a noble that bends the knee to others for benefits and relationships isn't her forte. Which is fine, she can be a tyrant that lays down the law when needed instead. She would serve that role so much better. Ashlock hoped tonight would lead to that realization for her. It was obvious a few hours ago that she was actually convinced she could keep her words and hands to herself when confronting someone who would naturally look down on both her and this backwater city she had called home her entire life. But alas, the reality had been far different. Anyway, that aside, before I go to sleep, let's see what's happening over here. Ashlock used his spiritual sight to glance around the restaurant. To his pleasant surprise, Members from the Star Weaver, Terra Forge, and Azure Crest families were crowded around the Red Claw Grand Elder and the other elders. They were, of course, 
mostly asking about the mysterious Rosalind, but there were other questions and pleasantries thrown around for a while. However, that wasn't of interest to Ashlock. What did draw his gaze was Dante Voidmind and Theron Skyren sitting at a table far away from the hustle and bustle around the Red Claw Grand Elder. Unfortunately, ripples of void chi surrounded them, so although their lips were moving slightly, suggesting an occurring conversation, no sound escaped the confines of their table. Ashlock wasn't too worried, as Elaine was sitting right there next to Dante, so anything said within that void bubble that could harm him should be relayed to him or the Red Claw somehow before it became a problem. So tired. I should sleep. Tomorrow is going to be a hectic one. Ashlock mused as he began to retract his gaze. The feast was rather dull with Stella gone, especially with the chi bubbles everywhere preventing him from eavesdropping on any exciting conversations. However, on his way out, he noticed Diana bidding farewell to the merchants. Thank you for your interest Knox. Diana's words drifted into his mind after the bubble surrounding them collapsed. We will speak again soon. The woman called Knox replied and then walked off. Diana watched the mysterious merchant leave and then turned to Sebastian and Riker, I'm going to head back and check on, you know who. Are you two staying here? Sebastian nodded, I want Riker to have a chance to interact with some of the families here. This is one of his first ever social events, and I want it to be at least somewhat normal for him after her antics. All right, Diana bid them farewell, and a moment later, she left the restaurant that had moonlight pouring in through the hole in the roof. She began to walk down the serpentine path that snaked its way down a tree-lined lantern-lit path, but Ashlock saved her the trouble and sent a portal her way. Ashlock waited a moment to see if any red claws would also leave, but they seemed content to stay for the rest of the night by their grinning faces. Stella may have caused a scene, but it had greatly elevated the red claws to this odd status they seemed to enjoy. The fact that Theron was so convinced he could spit in Elder Margaret's face and not face any repercussions whatsoever shows the vast difference in status between these noble families. Ashlock mused, no wonder the Night Rose family has never even shown a hint of interest in the deaths of the Winterwrath or Evergreen families. They must be like bugs to them. Ashlock was curious about what standing the Skyrend family had. It was clear they were on a similar level to the Voidmind family, but he wasn't sure why. The Silver Spires were easy to understand. They produced one of the sex's most lucrative exports, the Spatial Rings. Meanwhile, the Voidmind family had one of the most powerful affinities and ran Slimer City, a center for education and creativity. But what could the Skyrend family provide the Blood Lotus sect? Ashlock couldn't figure it out. Whatever, Ashlock sighed as his vision blurred back to Red Vine Peak, let's see how Diana is. Diana was glancing around frantically, Stella? Where are you? Since Ashlock didn't want to overwhelm her mind with his telepathy and she wasn't good enough to translate his ancient runic words, he made a portal and sent her down to the cavern where Stella was standing over the earthen bowl with a deep frown on her face. Diana. Stella said as she saw the frantic black-haired girl appear next to her. Why are you back so soon? I should be asking you the same thing. Diana strode over and poked Stella in the chest, I. Told. You. It. Was. A bad. Idea. Stella slapped her hand away, yes, yes. I admit I might have overestimated myself. I'm really sorry. Diana sighed, it's fine despite your antics, you made that the most entertaining social gathering I have ever attended, so I don't know whether I should laugh or cry. At. Eh. Stella tilted her head, what do you mean? Stella, you basically told Theron what everyone was thinking straight to his face and got away with it. Diana giggled. Almost every family hates the Skyrend family, but since they wield lightning and can be crucial for facing heavenly tribulations, everyone puts up with their nonsense. But Tree faced a heavenly tribulation, and he got through it fine. Stella shrugged, I don't see what's the big deal. It's just some lightning. Are you forgetting that time you tried to punch heavenly lightning and almost died if not for Senior Lee's healing pill? I have a selective memory. Diana rolled her eyes, of course you do. The heavenly lightning is a trial sent by the heavens to test those who are worthy. You may look down on it after encountering it so many times to the point you can slap it away so effortlessly like you did earlier, but that is not true for most people. Stella shrugged, I could do the same thing as those Skyrend bastards. There should be no need to hire those arrogant assholes. I will do it for free if it takes business away from them. That's actually a good idea. Ashlock mused. 
How valuable would his lightning chi barrier fruit be if Theron could throw his weight around like that just because his old man could fend off a few lightning bolts? Diana laughed, that would be great. You should do that. There was a brief silence between the two. I was so worried, Stella. Diana said seriously, you might not have noticed, but Dante Voidmind almost intervened earlier, but Elaine whispered something in his ear that made him sit back and watch. There's a reason I say that was the most fun social gathering I have ever attended because usually, it's a quiet exchange of small talk and pleasantries. Nobody would dare fight at them. That's suicide. I know, Stella sighed, Tree already told me. I messed up. I won't go to gatherings like those again. Or at least not until I am strong enough to defy anyone who runs their mouth like that. Diana chuckled, never change, Stella. You are just what this dull world of arrogant young masters needs. She then wandered off, I will leave you to your practice. I know you have a tournament to win tomorrow. Thank you. Stella said quietly as she watched Diana's departing back and then returned her focus to the ingredients laid out before her. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3530 Daily Credit, 3 Sacrifice Credit, 0 Sign-In Ashlock awoke bright and early the next day. He quickly glanced around and didn't see any angry Skyrand family trying to smite the place down, so all in all not a terrible start to the morning. Diana was cultivating under the mist-shrouded trees, and Stella was still slaving away in the cavern. Ashlock was about to go check on some other things when he felt the presence of a group outside the tunnel. Oh, thank God it's just a red claw, Ashlock breathed a sigh of relief as he instructed Bob to move to the side and allow Elder Margaret to enter. She walked down the tunnel purposefully and soon crossed the desolate cavern to Stella. The twins had left some time yesterday back to the Whitestone Palace, and Douglas was busy working on his staircase in the hole, so it was just Stella slaving away over the earthen bowl. Morning, Elder Margaret, Stella said while wiping sweat from her brow. On the earthen bowl's rim was a neat line of Tier 2 body strengthening pills that Elder Margaret eyed with appreciation. You caused quite the commotion last night. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Elder Margaret gave a short bow, to stand up for one as lowly as I was more than I ever anticipated. What are you saying? Stella seemed bewildered, you are part of the Ash Fallen sect. When they insult you, they insult all of us, especially the immortal. I will not stand for it. Elder Margaret's lip quivered slightly, and the image of the stern woman shattered, to be treated as a lesser at every social gathering. To be looked down upon as if I was some useless old hag and treated as such by the more favored families by the patriarch. I don't know how, but I became numb to it accepted my fate as upon others used to disrespect to feel superior. We all did. Ashlock saw Elder Magret's fists clench at her sides. He could understand her feelings. This world was a dark and cruel place where powerful people treated those below them as nothing. But I feel we have been reborn under you and the immortal. Last night was the first time I felt listened to and valued in so long. I know it's silly, as they only wanted to talk to us about you, but I was so happy. A single tear ran down Elder Magret's cheek, I tried so hard for so many years to revive our family name that has been stamped and spat on. But we were crushed at every turn, just like this tournament, how the families banded together to keep us down by restricting the sale of ingredients. Stella stood there, stunned, clearly not knowing what to say. I... Sorry, ignore my ramblings, Elder Margaret wiped away the tear and regained her composure, I don't know what overcame me. The purpose of my visit was to tell you that the tournament's preliminary round starts in a few moments, and everyone eagerly anticipates your attendance. Stella let out a long sigh as she stepped down from the step and offered Elder Margaret a sincere smile, I think it's time those bastards learned who the true tyrant of this tournament is. Chapter 154, A Simple Test As much as Stella wished to leave immediately, she was unprepared for the day ahead. I wasn't planning on attending, so I'm not caught up on what the preliminary round entails. Stella said while cleaning her face off with a towel she had summoned from her spatial ring, can you tell me before we go? Elder Margaret had thankfully returned to her usual self after taking a moment to regain her composure. Sure, but first, let me give you this, Elder Margaret brought out a black robe with a fire insignia that all robes worn by the Red Claw family had on the chest area, you will be participating on behalf of us. By wearing this, the guards at the entrance will recognize that you are a member of the noble houses, so you should be waved in without having to queue up or pay the entrance fee. There's an entrance fee. Stella raised a brow as she took the robe and secured it around herself. 
A small smile appeared on her lips when she realized the robe hid her comfortable clothes, so she wouldn't need to wear that revealing dress anymore. Elder Margaret sighed, We didn't plan for one initially, but far too many people were showing interest, so we had to add another barrier to entry. Any rogue cultivator out there actually able to create tier 1 pills should have no issue paying the golden crown entrance fee, whereas those frauds or people trying to cause trouble won't be willing to sacrifice a golden crown to do so. I see. That makes sense, Stella nodded thoughtfully, but why would people not planning to participate or who aren't even alchemists want to attend? Elder Margaret gave a weary smile, the immortal may be able to grow alchemy ingredients with a wave of his hand. But the rest of us have to either risk our lives out in the wilderness to harvest the ingredients ourselves or choose between saving up for beast cores to advance our cultivation or buying a tier 1 ingredient that will likely be ruined during practice. So they are really willing to travel all the way here just to have a chance at trying to remove impurities from a plant. Stella couldn't believe it. Was it really that hard for someone to become an alchemist? Elder Margaret chuckled, they would do far more for less. Everyone is convinced they are one opportunity away from their big break. I bet some imagine that today is the day they discover they have some hidden bloodline that allows them to effortlessly perform alchemy. Bloodline. Stella latched onto that word, what do you know about them? Ever since Diana's transformation, trying to discover her own bloodline had weighed heavily on her mind. Why hadn't she grown wings yet? What had Diana done to unlock her bloodline? Not much, they are mostly a legend popular among the common people as it gives them a ray of hope. Elder Margaret waved it off as if it were a nonsense fairy tale. Her dismissive attitude toward bloodlines annoyed Stella. Why did nobody know anything about these bloodlines when she saw Diana change her race right before her eyes? It wasn't some nonsense myth or legend. It was real. Grumbling in her mind, Stella decided to put the issue of bloodlines aside and focus back on the tournament ahead of her, so it's the preliminary round today and then the final round tomorrow. Elder Margaret nodded. So. How is the round today structured? I was about to get to that, Elder Margaret replied, it's a rather simple test. As the purpose of today is to reduce the number of participants by at least 90%, we don't have the time or resources to do anything that in depth. Stella nodded in understanding, so the Elder continued, you will be asked a simple random alchemy question. After that, you will be requested to remove the impurities from a tier 1 ingredient to show a basic level of alchemy capability. Most won't pass this part. Wait, a question? I don't know much about alchemy. Stella began to panic slightly, and Elder Margaret seemed to notice, what's wrong? You should handle removing the impurities with ease. The question is what I'm worried about, how simple is it? Oh, don't worry about the question, Elder Margaret chuckled, even if you don't know the answer, so long as you remove the impurities from the ingredient, they will let you through. Stella frowned, the Skyrend and the other noble families will be watching me closely. If I failed to answer a simple question, it would reflect badly on me and the Red Claw family. That's true, Elder Margaret rubbed her chin in thought, this is where the fact we hired teachers from the academy to be the judges will cause issues. If they had been family members, I could naturally set up a question ahead of time and give you the answer. Are you able to stay here today? Stella asked, and Elder Margaret nodded. I'm not needed at the tournament today. Why, you ask? Stella summoned one of her carefully made mind fortress pills. Each one took half an hour of intense focus to create, so she was somewhat reluctant to hand it over, but if it let her pass the test with flying colors, then it was worth it. Take this pill. It will help protect your mind. Elder Margaret seemed confused as she reached out and accepted the pill. What is this? A pill I created. Stella shrugged off Elder Margaret's stare, I used one of the Immortals effect giving fruits, you know the Mind Fortress one that you likely used in the Mystic Realm. Right, and you made a pill from it. Elder Margaret eyed the pill like a treasure, why would you give me something so precious? As I said, it will protect your mind. I will take the test, and if I get stuck on the question, I will relay it back to the Immortal and have him ask you for the answer. What am I protecting my mind from? Elder Margaret tilted her head in confusion. The Immortal's voice comes with rather unpleasant hallucinations. You will thank me later, trust me. Stella offered her a reassuring smile, anything else I should know before I go. Elder Margaret shook her head, nothing comes to mind. All I can offer you is good luck. Thanks, Stella then pointed to the side, portal, please. There was an immense ripple of spatial chi throughout the cavern as the world twisted and bent to tree's will, creating a doorway through space that led to an alleyway near the Colosseum. 
See you later, Stella waved to Elder Margaret as she stepped through. The stale floor rich air of the cavern was replaced with the stench of dark light city. Stella's nose scrunched up behind the cloth mask as she strode out of the trash-filled alleyway. How are there so many people? Stella murmured as she saw a shifting wall of people between her and the Colosseum up ahead. The usually sparsely populated Grand Square used as a casual meeting place for students was now packed with cultivators and mortals. Dark Light City was already a densely crowded megacity, but Stella had never seen it like this. With her interest piqued, she tried to slip past the hordes of people to get a look at the trinkets, food and clothes the mortals were selling from wooden carts but trying to peek over people's shoulders made her skin crawl and the screams and shouts of the people around her were disorienting. Ah, this is too annoying, Stella's ring flashed, and one of her old swords appeared. She didn't want to bring out the one taken from the Void Mind Elder in case Dante somehow recognized it. She then pulsed her star core, and everyone around her stumbled back to give her space as she threw the sword to the ground and used her chi to make it levitate there. Hopping on, everyone cheered as she pulsed her star core again and rose up into the air. Stella could have used a portal to skip the crowd, but using techniques was frowned upon in the city, and she also wanted to get a better view of her surroundings from the sky. She saw from above a sea of brown and black robes shifting between the maze of stalls. The sound of deals being made and the people's joy lifted Stella's spirits somewhat. Looking toward the Colosseum, she noticed a single massive entrance. Instead of a door, there was a line of cultivators collecting entrance fees and generally controlling the flow of people. What baffled Stella was just how long the packed line was. It ran through the maze of carts in the Grand Square and all the way down one of the nearby streets. Yeah, right. As if all of you could perform alchemy. Stella snorted, now I can see why Elder Margaret introduced an entry fee. Stella laughed as she felt the wind flow through her hair, there must be thousands of you. I don't even think all of the flowers in the cavern would be enough to give all of you a single ingredient to show off your skills. Stella hadn't had great respect for alchemists in the past simply because she was ignorant of how hard it was to become one. If not for Tree's Truffle improving her spirit root and the various fruit that helped boost her concentration, she never would have been able to make even a tier 1 pill. Wait, if we ever open the Ash Fallen sect to new cultivators, will the turnout for entry look like this? Stella felt all the blood drain from her face, and she decided to look away. The thought of so many cockroaches crawling their way up Red Vine Peak in an attempt to join their sect made her shudder. To distract her mind while she slowly flew toward the Colosseum that dominated half her view, Stella surveyed the skyline of Dark Light City and then saw something rapidly approaching her. She squinted at the flying dot, and as it got closer, she groaned in annoyance. Oh God, not these assholes again. Within moments a small ornate wooden boat carrying two giant people with marble-like skin began flying beside her. The bare-chested Theron Skyrend was busy controlling the flying ship. Meanwhile, Cassandra was free to put one foot on the boat's rail and sneer at her, Rosalind. I'm surprised you showed up after the insanity you pulled last night. If I were you, I would have run away. Of course, you would have. Stella retorted, because you are a coward that hides behind your family name with no redeeming qualities. Why would I have any reason to run from someone as pathetic as you? Cassandra's face twisted in anger which brought Stella great joy. However, she had no desire to hear another word out of the annoying woman's mouth nor engage in a conversation so she shoved more chi into her sword to speed up and began descending toward the entrance. Vile bitch! Was all Stella heard behind her as she looked for a suitable place to land. The cultivators in the line below seemed to notice her presence as they all gazed up and began pointing. Remembering Elder Magret's words, Stella put her hands behind her back, soared past the line of cultivators collecting entrance fees, and touched down in the much quieter area inside the entrance. Now where do I go? Stella wondered as she hopped off her sword and stowed it away. She scanned her surroundings for a clue, which was more challenging than she thought, as there were no signs. Mistress. Stella spun around and faced a short woman with the familiar beautiful crimson hair of a red claw. The woman also wore the same cloak as her with the fire insignia, confirming she was likely part of the red claw family. Yes. Stella replied, confused why the woman just stood there studying her face. You look familiar yet different. The woman narrowed her eyes but then, noticing Stella's annoyed glare, she became flustered, Oh, sorry, I'm staring too much. What is your name? Roslyn. No family name. The woman asked with some concern. Clearly, a random star core cultivator flying in was a big worry. Stella rolled her eyes and pointed at the fire insignia on her robe. 
the woman relaxed slightly and then looked at the parchment in her hand. She read until the bottom of the second page before her eyes lit up, Ah, here you are, Miss Roslyn. You were added to the list last night, so I wasn't briefed about you. My apologies. Please follow me to the testing area. Stella was about to follow when a shadow loomed over them, followed by a small explosion. Stella sighed as Cassandra dropped from the flying boat and appeared beside her. Roslyn, you should go back and pay the entry fee. Cassandra gestured with her chin to the line of tournament workers, only those with a family name have this privilege. Stella looked up to meet the towering woman's glowing blue eyes, really? Why am I on the list to be shown in without paying, then? Cassandra snorted and walked past, ha. Huh. Who cares about a list? I go where I please. To Stella's slight annoyance, the woman wasn't lying. Unlike her, who had been questioned by this Red Claw family member, Cassandra could just walk straight through with nobody daring to even look at her for more than a mere glance. Right this way, Mistress Roslyn, we will conduct your test in a quieter area along with the other nobles. The short woman said, pulling Stella out of her mood. With a wordless nod from her, the woman turned and led her deeper inside the Colosseum. To Stella's surprise, they spent some time walking along a corridor with glassless windows showing the stands and fighting area. The rogue cultivators will take their test out there, the woman gestured to the sandy pit that had been converted into a testing ground with tables and examiners, whereas you will conduct yours just through here. The woman gestured to an ajar side door with a Red Claw family member standing guard. The man gave Stella an odd look as she walked past and into the room. Stella gulped as she felt many pairs of eyes belonging to all the nobles turn to stare at her. She couldn't even look at the floor to escape their gazes as nightmares lurked in the mental mist from Ashlock's telepathy. The room she found herself in was rather lavish, with a high vaulted ceiling and decorated walls. If she had to guess, this was the relaxation room for nobles when they came to the Colosseum for any reason, as the place was well furnished with various lounge chairs surrounding small tables. However, at the far end was a large ornate table that looked rather out of place with three grey-robed middle-aged people standing behind it. Those must be the academy people Elder Margaret was talking about. Stella concluded as she took a mentally hesitant but physically confident step into the room she had the persona of the prideful Rosalind to portray, after all. Although the room was large, the furniture was mostly occupied, and Stella didn't wish to stand awkwardly in the corner, so she began to seek a place to sit while she felt the intense gazes of the other nobles burn into her back. Eventually, she settled for a red sofa with a golden trim that was only half occupied by a small boy in the middle. Oddly he had snow-white hair with streaks of crimson-like blood. Stella found it interesting as she had never seen mixed hair like that before. Other than the boy, there was a large man that looked weirdly similar to Douglas perched on the end of the sofa. He gave her a disapproving look as he stood up, walked away as if repulsed by her presence, and stood near Cassandra Skyrend. Makes sense. Stella mused as she saw everyone's reactions. I am some unknown cultivator, whereas Cassandra is from the well-established Skyrend family. They have likely all known each other since they were young or from previous social gatherings. How annoying. Stella really hated the awkwardness of the dead silent room with everyone staring at her as if she was some caged animal. She didn't even know where to look but was thankfully saved by one of the academy people drawing everyone's attention. With everyone here, we can now begin the assessments. Cassandra Skyrend, please come and verify your knowledge and capabilities. With a wide grin, Cassandra strode over to the table. First, a simple question, the middle-aged man with grey hair said, name a tier one pill. That's it. Stella's eyes widened a little. That almost felt a little too simple, even some random mortal on the street should know at least a single tier one pill. A minor wound cleansing pill, Cassandra answered, and the man nodded. Very good. Now please purify this small bundle of chi flowing grass. The man passed over a small bowl with a ball of grass in it. You have ten minutes and will be marked based on the volume of impurities you remove. Stella's eyes narrowed. The chi flowing grass looked almost dead from decay. It was likely overflowing with impurities. Wasn't this test a little too simple? Were alchemists really this inadequate? The room became filled with thunderclaps and flashing lights as Cassandra blasted the ball of chi flowing grass with blue lightning arcing from her fingertips. Thankfully for everyone's ears, she was finished in a minute. The chi flowing grass had a healthier shade of green, but Stella doubted it was usable as an ingredient. The bowl was caked in a thin layer of burnt impurities that smelled awful. Honestly, Stella wasn't sure Cassandra would pass. Fantastic job, Cassandra Skyrend. You passed. 
the grey-haired man declared with a smile and gestured for a man Stella knew all too much about to approach the table. Dante void mind, you will be next. His gaze searched the room and landed on Stella. A slight smirk appeared on his lips, and Miss Roslyn will be the last. Stella felt weirdly targeted as all three examiners seemed to look at her with hostility. Chapter 155, The Preliminary Round Stella felt very uncomfortable in the test room. Not only were the other nobles showing open hostility, but so were the examiners. Why did they look at me like that? Aren't the judges supposed to be from the academy to avoid being biased? Or is corruption unavoidable even in a situation like this? Stella scanned the room and pouted behind her mask. Maybe they are trying to appeal to one of the nobles here? Actually, now that I look a little closer. Stella realized that even with the lack of space on the lounge chairs, the way the various people were seated or positioned gave hints to a power dynamic or perhaps different factions within the group of nobles. It made sense that they weren't all equally friendly toward one another. Dante void mind, first I will ask a simple question. The middle-aged man with grey hair drew Stella's wandering gaze. As Cassandra Skyrand rightly pointed out, the minor wound cleansing pill is a tier 1 pill. What type of wound is this simple tier 1 pill unable to deal with? Stella narrowed her eyes as Dante thought up the answer. Isn't this question far more challenging than the one Cassandra had to answer? I mean, this seems to teeter on medical knowledge rather than alchemy. That's simple, Dante said after a second of thought, the minor wound cleansing pill can heal wounds inflicted with mortal weapons. However, it cannot deal with wounds infused with foreign chi. Very good. The examiner seemed slightly irritated that Dante knew the answer. With a nod to the person beside him, Dante was handed a small bowl with a tiny bundle of chi flowing grass that looked healthy compared to the one Cassandra purified. Dante took the bundle of grass and placed it in his palm. Stella had to strain her neck to see what was happening, as it was difficult to track void chi through spiritual sight. Funnily enough, she didn't feel out of place as everyone else in the room was also trying to get a good look by peeking over each other. I will begin. Dante said calmly as a flash of void chi expanded out like a bubble, encompassing his entire hand. Not even a second later, the bubble retracted and was gone. Done, he said as he handed the bowl and bundle of chi flowing grass to the examiner. The grey-haired man took the bowl and briefly inspected it, where are the impurities? Gone none should remain after the void's cleansing, Dante replied, which earned him a raised brow from the examiner. Stella was also skeptical. The chi flowing grass from where she sat looked mostly the same, and she knew how hard it was to remove impurities. It was a mentally taxing process that took at least a bit of time, but Dante had done it so effortlessly in a second. If that were really possible, Stella was starting to feel a little doubtful that this tournament would be as easy to win as she had first thought. Well, this is a problem, the examiner stroked his stubble, the rules we set up clearly state that we measure based on the volume of impurities removed as not all the examiners can detect impurities within the ingredients. If there are none, then you technically failed. So you will fail me. Dante replied with an eerie calmness as if challenging the examiner. The man seemed to glance over Dante's shoulder at someone in the room. Whoever it was had somehow given him good news as the man's face lit up a little, no, there is no problem. We will make an exception and pass you. Tisk, Dante turned and walked straight for the door his sunken eyes never looking at anyone as he left. There was an unspeakable tense atmosphere from everyone in the room as if their lives hung in the balance of this one man's mood. Stella understood their feeling well. Void Chi had that uncanny ability to simply break the rules. She thought Void Chi couldn't get any more ridiculous, but the fact it could delete impurities so effortlessly caused her great concern. And if Elaine wasn't lied to, he plans to invade and somehow take over the city tomorrow? Luckily it seems none of the other noble families here are that friendly with Dante, so he should be fighting alone with his own family, but they also seem somewhat terrified of him, so maybe they would help out his conquest purely out of fear of being next. The door quietly closing behind Dante broke Stella from her worried thoughts. Dante was a problem for tomorrow. For now, Stella planned to pass her first ever exam and not embarrass herself and ruin her Rosalind persona. With Dante gone, the ominous pressure subsided as the examiner sighed in relief and called on the next person, Roderick Terraforge. The large man that looked creepily similar to Douglas walked up to the table. Stella was very curious to see how someone with earth affinity could even perform alchemy. This is your question, the examiner said as Roderick loomed over him, is there a limit to the number of pills a person can take in one day? Depends on the pill, Roderick answered. Stella swore she heard Douglas for a second as they sounded so similar 
most can be taken as many times as the cultivator wishes, but it will have diminishing returns. Good enough answer, the examiner noted down something on his parchment and then handed over the bowl with chi flowing grass, just like the others before you, please remove as many impurities as possible within the next ten minutes. Can I use some mud? Roderick asked, and after some contemplation, the examiner nodded, fine, but I will need to check it over. So he can't use the earth chi stored within himself to conduct alchemy. Already off to a bad start, but I didn't expect the Terra Frosch family to be any good at alchemy in the first place. Stella felt like she should start making a mental list of those that would be her greatest opponents. So far, Dante was way at the top, with Cassandra annoyingly in second place. Although her question had been simple, she had removed a good amount of impurities in a quick time frame with her lightning. The process was just a bit messy. While Stella had been thinking, the examiner had finished verifying there was nothing odd about the clump of mud Roderick had presented him with. Okay, with that out of the way, you have ten minutes, the examiner declared, please begin. Roderick wasted no time pushing the chi flowing grass into the mud that greedily absorbed the bundle. He then closed his eyes and placed his fingertips into the mud. It began to ripple, and after a minute, Stella started seeing black specks floating to the mud's surface. How strange! is he manipulating mud through those ever-changing pathways to push out the impurities. That sounds very slow and messy. As expected, a full ten minutes went by, and the examiner had to snap the large man out of his meditation by tapping his arm, test is over. Roderick frowned, already. Yes, the examiner nodded impatiently, now dispel all the impurities from the mud into the bowl so I may check your results. Roderick grumbled as he withdrew the mud leaving behind the chi flowing grass in a worse state and a small pile of impurities. You damaged the ingredient but produced the required pile of impurities. The examiner tapped the parchment in his hand with his ornate pen, I would count this as a pass but of the lowest grade. Roderick seemed pleased with the result as he strode across the room and returned to his seat near Cassandra. From how Cassandra smiled at him, Stella concluded they had a positive relationship. Not quite to the point of best friends, more like friendly acquaintances, but what do I know? Do I even have an acquaintance? I guess Douglas would be one, but I never really smile at him. Should I smile more? As Stella began to feel even more alone than she already was while isolated from the others in the room, the examiner called up the next person. Celeste Starweaver, please step forward. Stella watched as a beautiful woman walked by. Her midnight black hair with streaks of blue and gold seemed to have a gravity of its own as it went all the way to her feet like a cape, which wasn't that far as she was relatively short around Diana's height. The examiner scratched the top of his head, so, for a question, what is the difference between affinities when it comes to alchemy? I don't understand, Celeste said calmly, like the tranquil moon. That is too broad of a question. Ahem, let me rephrase it a bit then, the examiner smiled, why would one affinity be superior to another when it comes to alchemy? Compatibility. Celeste didn't seem very confident, every affinity has its strengths and weaknesses, air, the more powerful the affinity, usually the harder it is to cultivate or source chi for. To answer your question, air, some affinities have more finesse, making them better suited. The three examiners talked among themselves as Celeste stood there awkwardly. Eventually, they shook their heads, although your answer is somewhat correct, the grey-haired man said, it was too long-winded and went off-topic, so I will have to fail you. Stella blinked as she heard their verdict. A noble actually failed? Is that even possible? Celeste sighed as she turned to leave, but the man stopped her, wait, although you failed the question if you can remove the impurities, then you can still pass. Way eh, really? Celeste spun around. The man nodded and handed her the bowl with the grass just like everyone else, you have ten minutes. Celeste's hair rippled with power as silver specks began to collect around her hands. Even from afar, Stella could feel such immense power despite the girl being in the soul fire realm. The bundle of grass floated up from the bowl, suspended between her two hands, surrounded with cosmic specks. So this is the power of cosmic affinity? Sure does seem powerful. Stella narrowed her eyes, eager not to miss a thing. However, nothing was happening. Celeste's eyes remained closed, and Stella could feel an immense amount of chi being used, but she couldn't see anything physically happening. Phew, Celeste said as her eyes fluttered open and her hair relaxed. The silver specks orbiting her hands seemingly vanished, and the bundle of chi flowing grass dropped to the bowl below. Done. The examiner frowned, no impurities? Just like Dante. 
Celeste shrugged, I used cosmic radiation to obliterate the impurities. There should only be a few left. I see, the examiner inspected the grass and sighed, there are indeed few impurities left, so I guess you can pass this round. Woohoo! Celeste threw her hands up in glee and then wandered off. None of the other nobles offered an ounce of excitement for her accomplishment, so Stella guessed the Star Weaver family was either weak or had bad ties with the noble families present. Much like Dante Void Mind, Celeste Star Weaver paid little attention to the others and waltzed out of the room, closing the door behind her. She was quite the character, Ashlock said as quietly as possible in her mind to avoid causing her mental fatigue. And one to be feared. She used far too much chi on a test, but if used offensively, that cosmic radiation could be as dangerous as void chi. Stella shuddered. How had this seemingly simple test been such a humbling experience? Had she been getting overconfident? How did such monsters in human skin like this exist? Maybe she got flustered, but she must have used a week's worth of chi on that one purification, Ashlock continued, definitely powerful, but much like Dante Void Mind, the amount of chi they have to use to purify an ingredient that fast and thoroughly is not sustainable. I see, that makes sense, Stella mentally sighed, but since it's a two-day tournament, they have a massive advantage then. Don't worry about them. Your primary focus is Cassandra Skyrend. Stella pouted behind her mask. Although that was technically true, now that she was this deep in, she wanted to win it all. Kane Azure Crest, please come take the test. Stella looked to the side and saw the person sitting beside her get up. Kane brushed his long white hair with streaks of crimson to the side, giving Stella a look at his face. He had decent features, but an unmistakable aura of exhaustion overshadowed him. Only now did she realize Kane wasn't a child but a teenager as he walked over to the table. Everyone still in the room seemed disinterested in Kane, but Stella was curious how an air affinity cultivator planned to remove impurities. Okay, simple question. What is the highest tier of pill? Kane looked up at the examiner and answered in a tired tone, the heavenly tier is the highest. And what tier number is that? Two questions. Kane asked, and the examiner smiled, you know why I'm asking two questions. Don't play dumb with me. Kane gulped as if caught in the act and swiftly answered, it's the eighth tier. Good. Now here's the chi flowing grass. Why did he have to answer twice? Stella wondered as Kane placed the grass in his palm and closed his eyes. A small tornado of light grey flames shot forth from Kane's right hand and picked up the grass. What then surprised Stella was crimson flames like the red claws pouring from his left hand and joining the tornado. The swirling, flaming tornado enveloped the grass. Kane seems to be a dual affinity. Those are rare. How did that happen? Stella also wanted to know. She ran through some ideas as she watched the mesmerizing display of duality when an idea hit her, didn't Diana kill someone from the Azure Crest family because they were a nocturne? Oh, good thinking. Diana mentioned that everyone in the Azure Crest family was forced to take on a nocturne. So maybe Kane has a nocturne inside him. Stella nodded slightly as the fire tornado ceased, and Kane stepped back. The grass landed in the bowl alongside a pile of soot that was likely the impurities. Good job, you passed. The examiner marked on his parchment, glanced up, and instantly met eyes with Stella. Your turn now, Miss Roslyn. Stella stood up and felt everyone's eyes on her except Kane, who walked past her and quietly sat on the lounge chair. So Dante, Kane, and Celeste aren't part of this mini faction of nobles. Stella surveyed the room and noted that House Skyrend and Terra Forge seemed to be working together. Stella strode forward with as much fake confidence as possible and tried to ignore the examiner's sly smile. First, a simple question. The words Stella had heard so many times today sounded particularly sinister this time. Tell me about the Bodhi heart pill. Stella tilted her head slightly and only just about managed to hold back from shouting in this man's face. Asking a vague question about an obscure pill nobody has heard about was supposed to be on the same level as name any tier 1 pill. This was so obviously a setup that Stella almost didn't want to play their stupid game. Luckily if they planned to cheat, so did she just better. Tree a little help. Stella asked mentally. One moment, that pill isn't used in the Blood Lotus sect, so Elder Margaret is pouring through a book to find its description right now. Stella felt the gazes of Cassandra and Roderick on her back, and as the seconds passed, she saw the edges of the examiner's smile widen. Rosalind, if you can't answer, that is fine. We can continue to the next step. Elder Margaret found it, Ashlock quickly informed her, the Bodhi heart pill is. 
Stellas laughed in the examiner's face as Ashlock relayed the information, why would I shy away from such a simple question, examiner? Although I have to wonder how the details of a pill only found in the Celestial Empire could be relevant to us. Well, ERM, the examiner's smile faltered slightly, it's important to know our enemy's pill repertoire? Don't you agree? Such deep foresight, as expected at someone currently working at the Academy here in Dark Light City. Stella sneered. But since you asked, the Bodhi heart pill is said to increase one's wisdom and understanding of the universe, allowing the user to break through mental barriers and comprehend profound truths. Stella then crossed her arms, Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like a significant pill for someone like me to know about. The examiner nervously chuckled and looked down at his parchment, You make a good point. Perhaps I made a mistake and read out the wrong question. I think you picked the wrong person to mess with, Stella snorted, but go ahead, keep up the act. There is no act, Miss Roslyn. It was a simple mistake on my part. The man glanced down at the parchment in his slightly shaking hand, how about another question? Didn't I answer your simple question already? Stella shook her head as if deeply sad, to think the academy would allow a delusional old man with a declining memory to serve as a teacher. Fine, the examiner brought up an empty bowl despite the fact there were other bowls with chi flowing grass already on the table his spatial ring flashed, and a bundle of grass with a quality that Stella recognized appeared in the bowl. You passed the first round. Now all you need to do to qualify for the tournament tomorrow is remove enough impurities from this bundle of grass, he smirked as he set the bowl down in front of Stella, you have ten minutes, starting now. Chapter 156, Death Sentence Stella ignored the examiner's words to start her focus was entirely on the chi flowing grass presented to her. She picked it up, and after spending a moment to check, she let out a small sigh of relief behind her mask. It's not one of yours, Tree, Stella said mentally, although I almost thought it was, thankfully, there are still some impurities in here, so there's no way it can be yours. That's a relief. I thought Elder Margaret had let my plants enter circulation for a second which would have been terrible news as it would mean she somehow stole from the cavern and betrayed me. You didn't want her to distribute the plants for the tournament? Stella asked. No, at least not yet. Because the plants are too perfect, their use in a tournament like this is questionable. Ashlock mused, also, now that I understand their value, the other families may get suspicious if the Red Claws start handing out perfect chi flowing grass for use by novices in a tournament. I see. Stella muttered as she inspected the chi flowing grass in her hand. Seeing the grin on the examiner's face made Stella grind her teeth behind the mask. Deciding enough was enough, she held up the near-perfect chi flowing grass and glared at Cassandra Skyrand behind her. I didn't know the lofty Skyrand family would need to stoop so low to protect their fragile egos to the point of bribing the examiners and tampering with the ingredients, Stella said with calm fury, how much did you even pay for this near-perfect chi flowing grass? Was it all the allowance daddy gave you? Cassandra's eye twitched, those are bold accusations, Rosalyn. What evidence do you have that I have done such things? And you should stop wasting time accusing me. Time is ticking, after all. Stella reigned in her anger and focused on the task as Cassandra wasn't wrong. Time was ticking, and if not for the mind fortress pill helping numb her mind, she would be unable to concentrate, knowing that Cassandra was staring at her back with amusement. Are there enough impurities in that grass to pass the test? Ashlock's voice helped Stella drown out the rest of the room and find a solution. She could throw her hands up and call them out on their bullshit, but that would feel less satisfying than beating them at their own game. No, even if I removed every last one, it doesn't have enough, assuming the number of impurities Roderick Terraforge removed is the passing mark. Have you got a plan? I think so, Stella's eyes briefly flickered to the bowls of impurity-riddled chi flowing grass right in front of her, just an arm's reach away and under the noses of the examiners. The way I remove impurities may not be as fast as void chi or flashy as lightning, but I have one massive advantage I can remove impurities from afar with spatial chi. Tree, I plan to steal a few impurities from each of the other chi flowing grass bundles on the table, Stella said mentally, could you flood this area with spatial chi for me? Just around the table? Ashlock asked, or do you want the whole room suffocating in my chi? Stella glanced up and locked eyes with the examiner while mentally replying to Ash encompass the table and the examiners. Filling the entire room would be overkill and unrealistic. Got it, Ashlock replied, and just as the examiner was returning a slightly confused expression due to her staring at him, 
the area around Stella exploded with spatial chi so pure and dense that it was almost suffocating even for Stella. All three examiners stumbled back to avoid being killed by the star core chi that was far too dense for any normal human. The grey-haired man furrowed his brows as he glared at Stella, what is the meaning of this? For you to present me with such a high-quality ingredient, it would be an insult to the art of alchemy for me not to go all out, Stella tilted her head, her grin obscured by the cloth mask, wouldn't you agree, examiner? The grey-haired man gulped and nodded slowly. It was clear to Stella that the man was unsure what to do in this situation, and she relished in it briefly before getting back to work as a few minutes had already been wasted. A minute was spent trying to remove a few impurities from the already purified chi flowing grass in her hand. This was done for the sole reason of deliberately leaving a slight trace of spatial chi in the grass so if anyone checked, they could confirm she had retrieved the impurities from this plant. Slowly specks of impurities formed next to the grass in the bowl under the scrutiny of the examiners. Stella kept her eyes closed to not show any signs of losing concentration as she switched her focus to an impurity-rich chi flowing grass in another bowl nearby. Her heart was pounding in her chest as she very carefully made use of the incredibly pure and dense spatial chi all around her from ash to obscure her retrieval of impurities. A tiny rift popped into existence over the impurities pile and deposited some impurities that had come from another chi flowing grass bundle the examiners seemed none the wiser as this had been the exact same process as before. And they had no way to spiritually check for the anchor point of the portal as it was hidden under the shroud of ashes chi. Stella held back a smirk as she moved on to the next chi flowing grass, removing only a minimal amount from each and leaving no trace of spatial chi behind to avoid suspicion. As time passed and Stella felt the end of her ten minutes approaching, she felt the mind fortress pill begin to wear away. The mental strain of performing alchemy without even having physical touch on the ingredient was so draining that Stella only managed to remove a minuscule amount, even with cheating. As the examiner spoke up, the pile was only about the size of Roderick Terra Forge. Time's up. Please pull in your chi and gather all the impurities into the bowl so I may verify its amount. Stella felt Ashlock release his hold on the chi and let it disperse into the room. The examiner leaned forward to inspect the small pile of impurities, and Stella saw a flash of surprise on his face before he quickly put back on his act. Cassandra also walked over and loomed behind Stella, clearly interested in the contents of the bowl. Kane Azure Crest and Roderick Terra Forge remained seated on the lounge chairs, with only Roderick showing a hint of interest in her results. Tisk, this Skyrend bitch doesn't even care about being so obvious. Is her family name giving her the arrogance to cheat in the tournament this blatantly? Actually, even if they killed a Red Claw, nothing much would be done about it, so compared to that, what is cheating in a random tournament run by a lesser family? Stella smiled behind the mask. Of course, that would have been true with the old Red Claws. But now that the Ash Fallen sect is in charge, none of these bastards will be repeating their mistakes. Ahem, the grey-haired examiner grinned as he put down a bowl with traces of mud and a pile of impurities next to Stellas, even with a quick glance, it's clear that you have slightly less impurities than Roderick, who I gave a barely passing grade to. Well, we all know what that means, Cassandra smirked, the infamous Roslyn that dared challenge the Skyrand family was the only noble unable to pass the preliminary round. Isn't that right examiner? Stella stayed silent as the examiner nodded to Cassandra, that is correct. She is just slightly below the pass threshold. Therefore Rosalind failed. Cassandra burst out laughing, you're just a pretty face that deserves to be chained outside our doorstep. To think you, a nameless cultivator hired by the Red Claw Dogs, dared to humiliate us and thought you could get away with it. What's this then? Stella reached forward and calmly pushed the bundle of near-perfect chi flowing grass to the side of the bowl exposing another small pile of impurities underneath that had been obscured from sight by the grass. In your own words, examiner, I was to gather all the impurities into the bowl, which I have done, Stella said and enjoyed seeing the examiner frown and Cassandra's eye twitch. It's not my fault you rushed to conclusions without verifying all of the impurities in the bowl, Stella said as she reached forward and, with her finger, pushed the two piles together to form one taller and wider than Roderick's. In fact, it would even be clear to a blind bat that Stella had gathered more impurities. There was an awkward silence as the examiner and Cassandra seemed to communicate with one another via irritated facial expressions. Stella chuckled, it's a shame you set the bar so low so you could pass Roderick. You cheated, the examiner said hesitantly, you had to have gotten the impurities from somewhere else. Did you bring them in with you? Hidden in your clothes or perhaps your spatial ring? Stella raised a brow, even if I did, how are you so sure? Are you suggesting there wasn't this amount of impurities in the chi flowing grass you provided me with? Yes. 
No, you idiot. Cassandra tried to interrupt the man, but Stella had already gotten him to admit what she wanted. So if what you say is true, then the chi flowing grass you provided me didn't contain enough impurities to give me a chance to pass the test. Stella crossed her arms and enjoyed the despair on the man's face, therefore, it was rigged from the start. To Stella's surprise, the examiner nervously doubled down, ahem, even if I admit that you still cheated somehow and I can disqualify you. But then I will report you to the academy, and you will be fired. Stella retorted and didn't like the crazed look in the man's eyes. Guess we are both going down then, the man grinned and tapped his parchment, I disqualify you for cheating that will be all. The test is over. Stella was speechless at this man's shamelessness. Was there no honor left in this world? No integrity? I deposited Elder Margaret in a nearby corridor via a portal. She will arrive any second. Stella perked up behind her mask as the door abruptly opened behind her. She didn't even turn to look at the new arrival and instead enjoyed the examiner and Cassandra's brief expressions of pure annoyance. Elder Margaret, how may I assist you? The examiner said with a pleasant smile that made Stella's skin crawl. I just came to check up on the test to ensure everything is running smoothly, Elder Margaret stopped next to Stella, how are the results thus far? Everyone except Roslyn here has already passed, the examiner calmly explained, we were just verifying her results and have suspicions that she cheated. Stella smirked behind her mask as Elder Margaret raised a brow, oh? How do you believe she has cheated? That's a very grave accusation to make against a noble. She's not a noble, Cassandra muttered which earned her a harsh look from Elder Margaret. You mean she isn't a noble that you know about, Elder Margaret retorted, I would keep your thoughts to yourself or risk earning the ire of someone you can't offend. Cassandra snorted, yeah right, as if that person exists. Elder Margaret ignored Cassandra and turned back to the examiner, so? How did she cheat? Well. The grey-haired man scratched the back of his neck, I believe she obtained impurities from somewhere else. Interesting. Is this hers? Elder Margaret pointed to the bowl with bits of mud caking the bowl. No, that is Roderick Terraforge's, the examiner stated, this is her bowl. Perfect, so neither has an awe-inspiring amount of impurities, but Rosalind's clearly has more, so she should pass on the volume collect alone. However, you claim she sourced them from somewhere else. Elder Margaret mused as she picked up the chi flowing grass from Stella's bowl and closed her eyes. A moment later, after Cassandra and the examiner exchanged a glance, Elder Margaret opened her eyes with a frown, this chi flowing grass has had almost all of the impurities removed, and I detect some spatial chi left over within the grass. Therefore, Roslyn either lost impurities, or this chi flowing grass was of far too high purity for this test to begin with. So which one is it? The examiner cycled through contemplation and despair before finally giving up. Elder Margaret, your words of wisdom have opened my eyes to this confused situation. I was unaware of the chi flowing grass's purity and therefore made an almost terrible mistake, the examiner bowed deeply to the point his nose touched the table, I hope you can forgive my foolishness. So you agree she passes the test? Elder Margaret asked, and the examiner nodded, hitting his forehead against the table, I do. What about you two? Elder Margaret sternly asked the two assistant examiners, do you agree? They glanced at one another and nodded, we were just following the chief examiner's guidance. You're both rats working for the Skyrend family with no backbone, is what you mean to say. Stella resisted rolling her eyes. These people were beyond infuriating to the point she felt her hands itching to shove a dagger in their faces. Well then, that solves this minor issue. Congratulations, Roslyn, you and all the other nobles have been cleared to participate in the main event tomorrow, Elder Margaret said as she turned to leave, and you three examiners, I will be putting a word in about your performance today with the Academy. And with those parting words, she left the room under the gazes of Cassandra, Roderick, and the three examiners. Kane Azure Crest didn't seem bothered by anything happening and mostly sat silently, looking at the floor. Fine, you win this round, but let's see if you can also cheat in the finals, Cassandra sneered as she left the room alongside Roderick, who shot her a scowl. Stella ignored them and turned to the examiners, who all backed up a step under her glare. She debated saying something but held back with all her might and silently left passing Kane on the way out. The guard gave her a nod, but she didn't return it as she was too preoccupied with manifesting a portal to escape the Colosseum's grounds. Stepping out into a nearby alleyway with piles of trash, she let out a sigh. I'm surprised you didn't try to kill them, Ashlock chuckled, you from just a month ago would be calling for their slaughter. 
Stella leaned against a nearby wall and clutched her hair in her hands, what can I say? I've grown up and learned to tolerate annoying people. MHM, I guess you have. Are you all right? You seem exhausted. Stella massaged her forehead, the mind fortress pills effects have worn off, and I'm in a terrible mood. Could you retract your telepathy, Ash? Sure. Do you need a portal back to Red Vine Peak? No thanks. Since I am already here, I will walk around the city to clear my thoughts. All right, see you later. Stella felt Ash's presence withdraw and finally felt the pressure on her soul subside. Performing alchemy in such an advanced and stressful way had worn down her mind, and she needed to relax. Exiting the alleyway, she began walking in a random direction. The stroll was supposed to be a peaceful one, but with every step, her anger only grew. She knew it was childish to give in to her rage, and she didn't want to become one of those young mistresses that killed anyone that offended them, but in this instance, she felt justified. PSST, Mabel. She whispered as she stepped into a nearby alleyway and distorted her voice with spatial chi. A second later, she felt some weight on her head, and reaching up, she felt a fluffy paw grasp it. After giving some head rubs, Stella requested in a low voice, hoping Ash wouldn't hear her, Mabel, if you can kill those three examiners, I will buy you some acorns. They were nasty people working for a lady who wanted me chained up like a dog. Mabel tapped her forehead with his paw and then vanished in a bubble of void chi, leaving Stella alone in the alleyway. A smile spread across her lips as she exited the alleyway and hummed a happy tune to herself, Now, where do I find some lovely roasted acorns? Chapter 157, Interlude, New Lands Cassandra Skyrend glanced around the main hall of the Skyrend family mansion in Dark Light City. The room was sunlit by massive windows obscured from the outside by a tapestry of runic formations running along the walls. Ten-foot-tall marble sculptures of the Skyrend family's heads encircled the room, with their stone eyes pointing toward a single seat that Theron was currently occupying. Meanwhile, Cassandra sat beside him and noticed that her brother seemed deeply troubled as he drummed his fingers on the ornate chair's armrest. Other than Theron, there was one more person present who, despite his rough-looking demeanor, glanced between the two of them with a hint of fear. Roderick, you understand the plan for tomorrow. Theron eyed the Terra Forge cultivator from atop his throne. Yes, absolutely, and if all goes well. Roderick replied with an awkward smile. Theron waved the man off, yes, yes, your branch of the Terra Forge family will win the contract for our palace in the New Lands. Thank you, Roderick bowed slightly as he got up to leave, do you require anything else of this humble one? Show Henry in, Theron demanded, he should be waiting just outside with his goons. Roderick nodded and swiftly left the room under their lingering gazes. Cassandra felt the atmosphere in the room tense up as Theron turned to glare at her and hissed in a low voice, You had one job, Cassandra. How did you mess it up this badly? I still don't know how she did it, Cassandra insisted, everything was set up perfectly. The question should have been impossible, and the chi flowing grass was the purest one on the market that I could find at such short notice. What was the question? Theron asked. The question was regarding the Bodhi heart pill. The Bodhi heart pill. Theron frowned, I have never even heard of such a pill. Right? I deliberately went out of my way to find the most obscure pill possible, and while digging through the records, I found a single mention of this Bodhi heart pill and a vague description of it. Cassandra sighed, yet she somehow knew of a pill? From the Celestial Empire no less. Theron's drumming of the armrest paused, Celestial Empire. Yes, that's where the pill originates from, Cassandra answered absent-mindedly. So she knows about a pill from the Celestial Empire and refuses to reveal her family name or origins. Theron's glowing eyes widened, is this not evidence the Red Claws are working with the Celestial Empire? Cassandra mused for a moment before answering, potentially far-fetched, but the Red Claw Grand Elder did say he was more terrified of Rosalind's background than ours, which, now that you mention it, that would only make sense if she was from the Celestial Empire or a secret daughter of the Patriarch. Theron leaned forward in his chair his grin widening as his eyes glowed brighter, this is getting interesting. I wonder what our dear patriarch would do if he found out one of the noble families under him was conspiring with the Celestial Empire. Cassandra snorted, obliterate them without leaving a trace. Exactly, Theron nodded, if all doesn't go well tomorrow, I may need to make a trip to visit the Night Rose family. Cassandra laughed but settled down when the doors to the room opened, and an absolutely terrified man with grey hair nervously walked in. Lord Theron, the man came to a stop a good distance away and bowed deeply, 
I apologize for failing my duties. Alongside Henry, there were two other middle-aged academy professors that they had bribed to fail Roslyn. Cassandra didn't even know their names, nor did she care. Henry, come take a seat, Theron pointed to the chair opposite him directly below an opening in the ceiling shrouded in an array formation to ensure anyone outside couldn't look in or hear what they were saying. The grey-haired examiner glanced up at the hole in the ceiling and gulped, M my lord, please give me another chance. Theron smiled, we are just going to have a chat. Why the hesitation? Come. Take a seat. Henry's shoulders sagged as he trudged across the room and perched himself awkwardly on the edge of the chair. My lord, please let me explain. By all means, Theron rested his chin on his fist as he lazily looked at the examiner with his glowing eyes, you have one minute of my precious time. Henry's eyes widened, and he didn't waste a moment and began to talk so fast he stumbled over his own words, I, I had no idea how she passed the Q question nor handled the impurities. I ensured to P provide her with the chief flowing grass that Mistress Cassandra gave me this morning. I did everything as instructed, so it's not my fault. None of that matters, Theron shook his head, what matters is you failed. You have shown yourself incompetent and earned the suspicions of Elder Margaret. But the Academy is an independent entity of Dark Light City. So what if she is an elder of the ruling family here, she has no right to have me sacked from my position in the Academy, Henry quickly retorted as he occasionally glanced up at the hole in the ceiling. Henry, you don't seem to understand your position here. Theron nodded at two silent cultivators wearing armor standing near the doorway to the room. They nodded back to Theron and slammed the doors shut, causing all three examiners to almost jump out of their skin. You are now in eyesore, and the Skyrend family doesn't tolerate such loose ends. Theron raised his finger to the ceiling, and Cassandra felt lightning chi surge up his arm toward the sky through the opening in the ceiling. All three examiners' eyes widened, and Henry jumped from the chair, wait. This is the end. However, before Theron could finish his sentence, the ceiling exploded in a shower of rubble. Cassandra and Theron's chi surged, and lighting arced out from their fingers to obliterate the large chunks of stone falling on them. The three examiners turned tail and tried to run toward the door under the chaos, but before they could even be intercepted by the two guards, a giant claw of void chi swooped down from the massive hole in the ceiling and slammed down on top of them. What in the gods? Theron roared as his eyes were ablaze with power lightning arched down his chiseled arms and coiled around his fingers as if waiting for their master to show them where to strike. Cassandra was equally confused as she saw the void claw withdraw, leaving nothing but large gashes on the stone floor. The three examiners were either dead or had been taken off somewhere, as their bodies were missing. But why? How? Theron seemed not to care for the reason as he blasted the retreating void chi claw with all the lightning he could, filling the room with thunderclaps and light. Dante, is that you? Theron roared again as the void claw vanished out of sight. Other than the sound of stone shards falling from the ceiling and smashing onto the destroyed floor below, the place was silent. The guards eventually walked over and hovered nearby, clearly concerned about another attack, but they also weren't brave enough to speak up to the enraged Theron, who continued to glare at the now wholly exposed sky. Eventually, he calmed down enough to look at Cassandra with his wrathful countenance, first, the Red Claws dare defy us, and now the Void Mind family. Calm down, brother, Cassandra said cautiously. We can spit on the red claws with one arm behind our backs, but the Void Mind family is beyond us. Regain your composure and approach this carefully. Theron's eye twitched, and he looked like he was going to say something but then sighed. You're right. I'll go talk to him. We used to be sworn brothers, so this may be a misunderstanding. Although I can't see how we offended him. Elaine opened her eyes as the door to the Void Chamber opened, and in walked Dante, who seemed to be holding back some anger. Oh no. Did the test go bad? Elaine began to panic. There wasn't much time left before the supposed invasion tomorrow, and she had yet to find an opportune time to acquire more information from Dante. The reason behind the invasion made no sense to her. Dante claimed he wanted to conquer the city but never gave a good reason. Dark Light City has few resources worth conquering for a family of the Void Mind's caliber, so there had to be a deeper explanation. Dante ignored her and summoned a chair of liquid void. Only once seated did he meet her gaze with a deep frown. Elaine felt her skin crawl under his gaze, so she asked to break the weird silence, how did the test go? Simple a complete waste of time, Dante replied. So, what is bothering you? Dante narrowed his eyes at her, tell me, are you working for anyone? No. Elaine effortlessly replied. 
her oath of secrecy to the Ashlefallen sect would never allow her to suggest otherwise. Dante leaned back in his liquid void chair and stared at her with a scrutinizing gaze for a moment. Did I mess up somewhere? How did he find out? Elaine tried to remember every little thing she had done since Dante's arrival. However, other than the meeting with Douglas in the dining room and writing out a note in ancient runes, she had avoided all forms of communication with the Ash Fallen sect until she acquired more information to share. Not enjoying Dante's gaze, Elaine hesitantly said, Why do you ask? Is it because of the invasion tomorrow? Is that what's bothering you? The invasion is of little concern. Dante waved it off as he continued brooding, shifting his gaze to the void surrounding them. Say, brother, I don't understand the purpose of the invasion. Elaine said as nonchalantly as possible, though her heart was pounding, of course, I don't doubt brother or father's vision, but I just wondered what its purpose was. I have lived here for many years, and I know of nothing here that the Void Mind family doesn't already have access to. Sister, my time is precious. In fact, the mere seconds I spend gracing you with my words is a waste of time. Do you truly believe I would be here in this backwater city for such shallow purposes? To conquer weaklings for her fun. Dante snapped at her, these red claw pigs will surrender to me within moments, and the mortals get no say in who rules over them. So tell me, are there really no other conclusions in that ever so intelligent brain of yours? He then leaned in closer, seemingly enjoying speaking down to her despite his claims of not wanting to waste his breath, why am I here? Elaine? Tell me. Elaine held back her anger and replied as sweetly as possible, you and father's intellect far surpasses mine. How could I possibly hope to understand the depths of your plans? Dante grinned, a good answer, my dear sister. You see. I gave you a weak reason for the invasion a few days ago and had my spies check for any sign of the Red Claws or anyone else suddenly preparing to fight an imminent invasion. But there have been no such signs, so it appears my paranoia was unwarranted and for that, I apologize. I should have never doubted the loyalty of one with the same blood as me. Elaine smiled and wanted to stab herself in the throat as she flattered him, I am honored to be trusted by you, brother. Well, with a day left to go, there's not much they could do even if they knew now, so I suppose there's no harm in letting you know the plan, Dante leaned in a little, and Elaine held her breath in anticipation, the reason for the invasion is actually very simple we need more airships. Airships. Elaine was puzzled, what does Dark Light City have to do with airships? Tisk sister, you are so short-sighted, Dante shook his head, have you not heard? The Patriarch has demanded an increase in airships from the Azure Crest family in anticipation of the move to the new land when the Beast Tide arrives. Okay. Elaine frowned, I still don't see the correlation between airships and Dark Light City. It's only known to the top families right now but the new land that the Patriarch picked out is apparently already occupied by a smaller demonic section. Elaine's eyes widened, which sect? Lord Nightrose won't tell anyone to avoid any family getting a head start, Dante clicked his tongue, but what he did disclose before entering closed-door cultivation to a few families is that there will only be one trip to the new land. One trip. Elaine couldn't believe it, but there are millions of people to be moved. Even with a drastic increase in the number of airships, there would only be enough room for most of the noble families and a small group of mortals with a single trip. Dante nodded with a serious expression, exactly. And those airships will be split between each of the nine cities. Therefore, if we control both Slimer and Dark Light City, we will have twice the number of airships at our disposal. But our family is rather small compared to the others, and so is Slimer. Elaine protested, so what do you need more airships for? If we bring an entire airship of mortal slaves, we can set up our industries and rebuild Slimer at the new location faster, Dante sighed, but getting more airships was only one of the reasons I am here. Elaine had been about to ask what Dante planned for the Red Claws if he were to seize control of Dark Light City's airships, but she held back because, as a void mind, she shouldn't care for what happens to them. What was the other reason for you being here, brother? Elaine asked innocently but shrunk back a little under Dante's intense gaze. Do you know about the curse on our family? Dante asked, the shackles that bind our blood to this lower plane. Elaine nodded. It was known that nobody from the Void Mind family had managed to create a nascent soul. Dante summoned the perfect pebble that Ashlock had given Elaine to help sell her lie about being cursed, there's no way something like this could exist except in a higher realm. It now makes sense why Uncle hold himself up in this place. He knew how to ascend all along and wanted to perfect the technique away from the prying eyes of our family. How do you know he ascended? 
Elaine knew what had really happened to her uncle if the words of the Ash Fallen sect were to be believed. He had initially died but was then taken away to a higher realm. So in a way, her uncle had found a way to ascend. Father has an artifact that can detect the presence of a person's soul, Dante explained, there was a period where it was barely showing a reading, but that was during the time you said uncle had gone in a rift, so that made sense. What does the reading say now? Elaine inquired. Dante held up the perfectly round but dull pebble, nothing. The artifact suggests that either uncle perished and his soul has moved on, or he managed to find a way to ascend. Both options are terrible news for us. So he really found a way. Elaine pretended to be amazed. We believe so, and if uncle returns after forming his nascent soul or whatever realm of cultivation he is in now, he can come back down here and remove father from his seat as the head of the family and put his branch in charge. Elaine attempted to mirror Dante's grave expression. In truth, she didn't care what happened to her father or brother, nor did she care if uncle somehow returned. Her life was pledged to the Ash Fallen sect, which would remain here. The doors to the void chamber suddenly opened, and Clive, the butler of this mansion, had a severe expression, Excuse my interruption, but we have visitors. Visitors. Dante frowned, who are they? Theron Skyrend is here. He wishes to speak with you. Did he say what about? Dante asked as he stood up from his liquid void chair and reabsorbed the void chi into his star core. Clive nodded, he wanted to ask if you were the one who just attacked their mansion with a giant void chi attack in the shape of a claw. Dante's eyes widened, and all the color drained from his ghoulish face, that was not me, and father should still be back in Slimer. Is uncle back? Clive lowered his head, it hasn't been confirmed, but if Theron Skyren's description of the attack is to be believed, I fear even your father could not produce such an attack. Without delay, Dante strode out of the void chamber and followed Clive down the corridor. Elaine watched her brother's departing back and wondered how she could get the information she just learned back to the Ash Fallen sect. Chapter 158, An Insane Plan After watching Stella tour the city for a while, Ashlock switched his focus back to Red Vine Peak. The Day of Reckoning was soon upon him, and he started panicking a little. The tournament's main event was set to begin tomorrow afternoon, and he had yet to devise a solid plan to counter Dante Voidmine's invasion. Information about the invasion was lacking, and so were his options for counter-attacking such an attack due to the destructive power of Void Chi, which made anyone who cultivated it challenging to defeat as it didn't really have any counters. If it's just Dante Voidmind attacking, I could defeat him with Consuming Abyss or Send Bob to defeat him. Ashlock mused, I could even tell the Grand Elder to try and wear him out, as once Dante is out of Void Chi, he will have no way to replenish the spent chi. Ashlock knew he could win in a battle of attrition with his immunity to void chi and his ability to acquire chi through devouring monsters and from his vast network of trees. The issue was the location of where the invasion would take place. I had some suspicions of why Dante would wait until the finale of the alchemy tournament to attack, and now it's so obvious. He doesn't want to waste his precious void chi so he needs a location where many of the red claws are grouped together so he can threaten them all at once. He also needs a stage where he can force the Red Claws to surrender the city to him in front of all the other noble families present to make it more official. Ashlock was at a loss. Should he cancel the tournament to deny Dante the stage he desired for his invasion and risk the Red Claws losing face or angering the other families present? If it was just Dante Voidmind and nobody else, and there was no risk of angering his family by killing him, then crushing him wouldn't be too much of an issue. However, if he brings multiple Voidmind elders, Stella's safety alongside everyone else at the Colosseum will be at risk. Ashlock mused as he absent-mindedly watched the mist swirl around the wall of demonic trees encircling him as he tried to think of a way out of this. But he was broken from his wandering thoughts when he felt a wave of pain through the root network. He had naturally tuned out most sensations as ever since he became fused with all of his offspring, he had been bombarded with a mixture of emotions and pain. Sometimes some kid from Dark Light City that doesn't know any better would hang off a weak branch of one of his offspring causing it to snap, which obviously made the demonic tree cry out to him in pain. Other times it was a monster or animal that would lean against a tree out in the wilderness, causing it distress. All these were such minor things that Ashlock didn't have the time or resources to try and solve all these problems, so he simply ignored them. But this time, it was different. It was a hot, sharp pain like someone stabbing a knife into his foot, so his vision blurred as he went to investigate. To his surprise, he found Elaine in the garden of the Voidmind mansion, quickly carving runic words with her nail into the exposed root of a demonic tree that had snuck under their wall. 
if only my roots were considered part of my body and were immune to void chi like my trunk. Ashlock hissed as he tried to ignore the searing pain, then this wouldn't hurt so much. What is she even doing? Curious, Ashlock tried to read the words carved into the fused root between him and his offspring. Skyrend Mansion was destroyed by Void Chi. Dante speaking to Theron. Brother thinks the Elder is back and learned a way to ascend. My family wants Dark Light City, so they will be allocated more airships to evacuate the Beast Tide. Wait, what? Ashlock reread the words to make sure he wasn't misreading them. The Skyrend Mansion was destroyed by Void Chi? Unless it was someone from the Void Mind family, Maple is the only one I know who can use Void Chi. And what's this about airships? Ashlock debated using Progeny Dominion to take over the tree right next to the wall so he could talk to Elaine directly with Abyssal Whispers. Alas, he wanted to save the S-grade skill for tomorrow, and Elaine was unlikely to withstand his telepathy without the help of Stella's Mind Fortress pills, so that wasn't a smart idea. Before Elaine could write any more ancient runes, she stood up as a guard of the Void Mind family was approaching from behind. Mistress, is everything all right? The guard asked calmly. Elaine smiled at the robed cultivator while blocking the view of the root with her body, of course, I was just wandering the garden and thought I saw something interesting, but it turned out to be nothing worth my curiosity. Then forgive my questioning, the man bowed slightly, your brother requested you return inside as his talk with Theron Skyrand concluded. Elaine nodded and followed the guard back inside the mansion that Ashlock had no way to peek inside. However, by casting eye of the tree god and looking from above, he could see Theron leaving the mansion's grounds with a deep frown. The giant man didn't say anything on his walk back to the Skyrand mansion, which was a few roads away. Once he arrived, Ashlock was baffled when he saw a large hole directly in the center of the mansion, as if a god had come down and pulverized it. Through the hole, he could see most of the main room within the mansion. Marble statues, really? They seemed like they had never stayed here, yet there are statues. Ashlock was a little happy to see a few of them had been damaged alongside the massive gashes on the floor. He didn't like them after hearing and seeing how they had treated Stella. This definitely looks like the work of Maple, Ashlock sighed, but what prompted that nightmare squirrel to attack the Skyrand family? Ashlock quickly glanced over the city but was unable to locate Stella. Returning his view to Red Vine Peak, he was about to ask Larry to go find them when he noticed Stella was lounging on the bench under his shade and feeding Maple roasted acorns. Stella never buys maple acorns, Ashlock became very suspicious. Tree. Stella seemed to somehow notice his spiritual gaze, if your attention is back here, feel free to use telepathy. I have recovered enough to handle it. Ashlock cast abyssal whispers and saw Stella win CE. She quickly swallowed one of her mind fortress pills and then let out a sigh of relief, okay, Tree, you can speak now. Did you send maple to attack the Skyrand family? Stella's hand giving maple a head rub paused, no. I did offer acorns if Maple killed the examiners, though. I see, did you know Maple destroyed half the Skyrand family's mansion? Oh, how unfortunate. Stella shook her head and grinned, bah, who am I kidding? That is a great outcome. I hate that family with a passion. Having finished the last acorn and seeing Stella wasn't giving any head pats, Maple sprawled out on Stella's head and fell asleep. Seeing Maple's exhaustion, Ashlock could only lament that one of his trump cards had been seemingly wasted. There has to be some way I can use this situation. Ashlock thought back to the words Elaine had written on the route. Dante apparently thinks the Elder has returned, is that because of Maple's void chi? Hmm. I'll ask the girls. Hey Stella, I got some news from Elaine. Wait, Stella turned to look toward the water chi demonic trees, Diana, come over here. Tree has some news from Elaine for us. Diana seemed unresponsive as she was deep in meditation, so Stella opened a portal beside the bench and put her arm through to poke Diana. Ashlock watched in amusement as Diana's eyes opened, and she glanced around in confusion while rubbing the spot on her cheek where Stella had poked her. What? She murmured while still half confused but brightened up a little when she saw Stella waving to her. Getting up and walking over, Diana asked, Since when did you get back? How did the test go? I passed but I went for a stroll after the test to clear my head, so I only just got back, Stella sighed, can you believe those Skyrend bastards had paid off the examiners to ask me about a pill from the Celestial Empire, and then they gave me an already purified ingredient and told me to purify it. Diana snorted, did you really expect those egotistical bastards to play fair? It's obvious that they would rather die than face humiliation, 
so I'm surprised they didn't just try to murder you or something. They didn't go quite that far. Stella awkwardly laughed, but I might have. You did what? Diana's eyes widened. I might have gotten a little angry and asked Maple to kill the examiners. Stella smiled, but it's fine now. I am no longer angry. Diana let out a sigh of relief, phew, I thought you actually went through with it for a second. I did, though. Stella tilted her head in confusion. At. Diana was in disbelief, Maple actually killed them. Well, obviously, Stella rolled her eyes, why would I be in such a good mood otherwise, oh wait, Tree had something to tell us. Don't try and change the subject. Diana crossed her arms and glared at Stella and Maple, you can't kill people from the academy like that. They are sent by the Blood Lotus sect. Oh. Stella seemed to realize the gravity of her actions, that's not good. No, of course not. Diana grumbled and then turned to look at Ashlock, what did you need to tell us? Stella, relay this to Diana. Elaine told me that the Skyrand mansion was destroyed by Void Chi and that Dante spoke with Theron. Apparently, Dante Voidmind thinks the head librarian is back and has learned a way to ascend. This is a big deal because their bloodline is cursed and doesn't allow them past the nascent soul realm. Also, the purpose behind the invasion is because the Voidmind family wants to be allocated more airships for the evacuation. Does Diana have any good plans that make use of this information? After repeating his words to Diana, the black-haired girl fell into deep contemplation and began pacing around the courtyard. She even began muttering to herself, which earned her a concerned look from Stella. Diana? Are you all right? Stella asked after Diana completed her third circuit around the hole in the courtyard's center. Shush, I am so close to a solution. Diana waved her off and continued pacing. She started drawing in the air, and the muttering only worsened. Eventually, as the sun began to set, Diana finally paused mid-stride, I got it. She shouted, but her monotone voice made her sound more exhausted than excited. Stella was shocked out of her trance where she had been petting Maple and just watching Diana pacing about. What's your idea? Okay, it's a little far-fetched, but if we do it perfectly, I might have a way out of this, Diana said, and that was all Ashlock needed to hear to feel some hope. Diana paused to compile her chaotic thoughts and then tried to slowly explain, as we are right now, we have no chance at defeating House Voidmind or Skyrend. Both are top-tier families for their fighting capabilities and political power within the Blood Lotus sect. So our best solution here is to fight neither. Well, obviously Ashlock didn't wish to fight either. Even with his immunity to the Void and ability to give Lightning Chi resistance fruit to his allies, he still didn't want to try and resist the full wrath of one of these families. If it were up to him, everyone would leave him alone, let him power up to be stronger than the Blood Lotus Patriarch, and then he would either overtake the sect or use his newfound power to fend off the Beast Tide. Stella frowned, Diana, did you forget that Maple kinda obliterated the Skyrand family's mansion and killed three examiners? Diana raised a finger, let me finish, as that event might be our best bet. We need to sow discord between the two families. Have them fight each other rather than us. Is that even possible? Stella sat back and tapped her chin, I really don't understand all of this sect politics stuff. Diana grinned, well, it's a good thing I do, now listen here. This is how we can get them to fight each other. And hopefully, if I am not being insane, I won't be causing the death of us all. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3531 Daily Credit, 4 Sacrifice Credit, 52 Sign-In Ashlock awoke the next day with a pit in his non-existent stomach. Everyone knew their roles to make this insane plan successful, as they had discussed at length until dusk. But so much relied on their acting skills that Ashlock wasn't exactly happy to bet their continued existence on it. Alas, despite how insane it was, Ashlock had to admit it was their best bet. Once his mind had awoken, his vision blurred as he checked up on the cavern. As expected, he saw Stella standing beside a burning cauldron fruit with a line of ingredients on the earthen bowl's rim, including mind fortress fruit. Stella had been hard at work throughout the night to improve her alchemy skills for the main event today, as she needed all the practice she could get to humiliate Cassandra in front of a live crowd. According to Stella, the Skyrend woman had been somewhat competent at alchemy, and since it was almost guaranteed that Cassandra would try and cheat somehow, Stella needed to be on top of her game. Her alchemy practice also doubled as a chance to make more Mind Fortress pills, as everyone would need one for today's plan. 
Since Stella was still busy and there were many hours until the afternoon when the main event began, Ashlock returned his sights to the peak. Diana had already left to meet with the Red Claws and the Silver Spires on Red Vine Peak, as without their complete cooperation, today could be his last. Larry arrived in the courtyard as the sun bathed it in golden morning light with a sack of corpses on his back, which relieved Ashlock. He had been searching for monsters to devour for points near his demonic tree wall but hadn't found many, so he only had fifty credits stockpiled. Did you have a good hunt? Yes, master. I had a glorious feast befitting of a king, and now I am here to bestow upon you the finest delicacies of my hunt. Larry said in his gruff, almost Scottish accent as he unraveled the silk bag and deposited a small group of monster corpses onto the ground. Ashlock greedily devoured the corpses with thorn-covered vines. Plus 107 SC. Only a hundred credits. Is this really the best of what you found? Ashlock asked Larry, and the spider made a poor attempt at a bow. Master, this useless servant must apologize. I was hunting from dusk till dawn and only encountered a few monsters. My speech about a feast earlier was a joke in poor taste. There was almost nothing to eat. These truly are the best of the bunch I found. I would never lie to master. Okay, okay. This is enough for the plan today, Ashlock couldn't imagine needing to use his consuming abyss skill for longer than two hours. Larry hissed in excitement, when do we begin the plan, master? Patience, my many-legged friend, Ashlock chuckled, only a few more hours to go. Time passed quickly, and soon enough, the sun set high in the sky, signifying the main event would begin soon. Right on time, Stella teleported to the peak after changing into her Roslyn persona, is Diana here yet? Ashlock checked the white stone palace courtyard with eye of the tree god and saw an exhausted Sebastian reluctantly shaking Diana's hand beside a grinning red claw grand elder. Deciding their talks were likely concluded, Ashlock created a portal and brought Diana over. Did they agree to the plan? Stella asked with excitement, and by Diana's mood, the answer was obvious. You bet they did. Are you ready to start the greatest civil war in the Blood Lotus sex history? Diana spread her arms and grinned, today. Theron and Cassandra Skyrand will die. Chapter 159, The Crowd's Roar To kill the Skyrand family and blame it on Dante Voidmind was the focal point of the grand plan. Everything being done today was to set the stage for that moment. Yet after Diana's great news regarding the agreement of the Red Claws and Silver Spires to the insane plan that might start a great civil war within the Blood Lotus sect, she remained excited as if she still had something even more ridiculous to tell them. Spit it out, Diana, Stella said. I can tell you have more news by that look on your face. Diana chuckled as if the news was too funny to share. Eventually, she gathered herself and explained, when I went over this morning to tell the Red Claws the plan, I happened to bump into someone rather unexpected. Who? Stella asked. Cassandra Skyrend, Diana said thoughtfully, my heart froze as, for a moment, I thought she had figured something out, and my mind was racing with so many questions but she just casually walked past me without any interest as if I were a bug. It took a good minute for me to regain my composure. Stella's eyes were wide with shock, and Ashlock was also baffled. What was Cassandra doing at the White Stone Palace before the sun had even risen? So? What was she doing there? Stella insisted. Calm down. I was getting to that, Diana spoke quickly, we don't have much time until today's tournament starts, so I will be brief. Cassandra felt like the tournament only focusing on making a single pill wasn't enough, so she had come to the Red Claws to request a restructure of the tournament. Stella narrowed her eyes, she wouldn't suggest anything that wouldn't give her an advantage. To think she would go this far just to try and get an edge over me. You see, that's where she messed up, Diana smirked, her grand idea was that after everyone had made a body strengthening pill, the best ten participants would have a chance to compete against one another by making another pill. But that wouldn't work. Stella furrowed her brows, the whole reason this tournament was cut down to making one pill was that the Red Claw struggled to get their hands on enough ingredients for other recipes. Diana nodded, exactly, so when the Red Claw Grand Elder explained that to her, she suggested that part of alchemy was the ability to source ingredients, and therefore in the final round, the participants should create the best pill they can with their own ingredients. Ashlock couldn't believe Cassandra's arrogance. It was likely their fault that the Red Claws could not source anything more than the bare minimum needed for a single round that involved creating pills. Actually, to be fair, that is sort of the Red Claws' fault for being considered a lesser family that's easy to bully, Ashlock mused, so, in a twisted way, Cassandra isn't wrong, 
but to stroll into the White Stone Palace and say that to the Grand Elder's face is crazy. Stella crossed her arms and frowned, other than the new mind fortress pill, we don't have the ingredients for anything else, why are you smiling like that? Diana's spatial ring flashed, and she brought out a beautiful pink flower and two glass bottles. One filled with a green dew and the other with sparkling water. These are the ingredients required to make the heavenly purification pill. Diana explained, this pill detoxifies the body of spiritual toxins or foreign energies that may have infiltrated a cultivator's body, purifying their chi and ensuring smoother cultivation. It's a tier 2 pill, apparently. Stella took the petal, and two bottles from Diana, and these ingredients are. That is a celestial peony petal, Diana said, pointing at the pink petal, and then the green liquid is heavenly bamboo essence while the water is a diluted nine-tailed fox's tear. Stella looked at the items in her hand and frowned, I don't get it. How did you get these ingredients, and what should I do with them? Well, the Grand Elder was going to deny Cassandra's request of adding another round where we use our own ingredients, but then Elder Margaret stepped in and told him to accept it only if they provided the ingredients of the pill they planned to create in the new final round, Diana gestured to Ashlock. I later found out this was due to Elder Magret's belief that Ashlock would be able to grow perfect version of the ingredients letting you get an easy win over Cassandra. Stella turned to Ashlock and asked through telepathy, can you grow these? The celestial peony petal is from a flower, so yes, I can grow that, and I believe bamboo is considered a flower, so that should be fine. But the tears are out of my capabilities. Ashlock answered truthfully. Okay, Tree says he can make the flower and the bamboo but not the fox tears, Stella said, did they say how many pills this bottle of tears was good for? Diana shrugged as she summoned a parchment from her spatial ring, Elder Margaret gave this to me. Apparently, it's the recipe for the pill. Stella scanned the parchment and then whistled, quite the complex pill. Say, Diana, will a break exist between the round where we create the body strengthening pill and the final round where I must make this pill so I can practice? Diana shook her head, not that I know of. MHM, the recipe says this volume of tears should be good for 10 pills. Stella looked up from the parchment at Diana, how long until the tournament starts? Around an hour. But we should be going there now to set up. That should be long enough, Stella didn't waste a moment as she created a portal and vanished into the cavern below. Ashlocks brought up his blooming root flower production menu and was glad to see both the celestial peony petal and heavenly bamboo added to his growing list of potential flowers to grow. His vision blurred as he followed Stella down into the cavern. She was busy frantically trying to learn the new pill, so Ashlock left her be and got to work designating two farming plots just above her head on the higher level to grow the two new flowers. With a wave of power and chi flowing from his almost overflowing star core, the chi flowing grass wilted away and was replaced with shoots of bone white bamboo in one plot and peony flowers in the other. As with everything he made, they were perfect. Devoid of any impurities and ready to be harvested as ingredients. Stella's eyes widened as she reached down and picked up the pill she had just created. It was the Tier 2 Heavenly Purification Pill in all its golden glory. The thing looked like an almost translucent nugget of gold and had a soft hue despite the cavern's darkness. I did it. Stella gasped. This was her ninth try and was the first successful attempt. Even with the pill recipe provided by Elder Margaret, it had been Stella's first time trying to make a Tier 2 pill. Other than the three ingredients provided by the Skyrens, the recipe also needed chi flowing grass and dragon marrow, which Stella had plenty of due to Tree's past efforts. With exhaustion, Stella placed the heavenly purification pill next to the glass bottle containing a single droplet of the fox tears. This is going to be tough, Stella muttered, only a single droplet of nine-tailed fox tears left, and I have only managed to make one of the pills so far. I might actually mess up and lose to Cassandra at this rate. The plan already had so many moving parts that Stella had struggled to keep track and now she had the stress of needing to beat Cassandra Skyrend in the final round with a pill she had only produced a single time out of nine tries mere moments before the tournament began. Focus up, Stella, this is for Tree and the others, Stella tried to hype herself up but was startled by a hand tapping her shoulder. You didn't even notice me sneaking up on you, Diana said, you're too distracted. Stella sighed as she touched her beating heart, phew, you scared me. Diana tut, you need to calm down and try to relax your mind. Maybe take another one of those mind fortress pills. I already took three, just give me a moment to rest, and I'll be fine. Stella waved Diana off. Stella, the tournament technically started a minute ago, Diana said impatiently, we need to leave right now. 
I just created nine pills in a row while learning a new recipe that was sprung upon me last moment, and now I don't even get a second to catch my breath. These people all think too highly of me. Curse you, Elder Margaret, and your faith in me. Okay, okay, Stella fumbled as she tried to collect all the needed ingredients. Besides the fox tears, she had manically harvested from the farms over the last hour as she didn't have time to purify the ingredients while learning to combine five different things into the intended pill, so she had a nice pile of celestial peony petals, chi flowing grass and full bottles of dragon marrow and heavenly bamboo essence. Patriarch, can we get a portal to the venue? We won't make it in time if we walk. Diana yelled at the ceiling. Stella felt a wave of spatial chi as a portal manifested, followed by some reassuring words from Ash. You will do fine. All those ingredients besides the fox tears are near perfect, so relax and focus on passing the first round. Thank you, Tree, Stella said aloud before walking through the portal alongside Diana, who was reaching up to fasten a white wooden mask to her face. There was a pop in Stella's ears as she stepped through. I'm going to meet up with the others, Diana said the moment the floral scent of the cavern vanished and was replaced with the stench of the city, good luck. I'll be rooting for you. Stella nodded with a smile behind her cloth mask and watched Diana vanish into a cloud of mist. Oh shit, I'm running late, aren't I? Stella glanced around at the Grand Square and saw the line of people trying to enter was far smaller than yesterday, and the crowds around the market stalls were small. Everyone was likely inside already. Although using techniques within a city was considered against the rules, Stella snapped open a portal that took her right to the front of the queue. She ignored the hollers of the mortals behind her and strode in. Roslyn, the same short red claw woman from yesterday called out to her, the first round of today's main event is about to start. Quickly follow me. Stella wasted no time, and the two speedily walked through a long straight corridor lit by glowing stones built into the walls. The sound of their shoes echoing on the tiles was soon drowned out by a deafening roar of excitement from up ahead. You can do this, Stella, no, you are Roslyn right now. An arrogant cultivator hired by the Red Claw and Silver Spire family with the sole purpose of humiliating Cassandra and carrying out the plan. The Red Claw woman paused at the end of the tunnel and turned to smile at her. The sunlight cascading down the tunnel and reaching Stella's feet illuminated the woman's face, and she could see the vast sandy pit with people standing beside tables beyond the corridor's end. This is as far as I can go, the woman gave a slight bow, you can pick whichever table is still free. Stella nodded in appreciation and strode past her. The moment she emerged from the tunnel and out into the open, the crowd's roar was far louder than she had expected, and the sheer energy of the place was bewildering. How am I supposed to perform alchemy in these conditions? Stella grumbled as she glanced around, trying to find an empty table. To her surprise, it was harder to find one than she thought. The place was packed with alchemists. She walked past dozens of tables, all occupied by people of various ages and cultivation levels. Are there really none free? Stella wondered as she started feeling awkward, having to walk around trying to find a vacant workstation. Roslyn, over here. A voice called out to her. It was hard to tell who it was over the crowd's excitement, but her eyes narrowed as she walked toward it and saw an empty table, right next to Roderick Terraforge and Cassandra Skyrend. Roderick was the one who had called out to her, and he seemed eager to point out the empty table beside him. Stella spread out her spiritual sight but still failed to locate a spare table, so she reluctantly strode up to the table with all the fake confidence she could muster and stood beside it with her back straight. Sleep in. Roderick snorted, or were you too busy sucking up to the Silver Spire family to remember to show up on time? Stella was about to retort but held her tongue. She didn't remember Roderick being this talkative before, and his comments were such nonsense that they made her think less of him. What's his goal here? Is he hoping to throw me off my concentration with snide remarks? Stella glared at him and then returned her sights to the workbench before her. It was a simple wooden desk with a small black metal cauldron perched on top besides it was bundles of chi flowing grass, starlight lotus, and a pot of dragon marrow. All the ingredients needed for the body strengthening pill. Wait, what are these markings? Looking closer, Stella saw random words etched into the table's wood and other drawings. At first, she thought it might be a secret message but she couldn't understand it. Tree, do you know what these scribbles and words are? Stella asked mentally. They aren't runes, are they a secret message? I won't be accused of cheating because of them, right? Stella, these tables were taken from the academy's classrooms. They are just the result of bored students leaving their mark on the tables. 
there's no hidden meaning behind them. Hey? Really? Stella tilted her head in confusion, why would they be bored? Can't they just leave and do something more interesting? That's not how school works. Ashlock chuckled, they have to sit in a classroom and listen to a teacher talk about a subject for hours. They aren't allowed to leave no matter how boring it is. That's just torture. Why would anyone do that? Stella didn't even care that Roderick was trying to taunt her or the crowd's roar. This information was so unsettling it helped her regain her focus. Just breathe. Everything will be fine. Stella tilted her head and looked at Cassandra. Seeing the living, breathing woman that was the embodiment of pride and arrogance look back at her with such sinister confidence made Stella wonder one thing. Does she know this is her last day alive? Can she feel it in the winds of change that her death draws near? I almost can't wait to finally see that smug grin buried in the sand. Everyone. Welcome to the first alchemy tournament of Dark Light City. Stella was broken from her dark thoughts as she glanced up at a hastily constructed wooden platform on one side of the Colosseum. Backdrop by many levels of cheering people that seemed to stretch all the way to the clear blue sky was Elder Brent. He stood with his hands clasped behind his back as he used his chi to empower his speech to reach everyone in this massive venue. The moment he spoke, the crowd began waving their arms and drumming their feet. If that wasn't distracting enough, the shouts were deafening. Stella couldn't even understand what they were all shouting, but she didn't care. Her focus was on Elder Brent's words. Elder Brent took in the atmosphere as he sagely looked around. It was hard to remember since Stella was basically his superior. But Elder Brent was a powerful cultivator and elder of one of the noble families, so he was like a living god to the rogue alchemists and mortals in the crowd. Ahem, I am honored by everyone's excitement. Elder Brent grinned, and Stella could see the waves of his chi-empowered voice spreading out in all directions, now before I explain the tournament rules, I believe it's only right I introduce everyone to the people behind today's event. Elder Brent gestured to a large section of the Colosseum stands that had been sectioned off opposite him. Stella followed his gaze and couldn't help but smile as she saw a large demonic tree proudly rooted into the stone seats of the Colosseum, shrouding the sectioned off area in the shade of its canopy. A fog began to swirl around the demonic tree, and under the thunderous cheers of the crowd, silhouettes of people lurking in the fog appeared. It is with great pleasure that I can introduce you to the Grand Elder of our Red Claw family alongside the event's main sponsor, Riker Silverspire. Elder Brent announced with gusto, hyping the crowd into a standing applause. Stella held back a laugh as she saw the Grand Elder emerge from the fog and stand proudly beside a very confused-looking child. After a moment of the Grand Elder waving to the people in the crowd, a few more people emerged from the fog and stood at his flanks. They didn't get a formal introduction, but Stella recognized them as members of the Ash Fallen sect. Douglas, Diana, and even Elaine stood there with masks obscuring their faces. Who are those people? Cassandra muttered under her breath as she squinted at the masked people. Stella grinned. You will be finding out sooner than you might think. Chapter 160, Pill Assessment Stella ignored Cassandra's questioning of the masked people and glanced around the hyped-up Colosseum. The atmosphere was ecstatic to the point that she began to fear that the giant stone building would collapse. Eventually, the crowd's cheers calmed down, and Elder Brent continued explaining the tournament's rules. Now that I have finished the introductions, I believe it's time to explain what will happen today, his chi-empowered voice made it sound like he spoke straight into her ear. Yesterday, there was a preliminary round whose goal was to weed out the fakes from the adept. Therefore standing before you today are certified alchemists with some capabilities. Stella looked around and saw many of the rogue alchemists had grins on their faces as they waved to the crowd. Meanwhile, all the nobles she could spot had blank expressions as if this bored them. She couldn't blame them as she felt much the same way. If not for Cassandra paying off the examiners to try and fail her, the preliminary round would have been easy, and this was just another step to the final that truly mattered. Elder Brent continued, today will consist of two rounds. The first will last 20 minutes, during which the participants will be expected to create a mortal grade body strengthening pill. Examiners will then go around and give each pill a score from 1 to 100 based on a strict set of criteria. The 10 people with the highest scores will then participate in the final round where they can create any pill within their capabilities with their own ingredients. The moment he finished the explanation, there was a sudden roar from the crowd that helped to drown out the outbreak of discussion between the alchemists. Stella listened in and it seemed many rogue alchemists had come without any ingredients and were shouting out about how unfair it was. Elder Brent raised his hand to calm the crowd. Fear not. Those without any ingredients can create a second body strengthening pill. 
Elder Brent smiled, but as we all know, part of being an alchemist is your ability to source ingredients. Stella smirked behind her mask at Elder Brent's words as she saw Cassandra's eye twitch slightly. Cassandra was clearly annoyed at having her words repeated by someone from a lesser family. Elder Brent then spread his arms and put a lot of chi into his voice as he shouted to the heavens, You all have twenty minutes. Begin. Stella spun around and eyed her workbench. Okay, twenty minutes should be plenty of time. I can produce a body strengthening pill within ten minutes if I concentrate hard enough and everything goes right. Stella reached forward and picked up the chi flowing grass. Full of impurities, this is definitely an ingredient that the Red Claw sourced rather than one grown by tree. Wait, isn't this enough to make two pills? Maybe if I work fast enough, I can make two and give the best one to be scored by the examiner? Stella shook her head. The drumming of feet and shouting from the thousands of mortals around her made it hard to concentrate on anything more than her inner thoughts. Turning her attention to the small metal cauldron, Stella frowned behind her mask. She had never used a real cauldron, as she had always used Ash's weird fruit cauldron that made performing alchemy far easier. Focus on that later. For now, I need to remove the impurities from these ingredients. Stella closed her eyes and was about to begin the process when she felt a blast of lightning chi right beside her, followed by thunderclaps that made her hair and clothes rustle. Glancing to the side, Stella saw Cassandra lording over her workbench. The giant woman had a bundle of chi flowing grass floating between her fingers as she blasted it with lightning, making burnt impurities rain and be carried away by a gust of wind into Stella's face. Oh, this bitch. Stella gritted her teeth as her star core pulsed. If Cassandra could do something like this, then why couldn't she? Both Roderick and Cassandra were briefly stunned by the sudden pressure. Now surrounding Stella was a field of distorted spatial chi that stopped the impurities from reaching her and helped reduce the terrible noise. Was it a massive waste of the chi she had cultivated over the past few weeks? Absolutely. Did she care? Not in the slightest. It was the Red Claw's fault for squeezing so many workbenches so close together. Cassandra was broken from her concentration and glared at her, but Stella just returned a shrug and got back to work. Time was ticking, and she had already wasted a minute on nonsense. Holding the bundle of chi flowing grass in her hand, Stella activated the spatial plane, and the world around her became outlined in grids. Focusing on the grass, she identified tiny gaps where she could thread her chi into the bundle of grass just like she had many times before. Once inside, she directed her spatial chi through shifting pathways and was astonished at the sheer volume of impurities within the grass. Unlike the chi flowing grass produced by tree, which had clear pathways except for the occasional speck of impurity floating around, this grass's pathways were clogged up with impurities to the point it was blocking her chi from progressing any further. How had this chi flowing grass even absorbed any chi at all with pathways this blocked up? I can only thank the heavens that I am in the star core realm and have saved up a lot of chi for today. Otherwise, I would be running low on chi from removing these impurities. I wonder how someone like Cassandra even plans to have enough chi left over to create that tier 2 pill later, actually, I know how. I bet she already has purified ingredients, so all she has to do is spend chi on combining the ingredients, how smart. The bundle of chi flowing grass became the stage for a great battle between Stella and the impurities. Thousands of tiny portals barely the width of a single hair snapped open and closed to bring the impurities outside. It was clear to Stella that spatial chi wasn't the most efficient when removing impurities in both time and chi, but she didn't care. She would win anyways. Phew, Stella wiped the sweat from her brow as she set the near-perfect chi flowing grass on the table. Up next was the dragon marrow. Quickly glancing to the side, she saw Cassandra had already started purifying the dragon marrow, while Roderick Terraforge didn't even seem to have started purifying anything. Instead, he was busy looking around for something. Stella was curious, so she followed his gaze and saw Dante Voidmind, Celeste Starweaver and Kane Azure Crest a few tables away. All three of them had finished purifying the bone marrow and had moved on to the final ingredient, the Starlight Lotus. She had no idea why Roderick was looking at them and wasn't focusing on purifying the ingredients, but to be fair, she was also getting distracted. Ugh, it's impossible to focus. I miss my nice and peaceful cavern surrounded by quiet darkness and a pleasant floral scent. How can anyone perform alchemy under the scorching sun while having thousands of people screaming at you and working with such crappy ingredients? Stella's brain was a clouded mess she had been highly stressed for days as she oscillated between brute force learning alchemy without a teacher, participating in high society social events, 
and planning out how to start a civil war that had the chance to backfire and lead to the annihilation of the Ash Fallen sect and the death of Tree. She was exhausted, but she had to perform. Feeling frustrated, she grabbed the jar containing the dragon marrow. To her surprise, it was far better quality than the chi flowing grass, so purifying it only took a few minutes. Fifteen minutes remain. Elder Brent called out, and Stella felt her hands shaking slightly as she reached for the starlight lotus. The chi flowing grass had been riddled with impurities, while the dragon marrow had been quite good quality. How would the starlight lotus fare in comparison? It sat in a small bowl of water, and from a glance, Stella could tell it was relatively low grade because the coloring was off. The lotus had a dull gray pigment rather than the majestic blue of the starlight lotus that grew on the side of the monolith back at Red Vine Peak. Picking it up confirmed Stella's suspicions. It was even worse quality than the chi flowing grass, to the point it was half dead. Stella couldn't help but glare up at Elder Brent and silently curse his nine generations for being so useless at sourcing high quality ingredients. She understood this was supposed to be a test, and the ability to purify impurities was part of that, but this was just torture. Time passed quickly as Stella wrestled the half-dead thing back to life. Ten minutes remain. Elder Brent's words made Stella grumble as she set the now purified starlight lotus on the workbench. It had taken her half the provided time to get a set of ingredients she was happy with. Nearly all three were as close to perfect as she could justify. If only they had given us a full day so I could thoroughly purify them. Alas, with these ingredients, I think the best I could make is a low-grade tier 2 pill. Stella bit her lip behind her mask as she turned to the metal cauldron that dominated the workbench. A part of her had been putting this off because it would verify if her alchemy skills were really her own or just a result of being able to use Tree's cauldron and perfect ingredients. Without further delay, as time was running out, Stella carefully placed half of the ingredients she had purified into the cauldron. It was only as she looked at the ingredients still on the workbench beside the cauldron that she suddenly realized she was an idiot there had been no need to waste time purifying all the provided ingredients. Tisk, Stella clicked her tongue as she placed her two hands over the cauldron and closed her eyes. Once again, the spatial plane appeared in her mind as she bathed the cauldron in her soul flame. Calming her breathing and focusing, Stella manipulated her soul fire as if they were ghostly hands to bring the ingredients together in a way she had done many times. First, Stella had to mold the dragon marrow into a flat disc. She then layered the chi flowing grass in an intricate pattern that was decorated with starlight lotus petals. Over and over, she completed this pattern, all while keeping her soul fire under control and making sure not to accidentally push some impurities from her soul flame into the ingredients and degrade the pill. Okay, looking good, just need to do the final layer, and then I should have a near-perfect pill to be graded. Five minutes remain. Elder Brent's chi empowered voice bypassed her spatial chi field, briefly distracting Stella long enough for her to notice something shrouded in foreign chi was running toward her at high speed. Her eyes snapped open only to face a grinning Roderick Terraforge shrouded in earth chi barreling at her. Stella dodged to the side to avoid him, but her eyes widened when she realized his true objective had never been to hit her. Stop! Stella called out as she tried to redirect the brute with a portal, but he easily smashed through it by flaring his earth chi. She then tried to reach forward and pull him back from smashing into her table, but a tiny lightning bolt smacked her hand from grabbing his robe in time. There was a loud crash and everyone was broken from their concentration as they turned to see the scene of Roderick Terraforge lying flat on top of the workbench and cauldron. The table was snapped in half, the cauldron shattered into pieces, and her almost formed pill was ruined. Stella stood there, unsure what to even make of the situation. It was unbelievable that they would cheat this blatantly to the point of attacking her. Was this really how the higher families acted while attending an event of a lesser family? Did they simply have no respect or care for consequences? Elder Brent leapt down from the raised platform and arrived beside her in a flash of crimson fire, I saw what happened, so there's no need for excuses. Roderick Terraforge slowly stood to his full height, brushed off the sand and bits of ingredients, and looked down at Elder Brent with that same shit-eating grin, whatever do you mean, Elder Brent? I got too lost in my pill-making and tripped on my own foot. It's not my fault Rosalind was in the path of my unfortunate tumble. There was a wave of booze from the crowd and it was only now that Stella realized that the Colosseum had actually gone relatively quiet with everyone, including the rogue alchemists that should have been busy making their pills curiously looking her way. Elder Brent raised a brow, what pill making? You didn't even bother to purify a single ingredient. Roderick awkwardly scratched the back of his neck, well, you see, I'm a rather novice alchemist, so it was all rather overwhelming. 
your lack of skills does not give you a reason to meddle with another participant. Elder Brent snorted, you are hereby disqualified and banned from all future alchemy tournaments hosted by us. There was a round of cheers from the mortal audience, and the rogue alchemists surrounding them exchanged nervous glances. From their murmurs, Stella picked up that they couldn't believe a red claw would speak to a Terra Forge in such a way. But she didn't care about that as she ground her teeth in silent rage behind her mask. Roderick's dismissive attitude to demolishing her efforts and Cassandra's casual involvement in the incident infuriated her. Did they have no shame? Elder Brent and Stella exchanged a glance, and it was clear what they were both thinking. Cassandra would normally also be disqualified, but as per the plan, she needed to make it to the finals. Roderick raised his hands, his grin never leaving, OK, I accept my disqualification. Carry on with your little tournament. Elder Brent seemed content to let the troublemaker leave, but Stella wasn't. Hold on a minute. Roderick, Cassandra and Elder Brent shot her questioning gazes. Why should I? Roderick sneered. Because if you leave so soon, I can't slit your throat. Stella held back her true feelings and said the first thing that came to mind. I believe what he did to me was done with nefarious intentions on behalf of someone else, Stella said loud and clear so everyone could hear her, therefore, I suggest he is detained so the Red Claw family may question his affiliation after the tournament has concluded. The reason for his imprisonment was unimportant. All Stella wanted was to stop Roderick from leaving before she was done with humiliating Cassandra. Stella, this isn't part of the plan, Ashlock spoke within her mind. Nor was Roderick ruining my progress. It's not my fault he's dug his own grave, Stella retorted mentally, you wanted a civil war, and I just thought of a way to get another family involved. MHM, okay, I trust you. Just calm down and think carefully about what you are doing. Are you sure about this? Stella let out a breath and settled down a little. However, the second she looked back up and saw Roderick's face, she couldn't hold back, Tree, I have carefully considered and analyzed the situation and concluded that without a doubt, I want to stab his fucking face. Ashlock chuckled, I see. Well, I will handle this for you. Is that a good idea? Absolutely, just blame it on the Silver Spires. That's what we sacrificed some of our profits for. Roderick seemed to find Stella's words deeply amusing as he strode toward her, Oh? You want to detain me? A descendant of the Terra Forge family? I would love to see if you have the audacity. Stella smiled behind her mask as she felt a ripple of spatial chi spread throughout the area under the sand. A moment later, a large portal manifested behind Roderick. The man turned to look behind with white eyes, what they... Before he could finish his sentence, the giant black wooden arm of Titus emerged from the portal and grabbed Roderick. Roderick tried to struggle and fight back but was powerless against the star core ent that effortlessly dragged him away. The portal snapped closed, sending a gust of wind that picked up the sand from the arena floor, making everyone squint. Everything happened so fast that even Stella might have second-guessed herself without a prior warning. But as the dust cleared, it was obvious that Roderick Terra Forge was gone. What was that? Cassandra shouted at Elder Brent. The man seemed clueless, so he gave Stella an odd look. Stella shrugged, hired security by the Silver Spires. They knew some arrogant nobles would think they could mess around and cheat, so they took countermeasures. But that seemed rather excessive even for the Silver Spires. Cassandra's brows furrowed as she looked up at Riker Silver Spire standing under the shade of the demonic tree. Stella didn't care for Cassandra as she went to look at the state of her purified ingredients. To her relief, the spares left on the side of the workbench had survived the fall and were just nestled in the sand. Picking them up. She walked over to Roderick's hardly used workbench and set herself up. Elder Brent, there are still a few minutes until the end of the test, right? Elder Brent nodded, due to the disturbance, I will add a few minutes as the test should have technically finished. Are you fine with that? Stella nodded, so the Elder returned to the platform and announced, test resumes. You all have five minutes left. Only five minutes? Stella cursed as she scrambled to the cauldron. She had five minutes to create a body-strengthening pill that would put her in the top ten out of all the applicants left. Throwing all the ingredients in, she repeated the steps from earlier, just faster this time. The pattern of the chi flowing grass was a little wonky, and the starlight lotus petals were sometimes placed a little too high or low, but Stella pressed on there was no time to humor her innate desire for perfection. This was a rushed job. Time's up. Elder Brent shouted right as Stella folded the dragon marrow into a ball shape and blasted it with her soul fire. It was done. 
resisting the urge to collapse on the ground and nap, Stella fished the pill from the cauldron and inspected it. Shit, I don't know much about grading pills, but this is worse than my first attempt at alchemy with the twins and Elder Margot. So it should be a mortal grade pill at best. Stella looked to the side and saw Cassandra eyeing her completed pill, and she was grinning. That's not a good sign. Stella didn't have much time to wonder about her fate as the sandy arena became flooded with examiners holding parchments. They meticulously made their way through the participants, inspecting pills and cross-checking with one another to make sure multiple examiners reached a common consensus on a person's performance. Mortal grade pill, score 32. Failed pill, score 0. Mortal grade pill, score 56. Failed. Stella's heart pounded as she watched the examiners draw closer while keeping her ears peeled. She hadn't heard anyone get a score above 60 by the time a young man from the Red Claw family arrived before Cassandra. Cassandra Skyrend, please show your freshly created pill. He said while holding out his empty palm. Cassandra proudly handed over a pill that looked like a glass ball with twinkling stars and dashes of green within. The Red Claw man's eyes widened as he looked between his parchment and the pill multiple times. While the man was perplexed, two more examiners showed up, and they also seemed marveled by the pill. After a while of intense discussions, they landed on a number. Spirit Grade Pill, Score 89 Cassandra took the pill back from the examiner and smirked at Stella. Roslyn, please show me your freshly created pill, the Red Claw Man asked, and Stella reluctantly handed over her pill. There was a tense moment as the three examiners eyed her pill. However, to her surprise, they seemed almost equally impressed by her performance, and after a few moments of discussion, they reached a verdict.